Chapter One of the Inevitable. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading done by Jules Harlock. The Inevitable by Louis Capurus. Translated by Alexander Texiera de Matos. The Inevitable. Chapter One. The Marchesa's Bologna's boarding house was situated in one of the healthiest, if not one of the most romantic quarters of Rome. One half of the house had formed part of a villino of the old Ludovisi gardens, those beautiful old gardens regretted by everybody who knew them before the new barrack quarters were built on the site of the old Roman park, with its border of villas. The entrance to the pension was in the Via Lombardia. The older or valino portion of the house retained a certain antique charm for the Marchesa's borders, while the new premises built on to it offered the advantages of spacious rooms, modern sanitation, and electric light. The pension boasted a certain reputation for comfort cheapness and a pleasant situation it stood at a few minutes walk from the pensio on high ground and there was no need to fear malaria and the price charged for a long stay amounting to hardly more than eight lire was exceptionally low for rome which was known to be more expensive than any other town in italy the boarding-house therefore was generally full the visitors began to arrive as soon as October. Those who came earliest in the season paid least, and, with the exception of a few hurrying tourists, they nearly all remained until Easter, going southward to Naples after the great church festivals. Some English traveling acquaintances had strongly recommended the pension to Cornelie de Ritz van Loo who was travelling in Italy by herself, and she had written to the Marchesa Belloni from Florence. It was her first visit to Italy. It was the first time that she had alighted at the great cavernous station near the baths of Diocletian, and, standing in the square in the golden Roman sunlight, while the great fountain of the Aqua Marcia gushed and rippled, and the cab drivers clicked with their whips and their tongues to attract her attention she was conscious of her nice italian sensation as she called it and felt glad to be in rome she saw a little old man limping towards her with the instinct of a veteran porter who recognizes his travellers at once and she read hotel belloni on his cap and beckoned to him with a smile. He saluted her with respectful familiarity, as though she were an old acquaintance and he was glad to see her, asked if she had a pleasant journey, if she was not overtired, led her to the Victoria, put in her rug and her handbag, asked for the tickets of her trunks, and said that she had better go on ahead. He would follow in ten minutes with the luggage, she received an impression of coziness, of being well cared for by this little old lame man, and she gave him a friendly nod as the coachman drove away. She felt happy and careless, though she had just the faintest foreboding of something unhappy and unknown that was going to happen to her, and she looked to the right and left to take in the streets of Rome but she saw only houses upon houses like so many barracks then a great white palace the new palazzo piombino which she knew to contain the juno lodovisi and then the ventura stopped and a boy in buttons came out to meet her he showed her into the, the drawing-room a gloomy apartment in the middle of which was a table covered with periodicals arranged in a regular and unbroken circle. 
Two ladies, obviously English and of the aesthetic type, with loose fizzing blouses and grimy hair, sat in a corner studying their baydeckers before going out. Cornelia bowed slightly, but received no bow in return. She did not take offence, being familiar with the manners of travelling Britons. She sat down at the table and took up the Roman Herald, the paper which appears once a fortnight, and tells you what there is to do in Rome during the next two weeks. Thereupon one of the ladies asked her, from the corner, in an aggressive tone, I beg your pardon, but would you please not take the herald to your room? Cornelie raised her head very haughtily and languidly in the direction where the ladies were sitting, looked vaguely above their grimy heads, said nothing, and glanced down at the herald again. And she thought herself a very experienced traveller, and smiled inwardly because she knew how to deal with that type of English woman. The Marchesa entered and welcomed Cornelie in Italian and in French. She was a large, fat matron, vulgarly fat. Her ample bosom was contained in a silk curaz or spencer, shiny at the seams and bursting under the arms. Her grey frizzled hair gave her a somewhat leonine appearance. Her great yellow and blue eyes, with beaster shadows beneath them, wore a strained expression, the pupils unnaturally dilated by belladonna, a pair of immense crystals sparkled in her ears, and her fat, greasy fingers were covered with nameless jewels. She talked very fast, and Cornelie thought her sentences as pleasant and homely as the welcome of the lame porter in the square outside the station. The Marchesa led her to the lift and stepped in with her. The hydraulic lift, a railed-in cage, running up the well of the staircase, rose solemnly and suddenly stopped, motionless between the second and third floor. Third floor, cried the Marchesa to someone below. Non si e aqua, the boy in buttons calmly called back meaning thereby to convey that, as seemed natural, there was not enough water to move the lift. The Marchesa screamed out some orders in a shrill voice. Two Faccini came running up and hung on to the cable of the lift. Together with the ostensibly zealous boy in buttons, and by fits and starts the cage rose higher and higher, until at last it almost reached the third story. A little higher, ordered the Marchesa. But the Facini strained their muscles in vain. The lift refused to stir. We can manage, said the Marchesa. Wait a bit. Taking a great stride, which revealed the enormous white stocking calf of her leg, she stepped onto the floor, smiled and gave her hand to Cornelie who imitated her gymnastics. Here we are, sighed the Marchesa with a smile of satisfaction. This is your room. She opened a door and showed Cornelia a room. Though the sun was shining brightly out of doors, the room was as damp and chilly as a cellar. Marchesa, Cornelia said without hesitation, I wrote to you for two rooms facing south. Did you? asked the Marchesa, plausibly and ingenuously. I really didn't remember. Yes, that is one of those foreigners' ideas, rooms facing south. This is really a beautiful room. I'm sorry, but I can't accept this room, Marchesa. La Bologna grumbled a bit, went down the corridor and opened the door of another room. And this one, Signora? How do you like this? Is it south? Almost. I want it full south. This looks west. You see the most splendid sunsets from your window. I absolutely must have a south room, Marchesa. I also have the most charming little apartments looking east. You get the most picturesque sunrises there. 
No, Marchesa. Don't you appreciate the beauties of nature? Just a little, but I put my health first. I sleep in a north room myself. You are Italian, Marchesa, and you are used to it. I am very sorry, but I have no rooms facing south. Then I am sorry too, Marchesa, but I must look out somewhere else. Cornelie turned as though to go away. The choice of a room sometimes means the choice of a life. The Marchesa caught hold of her hand and smiled. She had abandoned her cool tone and her voice was all honey. Davvero, that's one of those foreigners' ideas. Rooms facing south. But I have two little kennels left, here. And she quickly opened two doors, two snug little cupboards of rooms, which showed through the open windows a lofty and spacious view of the sky, outspread above the streets and roofs below, with the blue dome of St. Peter's in the distance. These are the only rooms I have left facing south, said the Marchesa plaintively. I shall be glad to have these, Marchesa. Sixteen lire, smiled La Bellone. Ten, as you wrote. I could put two persons in here. I shall stay all the winter if I am satisfied. You must have your way, the Marchesa exclaimed suddenly in her sweetest voice, a voice of graceful surrender. You shall have the rooms for twelve lire. Don't let us discuss it any more. The rooms are yours. You are Dutch, are you not? We have a Dutch family staying here, a mother with two daughters and a son. Would you like to sit next to them at table? No, I'd rather you put me somewhere else. I don't care for my fellow countrymen when traveling. The Marchesa left Cornelie to herself. She looked out of the window, absent-mindedly, glad to be in Rome, yet faintly conscious of the something unhappy and unknown that was going to happen. There was a tap at her door. The men carried in her luggage. She saw that it was eleven o'clock and began to unpack. One of her rooms was a small sitting room, like a bird cage in the air, looking out over Rome. She altered the position of the furniture, draped the faded sofa with a shawl from the Abruzzi and fixed a few portraits and photographs with drawing pins to the wall, whose whitewashed surface was broken up by rudely painted arabesques. And she smiled at the border of purple hearts transfixed by arrows, which surrounded the decorated panels of the wall. After an hour's work, her sitting room was settled. She had a home of her own, with a few of her own shawls and rugs, a screen here, a little table there, cushions on the sofa, books within easy reach. When she had finished and had sat down and looked around her, she suddenly felt very lonely. She began to think of The Hague and of what she had left behind her. But she did not want to think and picked up her Baedeker and read about the Vatican. She was unable to concentrate her thoughts and turned to Hare's walks in Rome. A bell sounded. She was tired and her nerves were on edge. She looked in the glass, saw that her hair was out of curl, her blouse soiled with coal and dust, unlocked a second trunk and changed her things. She cried and sobbed while she was curling her hair. The second bell rang and, after powdering her face, she went downstairs. She expected to be late, but there was no one in the dining room and she had to wait before she was served. She resolved not to come down so very punctually in future. A few boarders looked in through the open door, saw that there was no one sitting at table yet, except a new lady, and disappeared again. Cornelie looked around her and waited. The dining room was the original dining room of the old villa with a ceiling by Guercina. The waiters loitered about. The, an old grey major-domo cast a distant glance over the table to see if everything was in order. 
He grew impatient when nobody came and told him to serve the macaroni to Cornelie. It struck Cornelie that he too limped with one leg, like the porter. But the waiters were very young, hardly more than sixteen to eighteen, and lacked a waiter's usual self-possession. A stout gentleman, vivacious, consequential, pockmarked, ill-shaven, in a shabby black coat which showed but little linen, entered, rubbing his hands, and took his seat opposite Cornelie. He bowed politely and began to eat his macaroni, and this seemed to be the signal for the others to begin eating, for a number of boarders, mostly ladies, now came in, sat down, and helped themselves to the macaroni, which was handed round by the youthful waiters under the watchful eye of the grey-haired major-domo. Cornelie smiled at the oddity of these travelling types, and, when she involuntarily glanced at the pock-marked gentleman opposite, she saw that he too was smiling. He hurriedly mopped up his tomato sauce with his bread, bent a little way across the table, and almost whispered in French, It's amusing, isn't it? Cornelie raised her eyebrows. What do you mean? A cosmopolitan company like this? Oh, yes. You are Dutch. How do you know? I saw your name in the visitor's book with the La Haye after it. I am Dutch, yes. There are some more Dutch ladies here, sitting over there. They are charming. Cornelie asked the major domo for some vin ordinaire. That wine is no good, said the stout gentleman vivaciously. This is Ginzano, pointing to his fiasco. I pay a small corkage and drink my own wine. The major domo put a pint bottle in front of Cornelie. It was included in her pension without extra charge. If you like, I will give you the address where I get my wine. Via della Croce 61. Cornelie thanked him. The pockmarked gentleman's uncommon ease and vivacity diverted her. You're looking at the major domo, he asked. You are a keen observer, she smiled in reply. He's a type, our major domo, Giuseppe. He used to be a major domo in the palace of an Austrian archduke. He did, I do not know what. Stole something, perhaps, or was impertinent, or dropped a spoon on the floor. He has come down in the world. Now you behold him in the pension belloni, but the dignity of the man. He leant forward. The Marchesa is economical. All the servants here are either old or very young. It's cheaper. He bowed to two German ladies, a mother and a daughter, who had come in and sat down beside him. I have the permit which I promised you to see the Palazzo Rospigliosi and Guido Reni's Aurora, he said, speaking in German. Is the prince back then? No, the prince is in Paris. The palace is not open to visitors except yourselves. This was said with a gallant bow. The German ladies exclaimed how kind he was how he was able to do anything, to find a way out of every difficulty. They had taken endless trouble to bribe the Rospigliosi porter, and they had not succeeded. A little thin Englishwoman had taken her seat beside Cornelie. And for you, Miss Taylor, I have a card for a low mass in His Holiness's private chapel. Miss Taylor was radiant with delight. Have you been sightseeing again? The pock-marked gentleman continued. Yes, Museo Kirciano, said Miss Taylor. But I am tired out. It was most exquisite. My prescription, Miss Taylor, is that you stay at home this afternoon and rest. I have an engagement to go to the Aventino. You mustn't. You're tired. You look worse every day, and you're losing flesh. You must rest, or you shan't have the card for the low mass. The German ladies laughed. Miss Taylor, flattered, 
in an ecstasy of delight, gave her promise. She looked at the pockmarked gentleman as though she expected to hear the judgment of Solomon fall from his lips. Lunch was over, the rum steak, the pudding, the dried figs. Cornelie rose. "'May I give you a glass out of my bottle?' asked the stout gentleman. "'Do taste my wine and tell me if you like it. "'If so, I'll order a fiasco for you in the Via della Croce.' Cornelie did not like to refuse. She sipped the wine. It was deliciously pure. She thought it would be a good thing to drink a pure wine in Rome. And as she reflected... The stout gentleman seemed to read her quick thought. It is a good thing, he said, to drink a strengthening wine while you are in Rome, where life is so tiring. Cornelia agreed. This is Genzano, at two lire seventy-five, the fiasco. It will last you a long time. The wine keeps, so I'll order you a fiasco. He bowed to the ladies around and left the room. The German ladies bowed to Cornelie. Such an amiable man, that Mr. Rudyard. What can he be? Cornelie wondered. French, German, English, American. End of chapter. Chapter 2 of The Inevitable This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Inevitable by Louis Cooperus Translated by Alexander Teixeira de Matos Chapter 2 She had hired a Victoria after lunch, and had driven through Rome to make her first acquaintance with the city for which she had longed so eagerly. This first impression was a great disappointment. Her unspoiled imagination, her reading, even the photographs, which she had bought in Florence and studied with the affection of an inexperienced tourist, had given her the illusion of a city of an ideal antiquity, an ideal renaissance. And she had forgotten that, especially in Rome, life has progressed pitilessly, and that the ages are not visible in buildings and ruins as distinct periods, but that each period is closely connected with the next by the passing days and years. Thus, she had thought the dome of St. Peter's small, the course on narrow, and Trajan's column a column like any other. She had not noticed the forum as she drove past it, and she had been unable to think of a single emperor when she was at the Palatine. Now she was home again, tired, and was resting a little and meditating. She felt depressed, yet she enjoyed her vague reflections and the silence about her in the big house, to which most of the boarders had not yet returned. She thought of The Hague, of a big family, her father, mother, brothers and sisters, to whom she had said goodbye for a long time to go abroad. Her father, a retired colonel of Hussars, living on his pension, with no great private means, had been unable to contribute anything to the fulfilment of a caprice, as he called it, and she would not have been able to satisfy that caprice of beginning a new life, but for a small legacy which she had inherited some years ago from a godmother. She was glad to be more or less independent, though she felt the selfishness of her independence. But what could she have done for her family circle, after the scandal of her divorce? She was weak and selfish, she knew it, but she had received a blow under which she had at first expected to succumb. And, when she found herself surviving it, she had mustered such energy as she possessed, and said to herself that she could not go on existing in that same narrow circle of her sisters and her girlfriends and she had forced her life into a different path. She had always had the knack of creating an apparently new frock out of an old dress, transforming a last year's hat into one of the latest fashion. Even so, she had now done with her distraught and wretched life, all battered and broken as it was. She had gathered together, as in a fit of economy, all that was left, all that was still serviceable, and out of those remnants she had made herself a new existence but his new life was unable to breathe in the old atmosphere. It felt aimless in it, and estranged, and she had managed to force it into a different path, in spite of all the opposition of her family and friends. Perhaps she would not have succeeded so readily if she had not been so completely shattered. Perhaps she would not have felt this energy if she had suffered only a little. She had her strength, and she had her weakness. 
she was very simple and yet she was very various and it was perhaps just this complexity that had been the saving of her youth besides she was actually very young only twenty-three and in youth one possesses an unconscious vitality notwithstanding any apparent weakness and her contradictory qualities gave her equilibrium and saved her from falling over into the abyss all this passed vaguely through her mind as clouds pass before the eyes not with the conciseness of words but with the misty indefiniteness of a dreamy fatigue as she lay there she did not look as if she had ever exerted the strength to give a new path to her life a pale delicate woman slender with drooping movements lying on a sofa in her not very fresh dressing-gown with its faded pink and its rumbled lace and yet there was a certain poetical fragrance about her personality despite her weary eyes and the limp outlines of her attire despite the boarding-house room with its air of quickly improvised comfort a comfort which was a matter of tact rather than reality and could be packed away in a single trunk her frail figure her pale and delicate rather than beautiful features were surrounded as by an aura by that atmosphere of personal poetry which she unconsciously radiated which she shed from her eyes upon the things which she beheld from her fingers upon the things which she touched to those who did not like her this peculiar atmosphere this unusualness this eccentricity this unlikeness to the typical young woman of the hague was the very thing with which they reproached her to those who liked her it was partly talent partly soul something peculiar to her which seemed almost genius yet it was perturbing it invested her with a great charm it gave pause for thought and it promised much more perhaps than could be realized and this woman was the child of her time but especially of her environment and therefore so unfinished revealing disparity against disparity in an equilibrium of opposing forces which might be her undoing or her salvation but were in either case her fate she felt lonely in italy she had stayed for weeks at florence where she tried to lead a full life enriched by art and history there it was true she forgot herself to a great extent but she still felt lonely she had spent a fortnight at siena but siena had depressed her with its sombre streets its dead palaces and she had yearned for rome but she had not found rome yet that afternoon and though she felt tired she felt above all things lonely terribly lonely and useless in a great world in a great town a town in which one feels the greatness uselessness and vast antiquity of things more perhaps than anywhere else she felt like a little atom of suffering like an insect an ant half trodden half crushed among the immense domes of rome of whose presence out of doors she was subtly conscious and her hand wandered vacantly over her books which she had stacked punctiliously and conscientiously on a little table some translations of the classics ovid tacitus together with dante petrach tasso it was growing dusk in her room there was no light to read by she was too much enervated to ring for a lamp a chilliness hovered in her little room now that the sun had quite gone down and she had forgotten to ask for a fire on the first day loneliness was all about her her suffering pained her her soul craved for a fellow soul but her mouth craved for a kiss her arms for him once a husband and turning on her cushions and wringing her hands she prayed deep down in herself o oh god tell me what to do end of chapter two recording by julia niedermeyer Chapter Three of the Inevitable. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading done by Jules Harlech. The Inevitable by Louis Capurus, translated by Alexander Texiera de Matos the inevitable chapter three at dinner there was a buzz of voices the three or four long tables were all full the marchesa sat at the head of the centre table now and then she beckoned impatiently to giuseppe the old major domo 
who had dropped a spoon at an archducal court, and the unfledged little waiters rushed about breathlessly. Cornelie found the obliging stout gentleman, whom the German ladies called Mr. Rudyard, sitting opposite her and her fiasco of Genzano beside her plate. She thanked Mr. Rudyard with a smile and made the usual remarks. How she had been for a drive that afternoon and had made her first acquaintance with Rome, the Forum, the Pincio. She talked to the German ladies and to the English one, who was always so tired with her sightseeing, and the Germans, a baronin and the baroness, her daughter, laughed with her at the two aesthetes whom Cornelie had come upon that morning in the drawing room. The two were sitting some distance away, lank and angular, grimy-haired, in curiously cut evening dress, which showed the breast and arms warmly covered with a jager undervest, on which in their turn lay large strings of large blue beads. Their eyes browsed over the long table, as though they were pitying everybody who had come to Rome to learn about art, because they too alone knew what art was. While eating, which they did unpleasantly, almost with their fingers, they read aesthetic books, wrinkling their brows and now and then looking up angrily, because the people about them were talking. With their self-conceit, their impossible manners, their worse than tasteless dress, and their great air of superiority, they represented types of traveling English women that are never met except in Italy. They were unanimously criticized at the table. They came to the Pension Belloni every winter and made drawings in watercolors in the Forum or the Via Appia, and they were so remarkable in their unprecedented originality, in their grimy angularity, with their evening dresses, their Jaegers, their string of blue beads, their aesthetic books, and their meat-picking fingers, that all eyes were constantly wandering in their direction, as though under the influence of a Medusa spell. The young Baroness, a type out of the Flegenti Blader, witty and quick, with her little round German face and arched penciled eyebrows, was laughing with Cornelie and showing her a thumbnail caricature which she had made of the two aesthetic ladies in her sketchbook. When Giuseppe conducted a young lady to the end of the table where Cornelie and Rudyard sat opposite each other, she had evidently just arrived, said evening to everybody near her, and sat down with a great rustling. It was at once apparent that she was an American, almost too good-looking, too young, to be traveling alone like that, with a smiling self-possession, as if she were at home. A very white complexion, very fine dark eyes, teeth like a dentist's advertisement, her full breast molded in mauve cloth plentifully decorated with silver braid, on her heavily waved hair a large mauve hat with a cascade of black ostrich feathers, fastened by an over-large paste buckle. At every movement the silk of her petticoat rustled, the feathers nodded, the paste buckle gleamed, and, notwithstanding all this showiness, she was a childlike. She was perhaps just twenty, with an ingenuous expression in her eyes. She at once spoke to Cornelie, to Rudyard, said that she was tired, that she had come from Naples, that she had been dancing last night at Prince Sibos, that her name was Miss Urania Hope, that her father lived in Chicago, that she had two brothers who, in spite of her fa father's money, were working on a farm in the far west, but that she had been brought up as a spoiled child by her father, who, however, wanted her to be able to stand on her own feet, and was therefore making her travel by herself in the old world, in dear old Italy. 
She was delighted to hear that Cornelie was also travelling alone, and Rudyard chafed the ladies about their modern views, but the Baronin and the Baroness applauded them. Miss Hope at once took a liking to her Dutch fellow traveller and wanted to arrange joint excursions. But Cornelie, withdrawing into herself, made a tactful excuse, saying that her time was fully engaged and that she wanted to study in the museums. So serious, asked Miss Hope respectfully. And the petticoat rustled, the plumes nodded, the paste buckle gleamed. She made on Cornelie the impression of a gaudy butterfly, which sportive and unthinking might easily one day dash itself to pieces against the hothouse windows of a cabined existence. She felt no attraction towards this strange, pretty little creature who looked like a child and a cocotte in one, but she felt sorry for her. She did not know why. After dinner, Rudyard proposed to take the two German ladies for a little walk. The younger baroness came to Cornelie and asked if she would come too, to see Rome by moonlight, quite close from the Villa Medici. She felt grateful for the kindly suggestion and was just going to put on her hat when Miss Hope ran after her. Stay and sit with me in the drawing room. I am going for a walk with the Baronin, Cornelie replied. That German lady? Yes. Is she a noble woman? I presume so. Are there many titled people in the house? asked Miss Hope eagerly. Cornelie laughed. I don't know. I only arrived this morning. I believe there are. I heard that there were many titled people here. Are you one? I was, Cornelie laughed, but I had to give up my title. What a shame, Miss Hope exclaimed. I love titles. Do you know what I've got? An album with a coat of arms of all sorts of families and another album with patterns of silk and brocade from each of the Queen of Italy's ball dresses. Would you care to see it? Very much indeed, Cornelie laughed, but I must put on my hat now. She went and returned in a hat and cloak. The German ladies and Rudyard were waiting in the hall and asked what she was laughing at. She caused great merriment by telling them about the album with the patterns of the Queen's ball dresses. Who is he? she asked the Baronin as she walked in front with her along the Via Sistina while the Baroness and Rudyard followed. She thought the Baronin a charming person, but she was surprised to find in this German woman who belonged to the titled military class a coldly cynical view of life which was not exactly that of her berlin environment i don't know the baronin answered with an air of indifference we travel a great deal we have no house in berlin at present we want to make the most of our stay abroad mr rudyard is very pleasant he helps us in all sorts of ways tickets for a papal mass introductions here invitations there he seems to have plenty of influence what do i care who or what he is elsie agrees with me i accept what he gives us and for the rest i don't try to fathom him they walked on the baron and took cornelie's arm my dear child don't think us more cynical than we are i hardly know you but I've felt somehow drawn towards you. Strange, isn't it, when one's abroad like this and has one's first talk at a table d'hote over a skinny chicken? Don't think us shabby or cynical. Oh, dear, perhaps we are. Our cosmopolitan, irresponsible, unsettled life makes us ungenerous, cynical, and selfish. Very selfish. Rudyard shows us many kindnesses. Why should I not accept them? I don't care who or what he is. I am not committing myself in any way. Cornelie looked round involuntarily. In the nearly dark street she saw Rudyard and the young Baronessi, 
almost whispering and mysteriously intimate. And does your daughter think so too? Oh, yes, we are not committing ourselves in any way. We do not even particularly like him, with his pock-marked face and his dirty fingernails. We merely accept his introductions. Do as we do, or don't. Perhaps it would be better form if you don't. I, I have become a great egotist through traveling. What do I care? The dark street seemed to invite confidences, and Cornelie, to some extent, understood this cynical indifference, particularly in a woman reared in narrow principles of duty and morality. It was certainly not good form, but was it not weariness brought about by the wear and tear of life? In any case, she vaguely understood it, that tone of indifference, that careless shrugging of the shoulders. They turned the corner of the Hotel Massier and approached the Villa Medici. The full moon was pouring down its flood of white radiance, and Rome lay in the flawless blue glamour of the night overflowing the brimming basin of the fountain beneath the black ilexes whose leafage held the picture of rome in an ebony frame the waste water splashed and clattered rome must be very beautiful said cornelie softly rudyard and the baronessi had come nearer and heard what she said rome is beautiful he said earnestly and rome is more rome is a great consolation to many people his words spoken in the blue moonlit night impressed her the city seemed to lie in mystical billows at her feet she looked at him as he stood before her in his black coat showing but little linen the same stout civil gentleman his voice was very penetrating with a rich note of conviction in it she looked at him long, uncertain of herself and vaguely conscious of an approaching intimation, but still antipathetic. Then he added, as though he did not wish her to meditate too deeply the words which he had uttered, a great consolation to many, because beauty consoles. And she thought his last words an aesthetic commonplace, but he had meant her to think so. End of chapter 3「Chapter 4 of the Inevitable. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. The Inevitable by louis cooperus translated by alexander tejera de matos chapter four those first days in rome tired cornelie greatly she did too much as every one does who has just arrived in rome she wanted to take in the whole city at once and the distances although covered in a carriage and the endless galleries in the museums resulted in producing physical exhaustion moreover she was constantly experiencing disappointments in respect of pictures, statues, or buildings. At first she dared not own to these disappointments, but one afternoon, feeling dead tired after she had been painfully disappointed in the Sistine Chapel, she owned up to herself. Everything that she saw that was already known to her from her previous studies disappointed her. Then she resolved to give sightseeing a rest, and, after those fatiguing days, when every morning and every afternoon was spent out of doors, it was a luxury to surrender herself to the unconscious current of daily life. She remained at home in the mornings, wrapped in a tea gown, in her cosy little birdcage of a sitting room, writing letters, dreaming a little, with arms folded behind her head. She read Ovid and Petrarch, or listened to a couple of street musicians who, with their quavering tenors, to the thrill whining of their guitars filled the silent street with a sobbing passion of music at lunch she considered that she had been lucky in her pension in her little corner at the table 
She was interested in Baronin von Rothkirch with her indifferent aristocratic condescension towards Rudyard because she saw how residents abroad can draw a person out of the narrow ring of caste principles. The young baroness, who cared nothing about life and merely sketched and painted, interested her because of her whispering intimacy with Rudyard, which she failed to understand. Miss Hope was so ingenious, so childishly irrational, that Cornelie could not help imagine how old Hope, the rich stockinette manufacturer over in Chicago, allowed his child to travel about alone, with her far too generous monthly allowance and her total ignorance of the world and people. And Rudyard himself, though she sometimes felt an aversion for him, attracted her in spite of that aversion. Although she had so far formed no deeper friendship with any of her fellow boarders, at any rate they were people to whom she was able to talk and the conversation at table was a diversion amid the solitude of the rest of the day. For in the afternoons, during this period of fatigue and disappointment, she would merely go for a short walk by herself, down the Corso, or on the Pincio, and then return home, make her own tea in her little silver teapot, and sit dreaming by the log fire in the dusk, until it was time to dress for dinner. And the brightly lit dining room, with the guercino ceiling was gay and cheerful the pension was crammed the marchesa had given up her own room and was sleeping in the bathroom a hum of voices buzzed about the tables the waiters rushed to and fro spoons and forks clattered there was none of the melancholy spirit of so many table d'hote the people knew one another and the excitement of roman life the oxygen of the roman air seemed to lend an added vivacity to the gestures and conversation. Amidst this vivacity, the two grimy ascetic ladies attracted attention by their unvarying pose. With their eternal evening dress, their Jaegers, their beads, the fat books which they read with angry looks because people were talking. After dinner, they sat in the drawing-room or in the hall, made friends here and there, and talked about Rome, Rome, Rome. There was always a great fuss about the music in the different churches. They consulted the herald. They asked Rudyard, who knew everything and gathered round him, and he, fat and polite as ever, smiled and distributed tickets and named the day and hour at which an important service would be held in this church or in that. To English ladies who were not fully informed, he would now and then, as it were casually, impart details about the complexities of Catholic ritual. And the Catholic hierarchy. He explained the nationalities denoted by the various colours of the seminarists whom you met in shoals of an afternoon on the Pincio, staring at St. Peter's, in ecstasy over St. Peter's, the mighty symbol of their mighty religion. He set forth the distinction between a church and a basilica. He related anecdotes of the private life of Leo the Thirteenth. His manner of speaking of all these things possessed an insinuating charm. The English ladies, greedy for information, hung on his lips, thought him too awfully nice, asked him for a thousand particulars. These days were a great rest for Cornelie. She recovered from her fatigue and felt indifferent toward Rome, but she did not think of leaving any the sooner. Whether she was here or elsewhere was all the same to her. She had to be somewhere. Besides, the pension was good, her fellow boarders pleasant and cheerful. She no longer read Hare's Walks in Rome or Ovid's Metamorphoses, but she read Ouida's Ariadne over again. She did not care for the book as much as she had done three years before, at The Hague, and after that she read nothing. But she amused herself with the von Rothkirch ladies for a whole evening, looking over Miss Hope's album of seals and collection of patterns. How mad those Americans were on titles and royalties! And Baronin good-naturedly contributed an impression of her own arms to the album. And the patterns were greatly admired. Gold brocades, silks heavily interwoven with silver, spangled tools. Miss Hope related how she had come by them. She knew one of the Queen's waiting women, who had formerly been in service with an American, 
and this waiting woman was now able to procure the patterns for her at a high price a precious bit of material picked up while the queen was trying on or sometimes even cut out of a broad seam the child was prouder of her collection of patterns than an italian prince of his paintings said baronin von rothkirch but notwithstanding this absurdity this vanity cornelie came to like the pretty american girl because of her candid and unsophisticated nature she looked almost attractive in the evening in a black low-cut dress or in a rose chiffon blouse for that matter it was a different frock every night she possessed a kaleidoscope collection of dresses blouses and jewels she would walk through the ruins of the forum in a tailor-made suit of cream cloth lined with orange silk and her white lace petticoat flitted airily over the foundation of the basilica julia or the temple of vesta her gaily trimmed hats introduced patches of color from regent street or the avenue de l'opera into the magic seriousness of the Colosseum or the ruined palace of the palatine the young baroness teased her about her orange silk lining so in harmony with the forum about her hats so in keeping with the seriousness of a place of christian martyrdom but she was never angry it's a nice hat anyway she would say in her yankee drawl which always afforded a good view of her pretty teeth but made her strain her mouth as though she were cracking filberts and the child enjoyed everything enjoyed the baronin and the baroness enjoyed being at a pension kept by a decayed italian marchioness and as soon as she caught sight of the marchesa belloni's grey leonine head she would make a rush for her because a marchioness is higher than a baroness said madame von rothkirch drag her into a corner and if possible monopolize her throughout the evening rudyard would then join them and cornelie seeing this wondered what rudyard was who he was and what he was about but this did not interest the barony who had just received a card for a mass in the papal chapel and the young baroness merely said that he told legends of the saints so nicely when explaining the pictures to her in the doria and the corsini End of chapter 4chapter 5 of the inevitable this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lynn thompson the inevitable by louis cooperus translated by alexander tejera de matos chapter 5 one evening cornelie made the acquaintance of the dutch family beside whom the marchesa had first wished to place her at table mrs van der staal and her two daughters they too were spending the whole winter in rome they had friends there and went out visiting the conversation flowed smoothly and mevrouw invited cornelie to come and have a chat in her sitting-room next day she accompanied her new acquaintances to the vatican and heard that Mevra was expecting her son, who was coming to Rome from Florence to continue his archaeological studies. Cornelie was glad to meet at the hotel a Dutch element that was not antipathetic. She thought it pleasant to talk Dutch again, and she confessed as much. In a day or two she had become intimate with Mrs. van der Staal and the two girls, and on the evening when young van der Staal arrived, she opened her heart more than she had ever thought that she could do to strangers whom she had known for barely a few days They were sitting in the van der Staal's sitting-room Cornelie in a low chair by the blazing log fire for the evening was chilly They had been talking about the Hague about her divorce and she was now speaking of Italy of herself I No longer see anything she confessed Rome has quite bewildered me I can't distinguish a color an outline. I don't recognize people. They all seem to whirl round me Sometimes I feel a need to sit alone for hours in my bird cage upstairs to recollect myself This morning in the Vatican. I don't know. I remember nothing. It is all gray and fuzzy around me Then the people in the boarding house the same faces every day. I see them 
and yet I don't see them. I see, I see Madame von Rothkirch and her daughter. I see the fair Urania and Rudyard, and the little Englishwoman, Miss Taylor, who is always so tired with sightseeing, and who thinks everything most exquisite. But my memory is so bad that, when I am alone, I have to think to myself, Madame von Rothkirch is tall and stately, with the smile of the German Empress. She is rather like her, talking fast and yet with indifference, as though the words just fell indifferently from her lips. You are a good observer said van der staal oh don't say that said cornelie almost vexed i see nothing and i can't remember i receive no impressions everything around me is colourless i really don't know why i have come abroad when i am alone i think of the people whom i meet i know madame von rothkirch now and i know elsa such a round merry face with arched eyebrows and always a joke or a witticism I find it tiring sometimes she makes me laugh so still they are very nice and the fair urania she tells me everything she is as communicative as i am at this moment and rudyard i see him before me too rudyard smiled mevrouw and the girls what is he cornelie asked inquisitively he is so civil he ordered my wine for me he can always get one all sorts of cards don't you know what rudyard is asked mrs van der staal no and mrs von rothkirch doesn't know either then you had better be careful laughed the girls are you a catholic asked mevrouw no nor the fair urania either nor mrs von rothkirch no well that is why la belloni put rudyard at your table rudyard is a jesuit every pension in rome has a jesuit who lives there free of charge if the proprietor is a good friend of the church and who tries to win souls by making himself especially agreeable cornelie refused to believe it you can take my word for it mevrouw continued that in a pension like this a first-class pension a pension with a reputation a great deal of intrigue goes on la belloni cornelie inquired our marchesa is a thorough-paced intrigante last winter three english sisters were converted here by rudyard no by another priest rudyard is here for the first time this winter rudyard walked quite a long way with me in the street this morning said young van der staal i let him talk i heard all he had to say cornelie fell back in her chair i am tired of people she said with a strange sincerity which was hers. I should like to sleep for a month without seeing anybody. And, after a short pause, she got up, said good night, and went to bed, while everything swam before her eyes. End of chapter 5《Chapter 6 of The Inevitable》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. The Inevitable by Louis Cooperus. Translated by Alexander Tejera de Matos. Chapter 6. She remained indoors for a day or two and had her meals served in her room. One morning, however, she was going for a stroll in the Villa Borghese when she met young van der staal on his bicycle don't you ride he asked jumping off no why not it is an exercise which doesn't suit my style cornelie replied vexed at meeting anyone who disturbed the solitude of her stroll may i walk with you certainly he gave his machine into the charge of the porter at the gate and walked on with her quite naturally without saying very much it's beautiful here he remarked his words seemed to convey a simple meaning she looked at him for the first time attentively you're an archaeologist she asked no he said deprecatingly what are you then nothing mamma says that just to excuse me i am nothing and a very useless member of society at that 
and I am not even well off. But you are studying, aren't you? No, I do a little casual reading. My sisters call it studying. Do you like going about as your sisters do? No, I hate it. I never go with them. Don't you like meeting and studying people? No, I like pictures, statues, and trees. A poet? No, nothing. I am nothing, really. She looked at him with increased attention. He was walking very simply by her side, a tall, thin fellow of perhaps twenty-six, more of a boy than a man in face and figure, but endowed with a certain assurance and restfulness that made him seem older than his years. He was pale, he had dark, cool, almost reproachful eyes, and his long, lean figure in his badly kept cycling suit betrayed a slight indifference, as though he did not care what his arms and legs looked like. He said nothing, but walked on pleasantly, unembarrassed, without finding it necessary to talk. Cornelie, however, grew fidgety and sought for words. "'It is beautiful here,' she stammered. "'Oh, it's very beautiful,' he replied calmly, without seeing that she was constrained. "'So green, so spacious, so peaceful. Those long avenues, those vistas of avenues, like an antique arch over yonder, and far away in the distance, look, St. Peter's, always St. Peter's. It's a pity about those queer things lower down, that restaurant, that milk tent. People spoil everything nowadays. Let us sit down here. It is so lovely here. They sat down on a bench. It is such a joy when a thing is beautiful, he continued. People are never beautiful. Things are beautiful. Statues and paintings. And then trees and clouds. Do you paint? Sometimes, he confessed grudgingly, a little. But really, everything has been painted already, and I can't really say that I paint. Perhaps you write, too. There has been even more written than painted, much more. Perhaps everything has not yet been painted, but everything has certainly been written. Every new book that is not of absolute scientific importance is superfluous. All the poetry has been written, and every novel, too. Do you read much? Hardly at all. I sometimes dig up an old author. But what do you do, then? she asked suddenly, querulously. Nothing, he answered calmly, with a glance of humility. I do nothing. I exist. Do you think that a good mode of existence? No. Then why don't you adopt another? as I might buy a new coat or a new bicycle. You're not speaking seriously, she said crossly. Why are you so vexed with me? Because you annoy me, she said irritably. He rose, bowed civilly, and said, Then I had better go for a turn on my bicycle. And he walked slowly away. What a stupid fellow, she thought peevishly. But she thought it tiresome that she had wrangled with him because of his mother and his sisters. End of chapter 6「7 of the Inevitable」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson The Inevitable by Louis Cooperus Translated by Alexander Tejera de Matos. Chapter 7 At the hotel, however, he spoke to Cornelie politely, as though there had been no embarrassment, no wrangling interchange of words between them, and he even asked her quite simply, because his mother and sisters had some calls to pay that afternoon, whether they should go to the Palatine together. I passed it the other day, she said indifferently. And don't you intend to see the ruins? No. Why not? They don't interest me. I can't see the past in them. I merely see ruins. But then why did you come to Rome? He asked irritably. She looked at him and could have burst into sobs. I don't know, she said meekly. I could just as well have gone somewhere else, but I had formed a great idea of Rome, and Rome disappoints me. How so? 
I find it hard and inexorable and devoid of feeling. I don't know why, but that's the impression it makes upon me. And I am in the mood at present which somehow makes me want something less insensible and imperturbable. He smiled. Come along, he said. Come with me to the Palatine. I must show you Rome. It is so beautiful. She felt too much depressed to remain alone, and so she put on her things and left the hotel with him. The cabmen outside cracked their whips. Vole, vole, they shouted. He picked out one. This is Gaetano, he said. I always take him. He knows me, don't you, Gaetano? Si, signorino. Cavallo di sangue, signorina, said Gaetano, pointing to his horse. They drove away. I am always frightened of these cabmen, said Cornelie. You don't know them, he answered, smiling. I like them. I like the people. They're nice people. You approve of everything in Rome. And you submit without reserve to a mistaken impression. Why mistaken? Because that first impression of Rome, as hard and unfeeling, is always the same and always mistaken. Yes, it's that. Look. We are driving by the Forum. Whenever I see the Forum, I think of Miss Hope and her orange lining. He felt annoyed and did not answer. This is the Palatine. They alighted and passed through the entrance. This wooden staircase takes us to the Palace of Tiberius. Above the palace, on the top of the arches, is a garden from which we look down on the Forum. Tell me about Tiberius. I know that there were good and bad emperors. We were taught that in school. Tiberius was a bad emperor, wasn't he? He was a dismal brute. But why do you want me to tell you about him? Because otherwise I can take no interest in those arches and chambers. Then let us go up to the top and sit in the garden. They did so. Don't you feel Rome here? he asked. I feel the same everywhere, she replied, but he seemed not to hear her. It's the atmosphere around you, he continued. You should try to forget our hotel, to forget Belloni and all our fellow visitors and yourself. When anybody first arrives here, he has all the usual trouble about the hotel, his rooms, the table d'hote, the vaguely likable or dislikable people. You've got over that now. Clear your mind of it and try to feel only the atmosphere of Rome. It's as if the atmosphere had remained the same, notwithstanding that the centuries lie piled up one above the other. First the Middle Ages covered the antiquity of the Forum, and now it is hidden everywhere by our nineteenth-century craze for travel. There you have Miss Hope's orange lining, but the atmosphere has always remained the same, unless I imagine it. She was silent. Perhaps I do, he continued. But what does that matter to me? Our whole life is imagination, and imagination is a beautiful thing. The beauty of our imagination is the consolation of our lives, to those of us who are not men of action. The past is beauty, the present is not, does not exist, and the future does not interest me. Do you never think about modern problems? she asked. The woman question? Socialism? peace well yes for instance no he smiled i think of them sometimes but not about them how do you mean i get no further that is my nature i am a dreamer by nature and my dream is the past don't you dream for yourself no of my soul my inner self no it interests me very little have you ever suffered suffered yes no i don't know i feel sorry for my utter uselessness as a human being as a son as a man but when i dream i am happy how do you come to speak to me so openly he looked at her in surprise why should i be reticent about myself he asked i either don't talk or i talk as i am doing now perhaps it is a little odd do you talk to everyone so intimately no hardly to anybody i once had a friend but he's dead tell me i suppose you consider me morbid no i don't think so i shouldn't mind if you did 
Oh, how beautiful it is here. Are you drinking Rome in with your very breath? Which Rome? The Rome of antiquity. Under where we are sitting is the palace of Tiberius. I see him walking about there, with his tall, strong figure, with his large, searching eyes. He was very strong. He was very dismal, and he was a brute. He had no ideals. Farther down, over there, is the palace of Caligula, a madman of genius. He built a bridge across the Forum to speak to Jupiter on the Capitol. That's the thing one couldn't do nowadays. He was a genius and a madman. When a man's like that, there's a good deal about him to admire. How can you admire an age of emperors who were brutes and mad? Because I see their age before my eyes, in the past, like a dream. How is it possible that you don't see the present before you, with the problems of our own time, especially the eternal problem of poverty? He looked at her. Yes, he said, I know. That is my sin, my wickedness. The eternal problem of poverty doesn't affect me. She looked at him contemptuously. You don't belong to your period, she said coldly. No. Have you ever felt hungry? He laughed and shrugged his shoulders. Have you ever pictured yourself leading the life of a labourer, of a factory girl who works until she's worn out and old and half deaf, for a bare crust of bread? Oh, those things are so horrible and so ugly. Don't talk about them, he entreated. The expression of her eyes was cold. The corners of her lips were depressed as though by a feeling of distaste, and she rose from her seat. Are you angry? he asked humbly. No, she said gently. I am not angry. But you despise me because you consider me a useless creature, an aesthete, and a dreamer. No, what am I myself that I should reproach you with your uselessness? Oh, if we could only find something, he exclaimed, almost in ecstasy. What? An aim, but mine would always remain beauty and the past. And if I had the strength of mind to devote myself to an aim, it would above all be this, bread for the future. How abominable that sounds, he said, rudely but sincerely. Why didn't you go to London or Manchester? one of those black manufacturing towns because i hadn't the strength of mind and because i think too much of myself and of a sorrow that i have had lately and i expected to find distraction in italy and that is where your disappointment lies but perhaps you will gradually acquire greater strength and then devote yourself to your aim bread for the future i shan't envy you however bread for the future she was silent then she said coldly it's getting late let us go home end of chapter seven chapter eight of the inevitable this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org Recording by Larry Wilson. The Inevitable by Louis Cooperus. Translated by Alexander Texera de Matos. Chapter 8. Duco van der Stahl had taken a large vault like studio with a chilly north light up three flights of stairs in the Via del Babuino. Here he painted, modeled, and studied, and here he dragged all the beautiful and antique objects that he had succeeded in picking up in the little shops along the Tiber or in the Mercato dei Fiori. That was his passion, to hunt through Rome for a panel of an old triptych or a fragment of ancient sculpture. In this way his studio had not remained the large, chilly, vault-like workroom bearing witness to zealous and serious study, but had become a refuge for dim-colored remnants of antiquity and ancient art, a museum for his dreaming spirit. Already as a child, as a boy, he had felt that passion for antiquity developing. He learnt how to rummage through the stocks of old Jewish dealers. He taught himself to haggle when his purse was not full, 
and he collected first rubbish and afterwards gradually objects of artistic and financial value. And it was his great hobby, his one vice. He spent all his pocket money on it, and later, without reserve, the little that he was able to earn. For sometimes, very seldom, he would finish something and sell it. But generally he was too ill-satisfied with himself to finish anything. And his modest notion was that everything had already been created, and that his art was useless. This idea sometimes paralyzed him for months together without making him unhappy. When he had the money to keep himself going, and his personal needs were very small, he felt rich and was content in his studio, or would wander perfectly content through the streets of Rome. His long, careless, lean, slender body was at such times clad in his oldest suit, which afforded an unostentatious glimpse of an untidy shirt with a soft collar and a bit of string instead of a tie, and his favorite headgear was a faded hat, battered out of shape by the rain. His mothers and sisters, as a rule, found him unpresentable, but had given up trying to transform him into the well-groomed son and brother whom they would have liked to take to the drawing-rooms of their Roman friends. Happy to breathe the atmosphere of Rome, he would wander for hours through the ruins and see, in a dazzling vision of phantom columns, ethereal temples and translucent marble palaces looming up in a shimmering sunlight twilight, and the tourists going by with their Baedekers, who passed this long, lean young man, seated carelessly on the foundations of the Temple of Saturn, would never have believed in his architectural illusions of harmonious ascending lines, crowned by an array of statues in noble and godlike attitudes, high in the blue sky. But he saw them before him. He raised the shafts of the pillars. He fluted the severe Doric columns. He bent and curved the cushioned Ionic capitals, and unfurled the leaves of the Corinthians' acanthoses. The temples rose in the twinkling of an eye, the basilica shot up as by magic, the graven images stood white against the elusive depths of the sky, and the Via Sacra became alive. He and his admiration lived his dream, his past. It was as though he had known pre-existence in ancient Rome. And the modern houses, the modern capital, and all that stood around the tomb of his forum were invisible to his eyes. He would sit like this for hours, or wander about and sit down again and be happy. In the intensity of his imagination, he conjured up history from the clouds of the past, first of all as a mist, a miraculous haze, whence the figure stepped out against the marble background of ancient Rome. The gigantic dramas were enacted before his dreaming eyes as on an ideal stage which stretched from the forum to the hazy, sun-shot azure of the Campania, with slips that lost themselves in the depths of the sky. Roman life came into being with a togged gesture, a line of Horace, a sudden vision of an emperor's murder or contest of gladiators in the arena. And suddenly also the vision paled, and he saw the ruins, the ruins only as the tangible shadow of his unreal illusion. He saw the ruins as they were, brown and gray, eaten up with age, crumbled, martyred, mutilated with hammers, till only a few occasional pillars lifted and bore a trembling architrave that threatened to come crashing to the ground. And the browns and grays were so richly and nobly gilded by splashes of sunlight the ruins were so exquisitely beautiful in decay, so melancholy in their unwitting fortuitousness of broken lines, of shattered arches and mutilated sculpture, that it was as though he himself, after his airy vision of radiant dream architecture, had tortured and mutilated them with an artist's hand, and caused them to burst asunder and shake and tremble for the sake of their wistful aftermath of beauty. Then his eyes grew moist. 
his heart became more full than he could bear, and he went away through the arch of Titus by the Colosseum, through the arch of Constantine, and on and on, and hurried past the Lateran of the Via Appia and the Compagna, where his smarting eyes drank in the blue of the distant Alban hills, as though that would cure them of their excessive gazing and dreaming. Neither in his mother nor in his sisters did he find a strain that sympathized with his eccentric tendencies. And since that one friend who died, he had never found another and had always been lonely within and without, as though the victim of a predestination which would not allow him to meet with sympathy. But he had peopled his loneliness so densely with his dreams that he had never felt unhappy because of it. And even as he loved roaming alone among the ruins and along the country roads, so he cherished the privacy of his lonely studio, with the many silent figures on an old panel of some triptych, on a tapestry, or on the many closely hung sketches all around him, all with the charm of their lines and colors, all with the silent gestures of their movement and emotion, and all blending together in twilight corners or shadowy antique cabinet. And in between all this lived his china and bronze and old silver, while the faded gold embroidery of an ecclesiastical vestment gleamed faintly, and the old leather bindings of his books stood in comfortable brown rows, ready to give forth when his hands opened them, images which mistily drifted upwards, living their loves and their sorrows in the tempered browns and reds and golds of the soundless atmosphere of the studio. Such was his simple life, without much inward doubting, because he made no great demands upon himself, and without the modern artist's melancholy, because he was happy in his dreams. He had never, despite his hotel life with his mother and sisters, he slept and took his meals at Belonis, met many people or concerned himself with strangers, being by nature a little shy of by deckered tourists, of short-skirted English ladies, with their persistent little exclamations of uniform admiration, and feeling entirely impossible in the half-Italian, half-cosmopolitan set of his rather worldly mother and smart little sisters, who spent their time dancing and cycling with young Italian princes and dukes. And now that he had met Cornelie de Retz, he had to confess to himself that he possessed but little knowledge of human nature, and that he had never learnt to believe in the reality of such a woman, who might have existed in books, but not in actual life. Her very appearance, her pallor, her drooping charm, her weariness, had astonished him, and her conversation astonished him, attractive though the sound of it was, and offended as he often was by a recurrent bitterness and irony, followed again by depression and discouragement, until he thought it over again and again, until in his musing he seemed to hear it once more on her own lips, until she joined the busts and torsos in his studio, and appeared before him in the lily-like frailness of her visible actuality, against the pre-Raphaelite stiffness of line, and the Byzantine gold and color of the angels and Madonnas on canvas and tapestry. His soul had never known love, and he had always looked on love as imagination and poetry. His life had never known more than the natural virile impulse and the ordinary little love affair with a model and his ideas on love swayed in too wide an unreal balance between a woman who showed herself in the nude for a few lire, and Petrarch's Laura, between the desire roused by a beautiful body and the exaltation inspired by Dante's Beatrice, between the flesh and the dream. He had never contemplated an encounter of kindred souls, never longed for sympathy, for love in the full and pregnant sense of the word. And when he began to think, and to think long and often of Cornelet de Retz, 
he could not understand it. He had pondered and dreamed for days, for a week, about a woman in a poem. On a woman in real life, never. And that he, irritated by some of her sayings, had nevertheless seen her stand with her lily-like outline against his Byzantine triptych, like a wraith in his lonely dreams, almost frightened him, because it had made him lose his peace of mind. End of chapter 8chapter nine of the inevitable this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading done by jules harlock the inevitable by louis caparus translated by alexander texiera de matos the inevitable chapter nine it was christmas day on which occasion the marchesa baloni entertained her boarders with a christmas tree in the drawing-room followed by a dance in the old guercino dining-room to give a ball in a christmas tree was a custom with many hotel keepers and the pensions that gave no dance or a Christmas tree were known and numbered and were greatly blamed by the foreigners for this breach of tradition. There were instances of very excellent pensions to which many travelers, especially ladies, never went, because there was neither a dance nor a Christmas tree at Christmas. The Marchesa realized that her tree was expensive and that her dance cost money too and she would gladly have found an excuse for avoiding both, but she dared not. The reputation of her pension, as it happened, depended on its worldliness and smartness, on the table d'hote in the handsome dining room where people dressed for dinner and also on the brilliant party given at Christmas and it was amusing to see how keen all the ladies were to receive gratis in their bill for a whole winter's stay at a trashy Christmas present and the opportunity of dancing without having to pay for a glass of orgiade and a bit of pastry, a sandwich and a cup of soup. Giuseppe, the old nodding major domo, looked down contemptuously on this festivity. He remembered the gala pomp of his archducal evenings and considered the dance inferior and the tree paltry. Antonio, the limping porter, accustomed to his comparatively quiet life, fetching a visitor or taking him to the station, sorting the post twice a day at his ease, and for the rest pottering around his lodge and the lift, hated the dance because of all the guests of the boarders, each of whom was entitled to invite two or three friends, and because of all that tiring fuss about carriages, when a good many of the visitors skipped into their vettura without tipping him. Round about Christmas, therefore, relations between the Marchesa and her two principal dignitaries became far from harmonious and a hail of orders and abuse would patter down on the backs of the old camarieri, crawling wearily up and downstairs with their hot water cans in their trembling hands, and of the young greenhorns of waiters, colliding with one another in their undisciplined zeal and smashing the plates, and it was only now when the whole staff was put to work that people saw how old the camarieri were and how young the waiters and qualified as disgraceful and shocking the thrifty method of the marchesa in employing none but wrecks and infants in her service the one muscular facino who was essential for hauling the luggage cut an unexpected figure of virile maturity and robustness but above everything the visitors detested the marchesa because of the great number of her servants reflecting that now at christmas time they would have to tip every one of them 
No, they never imagined that the staff was so large, quite unnecessarily large too. Why couldn't the Marchesa engage a couple of strong young maids and waiters instead of all those old women and little boys? And there was much hushed plotting and confabulating in the corners of the passages and at meals to decide on the tips to be given. They didn't want to spoil the servants, but still they were staying all the winter, and therefore one lira was hardly enough and they hesitated between one lira twenty-five and one lira fifty. But, when they counted on their fingers that there were fully five and twenty servants, and that therefore there were close on forty lira out of pocket, they thought it an awful lot, and they got up subscription lists. Two lists went round, one of one lira and one of twelve lira a visitor, the latter subscription covering the whole staff. On this second list some, who had arrived a month before and who had arranged to leave, entered their names for ten lire and some for six lire. Five lire was, by general consent, considered too little. And, when it became known that the grimy aesthetic ladies intended to give five lire, they were regarded with the greatest contempt it all meant a lot of trouble and excitement as christmas drew nearer people streamed to the presbyte set by the painters in the palazzo borghese a panorama of jerusalem and the shepherds the angels the magi and the mary and the child in the manger with the ox and the ass they listened in the ara sioli to the preaching of the little boys and girls who by turns climbed the platform and told the story of the nativity some shyly reciting a little poem prompted by an anxious mother others girls especially declaiming and rolling their eyes with the dramatic fervor of little italian actresses and ending up with a religious moral the people and the countless tourists stood and listened to the preaching. A pleasant spirit prevailed in the church, where the shrill young children's voices were lifted up in oratory. There was laughter at a gesture, or a point driven home. And the priest strolling round the church wore an unctuous smile, because it was all so pretty and so satisfactory and in the chapel of the santo bambino the miraculous wooden doll was bright with gold and jewels and the close-packed multitude thronged to gaze at it all the visitors at bologna's brought brunches of holly in the piazza di spagna to adorn their rooms with and some such as the baron and van rothkirch set up a private christmas tree in their own rooms on the evening before the great party, one and all went to admire these private trees, going in and out of one another's rooms, and all the boarders wore a kind, festive smile, and welcomed everybody. However much at other times, they might quarrel and intrigue against one another. It was universally agreed that the Baronin had taken great pains, and that her tree was magnificent. Her bedroom had been cleverly metamorphosed into a boudoir. The beds, draped to look like divans, the washhand stands concealed, and the tree was radiant with candles and tinsel. And the baronin, a little sentimentality inclined, for the season reminded her of Berlin and her lost domesticity, opened her doors wide to everybody, and was even offering the two aesthetic ladies sweets, when the Marchesa, also smiling, appeared at the door, with her bosom moulded in sky-blue satin, and with even larger crystals than usual in her ears. The room was full. There were the van der Stahls, Cornelie, Rudyard, Uriana Hope, and other guests going in and out, so that it became impossible to move and they stood packed together or sat on the draped beds of the mother and daughter 
the marchesa led in beside her an unknown young man short slender with a pale olive complexion and with dark bright witty lively eyes he wore dress clothes and displayed the vague good manners of a beloved and careless viveur distinguished and yet conceited and she proudly went up to the baronin who kept prettily wiping her moist eyes and with a certain arrogance presented my nephew duca di san stefano principe di forti braccio the well-known italian name sounded from her lips in the small crowded room with deliberate distinctness and all eyes went to the young man who bowed low before the baronin and then looked round the room with a vague ironical glance the marchesa's nephew had not yet been seen at the hotel that winter but everybody knew that the young duke of san stefano prince of forte braccio was a nephew of the marchesa's and one of the advertisements for her pension and while the prince talked to the baronin and her daughter urania hope stared at him as a miraculous being from another world she clung tight to cornelie's arm as though she were in danger of fainting at the sight of so much italian nobility and greatness she thought him very good-looking very imposing short and slender and pale with his carbuncle eyes and his weary distinction and the white orchid in his buttonhole she would have loved to ask the marchioness to introduce her to her chic nephew but she dared not for she thought of her father's stock in that factory at chicago the christmas tree party and the dance took place the following night it became known that the marchesa's nephew was coming that evening too and a great excitement reigned throughout the day the prince arrived after the presents had been taken down from the tree and distributed and made a sort of state entry by the side of his aunt the marchesa into the drawing-room where the dancing had not yet begun though the guests were sitting about the room all fixing their eyes on the ducal and princely apparition cornelie was strolling with ducal van der stahl who to his mother's and sister's great surprise has fished out his dress clothes and appeared in the big hall and they both observed the triumphant entry of la Bologna and her nephew and laughed at the fanatically upturned eyes of the english and american ladies they cornelie and duco sat down in the hall on two chairs in front of a clump of palms which concealed one of the doors of the drawing-room while the dance began inside they were talking about the statues in the vatican which they had been to see two days before when they heard as though close to their ears a voice which they recognized as the marchesa's commanding organ vainly striving to sink into a whisper they looked round in surprise and perceived the hidden door which was partly opened and through the open space they faintly distinguished the slim hand and black sleeve of the prince and a piece of the blue bosom of la Bologna both seated on a sofa in the drawing-room. They were therefore back to back, separated by the half-open door. They listened for fun to the Marchesa's Italian. The prince's answers were lisped so softly that they could scarcely catch them, and of what the Marchesa said they heard only a few words and a scraps of sentences. They were listening quite involuntarily, when they heard rudyard's name clearly pronounced by the marchesa and who besides asked the prince softly an english miss said the marchesa miss taylor she's sitting over there by herself in the corner a simple little soul the baronin and her daughter the dutch woman a divorcee and the pretty american and those two very attractive dutch girls asked the prince the music boom boomed louder and cornelie and duco did not catch the reply and the divorced dutchwoman the prince asked next 
No money, the Marchesa answered curtly. And the young Baroness? No money, La Bologna repeated. So there's no one except the stocking merchant, asked the prince wearily. La Bologna became cross, but Cornelia and Duco could not understand the sentences which she rattled out through the boom-booming music. Then, during a lull, they heard the Marchesa say, She is very pretty. She has tons and tons of money. She could have gone to a first-class hotel but preferred to come here, because, as a young girl travelling by herself, she was recommended to me and finds it pleasanter here. She has the big sitting-room to herself and pays fifty lire a day for her two rooms. She does not care about money. She pays three times as much as the others for her wood, and I also charge her for the wine. She sells stockings, muttered the prince obstinately. Nonsense, said the Marchesa. Remember, there's nobody at the moment. Last winter we had rich English titled people with a daughter, but you thought her too tall. You're always discovering some objection. You mustn't be so difficult. I think those two little Dutch dolls attractive. They have no money. You're always thinking what you have no business to think. How much did Papa promise you if you... The music boomed louder. Makes no difference. If Rudyard talks to her, Miss Taylor is easy. Miss Hope... I don't want so many stockings as all that. Very witty, I dare say, if you don't care to. No, then I retire. I'll tell Rudyard so. How much? Sixty or seventy thousand. I don't know exactly. Are they urgent? Debts are never urgent. Do you agree? Very well, but mind, I won't sell myself for less than ten millions. And then you get... They both laughed, and again the names of Rudyard and Urania were pronounced. Urania, he asked. Yes, Urania, replied La Bologna. Those little Americans are very tactful. Look at the Comtes de Castellane and the Duchess of Marlborough. How well they bear their husbands' honors. They cut an excellent figure. They are mentioned in every society column, and always with respect. All right, then, I am tired of these wasted winters, but not less than ten millions. Five, no ten. The prince and the marchesa had stood up to go. Cornelie looked at Duco. He laughed. I don't quite understand them, he said. It's a joke, of course. Cornelie was startled. A joke, you think, Mr. Van der Stahl? Yes, they're humbugging. I don't believe it. I do. Have you any knowledge of human nature? Oh, no, none at all. I'm getting it gradually. I believe that Rome can be dangerous and that a hotel-keeping Marchesa, a prince, and a Jesuit. What about them? Can they be dangerous, if not to your sisters, because they have no money, but at any rate to Urania Hope? I don't believe it for a moment. It was all chaff and it doesn't interest me. What do you think of Praxiteles' arrows? I think it the most divine statue I ever saw. Oh, the arrows, the arrows. That is love, the real love, the predestined fatal love, begging forgiveness for the suffering which it causes. Have you ever been in love? No, I have no knowledge of human nature, and I have never been in love. You are always so definite. Dreams are beautiful, statues are delightful, and poetry is everything. The Eros expresses love completely. The love of the Eros is so beautiful. I could never love so beautifully as that. No, it does not interest me to understand human nature. And a dream of Praxiteles, lingering in a mutilated marble torso is nobler than anything the, that the world calls love. She knitted her brows. Her eyes were somber. Let us go to the dancers, she said. We are so out of it all here. End of chapter 9
Chapter 10 of The Inevitable. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anastasia Saloha. The Inevitable by Louis Cupeyus. Translated by Alexander Takshera de Matos. Chapter 10. The day after the dance at table, Cornelia received a strange impression. Suddenly, as she slipped her delicious ganzana, ordered for her by Rudyard, she became aware that it was not by accident that she was sitting with the Baronin and her daughter, with Urania and Miss Taylor. She saw that the Marchesa had an intention behind this arrangement. Rudyard, always civil, polite, thoughtful, always full of attentions, his pockets always filled with cards of introduction very difficult to obtain, or so at least he contended, talked without ceasing, lately more particularly to Miss Taylor, who went faithfully to hear all the best church music and always returned home in ecstasy. The pale, simple, thin little English woman, who at first used to go into raptures over museums, ruins, and the sunsets of the Aventine and the Monte Mario, and who was always stirred by her rambles through Rome, now devoted herself exclusively to the hundreds of churches, visited and studied them all, and above all faithfully attended the musical services, and spoke aesthetically of the choir in the Centine Chapel, and the quavering glories of the male soprani. Cornelia spoke to Mrs. van der Stahl and the Baronin von Roskirch of the conversation between the Marchesa and her nephew, which she had heard through the half-open door. But neither of them, though interested and curious, took the Marchesa's words seriously, regarding them only as so much thoughtless talk between a foolish matchmaking aunt and an unwilling nephew. Cornelia was struck by seeing how unable people are to take things seriously. But the Baronin was quite indifferent, saying that Rudyard could do her no harm and was still supplying her with tickets. And Mrs. van der Stahl, who had been in Rome a long time and was accustomed to little boarding house conspiracies, considered that Cornelia was making herself too uneasy about the fair Urania's fate. Suddenly, however, Miss Taylor disappeared from the table. They thought that she was ill until it came to light that she had left the pension baloney. Rudyard said nothing, but a few days later the whole pension knew that Miss Taylor had been converted to the Catholic faith and had moved to a pension recommended by Rudyard, a pension frequented by Monsignore and noted for its religious tone. Her disappearance produced a certain constraint in the conversation between Rudyard, the German ladies and Cornelia, and the latter, in the course of a week which the Baronin was spending at Naples, changed her seat and joined her fellow countrywomen, the Van der Stahls. The von Kirches also changed because of the drought, said the Baronin. The seats were taken by new arrivals. And Urania was left alone with Radiat at lunch and dinner amid those foreign elements. Cornelia reproached herself and one day spoke seriously to the American girl and warned her. But she dared not repeat what she had overheard at the dance, and her warning made no impression on Urania. And when Radiat had obtained for Miss Hope the privilege of a private audience of the Pope, Urania would not hear a word against Radiat and considered him the kindest man whom she had ever met, Jesuit or no Jesuit. But Radiat continued to appear through a haze of mystery, and people were not agreed as to whether he was a priest or a layman. End of chapter 10「Chapter Eleven of the Inevitable – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading done by Jules Harlock. The Inevitable by Louis Copyrus. Translated by Alexander Texiera de Matos. The Inevitable, Chapter 11 What do those strangers matter to you? asked Duco. They were sitting in his studio. 
Mrs. Van der Stahl, Cornelie, and the girls, Annie and Emily. Annie was pouring out the tea, and they were discussing Miss Taylor and Urania. I am a stranger to you, too, said Cornelie. You are not a stranger to me, to us. But Miss Taylor and Urania don't matter. Hundreds of shadows pass through our lives. I don't see them and don't feel for them. Am I not a shadow? I have talked to you too much in the Borghese and the Palatine to look upon you as a shadow. Rudyard is a dangerous shadow, said Annie. He has no hold over us, Ducal replied. Mrs. Van der Stahl looked at Cornelie. She understood the inquiring glance and said, laughing, No, he has no hold over me either. Still, if I felt the need of a religion, I mean an ecclesiastical religion, I would rather be a Roman Catholic than a Protestant. But, as things are, she did not complete her sentence. She felt safe in this studio, in this soft, many-colored profusion of beautiful things, in the affection of her friends. She felt in harmony with them all, with the worldly charm of that somewhat superficial mother and her two pretty girls, a little doll-like and vaguely cosmopolitan, and a trifle vain of the little Marchese's with whom they danced and bicycled and with that son, that brother, so very different from the three of them, and yet obviously related to them, as a movement, a gesture, a single word would show. It also struck Cornelie that they accepted each other affectionately as they were. Duco, his mother and sisters, with their stories about Princess Colonna and Odescalci, Mivro and the girls and him, with his worn jacket and his unkempt hair. And, when he began to speak, especially about Rome, when he put his dream into words in almost bookish sentences, which, however, flowed easily and naturally from his lips, Cornelie felt in harmony with her surroundings, secure and interested, and to some extent lost that longing to contradict him with his artistic indolence sometimes aroused in her, and, besides his indolence, suddenly seemed to her merely apparent and perhaps an affection, for he showed her sketches and water-colour drawings, not one of them finished, but every water-colour alive with light before all things, alive with all that light of Italy. The pearl sunsets over the molden emerald of Venice, the campanile of Florence drawn vaguely and dreamily against the tender tea rose skies, Siena forest like blue pack in the bluish moonlight, the blazing sunset behind St. Peter's, and above all, the ruins in every kind of light, the forum in the bright sunlight, the palatine by twilight the Colosseum mysterious in the night, and then the Campagna, all the dreamlike skies and luminous haze of the glad and sad Campagna, with pale pink mauves, dewy blues, dusky violets or the swaggering ochres of pyrotechnical sunsets, and clouds flaring like the crimson pinions of the phoenix and when cornelie asked him why nothing was finished off he answered that nothing was right he saw the skies as dreams visions and apotheosis and on his paper they became water and paint and paint was not a thing to be finished off besides he lacked the self-confidence and then he laid his skies aside he said and sat down to copy Byzantine Madonnas. When he saw that his watercolors interested her nevertheless, he went on talking about himself, how he had at first raved over the noble and ingenuous primitives, Giotto and especially Lippo Mimi, how, after that, spending a year in Paris, he had found nothing that excelled for Anne cold, dry satire in two or three lines, how, next in the Louvre, Rubens became revealed to him, 
Rubens, whose own talent and whose own brush he used to trace amid all the prentice work and imitations of his pupils, until he was unable to tell which cherub was by Rubens himself in a sky full of cherubs painted by four or five disciples. And then, he said, he would pass weeks without giving a thought to painting or taking up a brush and would go daily to the Vatican, lost in contemplation of the magnificent marbles. Once he had sat dreaming a whole morning in front of Eros, once he had dreamt a poem there to a very gentle, melodious, monotonous accompaniment, like an inward incantation. On coming home he had tried to put both poem and music on paper, but he had failed. Now he could no longer look at Foran, thought Rubens coarse and disgusting, but remained faithful to the primitives. And suppose for a moment that I painted a lot and sent a lot of pictures to exhibitions. Should I be any happier? Should I feel satisfied in having done something? I doubt it. Sometimes I do finish a watercolor and sell it, and then I can go on living for a month without troubling Mama. Money I don't care about. Ambition is quite foreign to my nature. But don't let us talk about myself. Do you still think of the future and bread? Perhaps, she said with a melancholy laugh while the studio around her grew dusk and dim, and the figures of his mother and sisters, sitting silent, languid, and uninterested in their easy chairs, gradually faded away and every color slowly paled. But I am so weak-minded. You say that you are not an artist, and I, I am not an apostle. To give one's life a course, that is the difficulty. Every life has a line, an appointed course, a road, a path. Life has to flow along that line to death, and what comes after death, and that line is difficult to find. I shall never find my line. I don't see my line before me either. Do you know a restlessness has come over me? Mama, listen, a restlessness has come over me. I used to dream in the forum. I was happy and I didn't think about my line, my appointed course. Mama, do you think about your line? Do you, girls? His sisters giggled in the dark, sunk in their low chairs like two pussy cats. Mama got up. Duco, dear, you know I can't follow you. I admire Cornelie for liking your watercolors and understanding what you mean by that line. My line is to go home at once, for it is very late. That's the line of the next two seconds, but there is a restlessness about my line that affects it for days and weeks to come. I am not leading the right life. The past is very beautiful and so peaceful, because it has been. But I have lost that peace. The present is very small, but the future... Oh, if we could only find a name for the future. They no longer listened. They went down the dark stairs, groping their way. Bread? He asked himself wonderingly. End of chapter 11Chapter 12 of The Inevitable. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading done by Jules Harlech. The Inevitable by Louis Capurus. Translated by Alexander Texiera de Matos. The Inevitable. Chapter 12 One morning, when Cornelie stayed indoors, she went through the books that lay scattered about her room, and she found that it was useless for her to read Ovid in order to study something of Roman manners, some of which had alarmed and shocked her. She found that Dante and Petrarch were too difficult to learn Italian from. 
whereas she had only to pick up a word or two in order to make herself understood in a shop or by the servants. She found Hare's walks a too wearisome guide. Besides, every cobblestone in Rome did not inspire her with the same interest that Hare evidently derived from it. Then she confessed to herself that she could never see Italy and Rome as Duco van der Stahl did. She never saw the light of the skies or the drifting of the clouds as he had seen them in his unfinished watercolor sketches. She had never seen the ruins transfigured in glory as he did in his hours of dreaming on the Palatine or in the Forum. She saw a picture merely with a layman's eye. A Byzantine Madonna made no appeal to her. She was very fond of statues, but to fall head over heels in love with a mutilated marble tarso, in the spirit in which he loved the Eros, seemed to her sickly. And yet it seemed to be the right spirit in which to see the Eros. Well, not sickly, she admitted, but morbid, the word though she herself smiled at it, expressed her opinion better. Not sickly, but morbid. And she looked upon an olive as a tree rather like a willow, whereas Duco had told her that an olive was the most beautiful tree in the world. She did not agree with him, either about the olive or about the arrows, and yet she felt that he was right from a certain mysterious standpoint on which there was no room for her, because it was like a mystic eminence amid impassable sensitive spheres which were not hers, even as the eminence was to her an unknown vantage point of sensitiveness and vision. She did not agree with him, and yet she was convinced of his greater rightness, his truer view his nobler insight, his deeper feeling. And she was certain that her way of seeing Italy, in the disappointment of her disillusion, in the grey light of a growing indifference, was neither noble nor good. And she knew that the beauty of Italy escaped her, whereas to him it was like a tangible and comprehensible vision. And she cleared away Ovid and Petrarch, and Hare's guidebook, and locked them up in her trunk, and took out the novels and pamphlets which had appeared that year about the woman movement in Holland. She took an interest in the problem, and thought it made her more modern than Duco, who suddenly seemed to her to belong to a bygone age. Not modern, not modern. She repeated the words with enjoyment and suddenly felt herself stronger. To be modern, that should be her strength. One phrase of Duco's had struck her immensely, that exclamation, Oh, if we could only find a name, our life has a line, a path which it must follow. To be modern, was that not a line? To find the solution of a modern problem? Was that not a name in life? He was quite right from his point of view, from which he saw Italy, but was not the whole of Italy a past, a dream at least, that Italy which Duco saw, a dreamy paradise of nothing but art? It could not be right to stand like that, see like that a dream like that. The present was here, on the grey horizon muttered an approaching storm, and the latter-day problems flashed like lightning. Was that not what she had to live for? She felt for the woman. She felt for the girl. She herself had been the girl, brought up only as a social ornament, to shine, to be pretty and attractive, and then, of course, to get married. She had shone and she had married, and now she was three and twenty, divorced from the husband, who at one time had been her only aim, and, for her sake, the aim of her parents. Now she was alone, astray, desperate, and utterly disconsolate. She had nothing to cling to, and she suffered. She still loved him, cad and scoundrel though he was, and she had thought that she was doing something very clever when she went abroad to Italy to study art. 
but she did not understand art she did not feel italy oh how clearly she saw it after those talks with duco that she would never understand art even though she used to sketch a bit even though she used to have a biscuit group after canova in her boudoir cupid and psyche so nice for a young girl and with what certain she now knew that she would never grasp Italy, because she did not think an olive tree so very beautiful, and had never seen the sky of the Campagna as a fluttering phoenix wing. No, Italy would never be the consolation of her life. But what then? She had been through much, but she was alive and very young, and once again, at the sight of these pamphlets, at the sight of that novel, the desire arose in her soul to be modern, to be modern, and to take part in the problem of today, to live for the future, to live for her fellow woman, married or unmarried. She dared not look down into herself, lest she should waver, to live for the future. It separated her a little more from Duco, that new ideal. Did she mind? Was she in love with him? No, she thought not. She had been in love with her husband, and did not want to fall in love at once with the first agreeable young man whom she chanced to meet in Rome. And she read the pamphlets about the feminine problem and love. Then she thought of her husband, then of Duco, and wearily she dropped the pamphlets and reflected how sad it all was, people, women, girls she a woman a young woman an aimless woman how sad her life was and duco he was happy and yet he was seeking the line of his life yet he was looking out for his aim a new restlessness had entered into him and she wept a little and anxiously twisted herself on her cushions and clasped her hands and prayed unconsciously without knowing to whom she was praying Oh, God, tell me what to do. End of chapter 12。Chapter 13 of the Inevitable。domain。For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading done by Jules Harlech. The Inevitable by Louis Capurus. Translated by Alexander Texiera de Matos. The Inevitable. Chapter 13. It was then, after a few days, that Cornelie conceived the idea of leaving the boarding house and going to live in rooms. The hotel life disturbed her budding thoughts like the wind of vanity that was constantly blighting very vague and fragile blossoms, and, despite a torrent of abuse from the Marchesa, who reproached her for having engaged to stay the whole winter, she moved into the rooms which she had found with Duco van der Stahl, after much hunting and stair-climbing. They were in the Via Dia Serpenti, up any number of stairs, a set of two roomy but almost entirely unfinished apartments containing only the absolute essentials. And, though the view extended far and wide above the housetops of Rome to the circular room of the Colosseum, the rooms were rough and uncomfortable, bare and uninviting. Duco had not approved of them and said that they made him shiver, although they faced the sun but there was something about the ruggedness of the place that harmonized with Cornelie's new mood. When they parted that day, he thought how inartistic she was, and she how unmodern he was. They did not meet again for several days, and Cornelie was very lonely, but did not feel her loneliness, because she was writing a pamphlet on the social position of divorced women. The idea was suggested to her by a few sentences in a tract on the feminist problem, 
and at once, without wasting much time in thought, she flung off her sentences in a succession of impulses and intuitions, rough-hewn, cold and clear. She wrote in an epistolary style, without literary art, as though to warn girls against cherishing too many illusions about marriage. She had not made her rooms comfortable. She sat there high over Rome, with her view across the housetops to the Colosseum, writing, writing and writing, absorbed in her sorrow, uttering herself in her stubborn sentences, feeling intensely bitter, but pouring the wormwood of her soul in her pamphlet. Mrs. van der Stahl and the girls who came to see her were surprised by her untidy appearance, her rough-looking rooms, with a dying fire in the little grate, and with no flowers, no books, no tea, and no cushions, and, when they went away after fifteen minutes, pleading urgent errands, they looked at each other, tripping down the endless stairs, with eyes of amazement, utterly at a loss to understand this transformation of an interesting, elegant little woman, surrounded by an aura of poetry and a tragic past, into an independent woman, working furiously at the pamphlet full of bitter invective against society. And, when Duco looked her up again in a week's time, and came to sit with her a little, he remained silent, stiff and upright in his chair, without speaking, while Cornelie read the beginning of her pamphlet to him. He was touched by the glimpses which it revealed to him of personal suffering and experience, but he was irritated by a certain discord between that slender, lily-like woman, with her drooping movements and the surroundings in which she now felt at her ease, entirely absorbed in her hatred for the society, Hague society, which had become hostile to her because she refused to go on living with a cad who ill-treated her. And while she was reading, Duco thought, she would not write like that if she were not writing it all down from her own suffering. Why doesn't she make a novel of it? Why generalize from one's personal sorrows, and why that admonishing voice? He did not like it. He thought the sound of that voice was hard, those truths so personal, that bitterness unattractive, and that hatred of convention so small. And when she put a question to him, he did not say much, nodded his head in vague approval, and remained sitting in his stiff, uncomfortable attitude. He did not know what to answer. He was unable to admire. He thought her inartistic and yet a great compassion welled up within him when he saw, in spite of it all, how charming she would be, and what charm and womanly dignity would be hers could she find the line of her life, and move harmoniously along that line with the music of her own movement. He now saw her taking a wrong road, a path pointed out to her by the fingers of others, and not entered upon from the impulse of her own soul and he felt the deepest pity for her. He, an artist, but above all, a dreamer, sometimes saw vividly, despite his dreaming, despite his sometimes all-embracing love of line and color and atmosphere, he, the artist and dreamer, sometimes very clearly saw the emotion looming through the outward actions of his fellow creatures, saw it like light shining through alabaster, and he suddenly saw her lost, seeking, straying, seeking she herself knew not what, straying she herself knew not through what labyrinth, far from her line, the line of her life, and the course of her soul's journey, which she had never yet found. She sat before him excitedly. She had read her last pages with a flushed face, in a resonant voice, her whole being in a fever. She looked as if she would have liked to fling those bitter pages at the feet of her Dutch sisters, at the feet of all women. He, absorbed in his speculation, 
melancholy in his pity for her, had scarcely listened, nodding his head in vague approval. And suddenly she began to speak of herself, revealed herself wholly, told him her life, her existence as a young girl at The Hague her education with a view to shining a little and being attractive and pretty, with not one serious glance at her future, only waiting for a good match with a flirtation here and a little love affair there, until she was married. A good match, in her own circle, her husband a first lieutenant of hussars, a fine, handsome fellow of a good, distinguished family, with a little money. She had fallen in love with him for his handsome face and his fine figure, which his uniform showed to advantage, and he with her as he might have done with any other girl who had a pretty face. Then came the revelation of those very early days, the discord between their characters manifesting itself luridly at once. She, spoiled at home, dainty, delicate, fastidious, but selfishly fastidious and flying out against any offence to her own spoiled little ego. He no longer the lover, but immediately and brutally the man with rights to this and rights to that, with an oath here and a roar there, she with neither the tact nor the patience to make of their foundering lives what could still be made of them, nervous, quick-tempered, quick to resent coarseness, which made his savagery flare up so violently that he ill-treated her, swore at her, struck her, shook her, and banged her against the wall. The divorce followed. He had not consented at first, content, in spite of all, to have a house and in that house a wife, female to him, the male, and declining to return to the discomfort of life in chambers, until she simply ran away first to her parents, then to friends in the country, protesting loudly against the law, which was so unjust to women. He had yielded at last and allowed himself to be accused of infidelity, which was not beside the truth. She was now free, but stood as it were alone, looked at askant by all her acquaintances, refusing to yield to their conventional demand for that sort of half-mourning which, according to their conventional ideas, should surround a divorced woman and at once returning to her former life, the gay life of an unmarried girl. But she had felt that this could not go on, both because of her acquaintances and because of herself. Her acquaintances looking at her askant, and she loathing her acquaintances, loathing their parties and dinners, until she felt profoundly unhappy, lonely and forlorn, without anything or anybody to cling to, and had felt all the depression that weighs down on the divorced woman. Sometimes, in her heart of hearts, she reflected that, by dint of great patience and great tact, she might have managed that man, but he was not wicked, only coarse, that she was still fond of him, or at least of his handsome face and his sturdy figure. Love, no, it was not love, but had she ever thought of love as she now sometimes pictured it? And did not nearly everybody live more or less so-so, with a good deal of give and take? but this regret she hardly confessed to herself, did not now confess to Duco, and what she did confess was her bitterness, her hatred of her husband, of marriage, of convention, of people, of the world, of all the great generalities, generalizing her own feelings into one great curse against life. He listened to her with pity. He felt that there was something noble in her, which, however, had been stifled from the beginning. He forgave her for not being artistic, but he was so sorry that she had never found herself, that she did not know what she was, who she was, what her life should be, or where the line of her life wound, the only path which she ought to tread, as every life follows one path. Oh, how often! 
if a person would but let herself go, like a flower, like a bird, like a cloud, like a star which so obediently ran its course, she would find her happiness and her life, even as the flower or the birds find them, even as the cloud drifts before the sun, even as the star follows its course through the heavens. But he told her nothing of his thoughts, knowing that, especially in her present mood of bitterness, she would not understand them and could derive no comfort from them, because they would be too vague for her and too far removed from her own manner of thinking. She thought of herself, but imagined that she was thinking of women and girls and their movement towards the future. The lines of women. But had not every woman a line of her own? Only how few of them knew it, their direction, their path, their line of life, their wavering course in the twilight of the future. And perhaps, because they did not know it for themselves, they were now all seeking together a broad path, a main road, along which they would march in troops, in a threatening multitude of women, in regiments of women, with banners and mottoes and war cries, a broad path, paralleled with the movement of the men, until the two paths would melt into one, until the troops of women would mingle with the troops of men, with equal rights and equal fullness of life. He said nothing to her. She noticed his silence and did not see how much was going on within him, how earnestly he was thinking of her, how profoundly he pitied her. She thought that she had bored him, and suddenly, around her, she saw the dim, barren room, saw that the fire was out, and her zeal subsided, her fever cooled, and she thought her pamphlet bad, lacking strength and conviction. What would she not have given for a word from him? But he sat silent, seemed to take no interest, probably did not admire her style of writing, and she felt sad, deserted, lonely, estranged from him, and bitter because of the estrangement. She felt ready to weep, to sob, and strange to say, in her bitterness she thought of him, of her husband, with his handsome face. She could not restrain herself. She wept. Duco came up to her, put his hand on her shoulder. Then she felt something of what was going on within him, and that his silence was not due to coldness. She told him that she could not remain alone that evening. She was too wretched, too wretched. He comforted her, said that there was much that was good, much that was true in her pamphlet, that he was not a good judge of these modern questions, that he was never clever except when he talked about Italy, that he felt so little for people and so much for statues, so little for what was newly building for a coming century and so much for what lay in ruins and remained over from earlier centuries. He said it as though apologizing. She smiled through her tears but repeated that she could not stay alone that evening and that she was coming with him to Baloney's, to his mother and sisters, and they went together, they walked round together, and to divert her mind he spoke to her of his own thoughts, told her anecdotes of the Renaissance masters. She did not hear what he said, but his voice was sweet to her ears. There was something so gentle about his indifference to the modern things that interested her. He had so much calmness, healing as a balsam, in the restfulness of his soul, which allowed itself to move along the golden thread of his dreams, as though that thread was the line of his life. So much calmness and gentleness that she grew calmer and gentler and looked up to him with a smile. And, however far removed they might be from each other, he going along a dreamy path, she lost in an obscure maze, they nevertheless felt each other approaching, felt their souls drawing near to each other, while their bodies moved beside each other in the actual street, through Rome, in the evening, 
He put his arms through hers to guide her steps. And when they came in sight of Bologna's, she thanked him. She did not know exactly for what. For the look in his eyes, for his voice, for the walk, for the consolation which she felt inexplicably yet clearly radiating from him. And she was glad to have come with him this evening and to feel the distraction of the baloney table d'hote around her. But at night, alone, alone in her bare rooms, she was overcome by her wretchedness as by the sea of blackness, and, looking out at the Colosseum, which showed faintly as a black arc in the black night, she sobbed until she felt herself sinking to the point of death, derelict, lonely, and forlorn, high up above Rome, above the roofs, above the pale lights of Rome by night, under the clouds of the black night, sinking and derelict, as though she were drifting a shipwreck waif on an ocean which drowned the world and roared its pliance to the inexorable heavens. End of chapter 13
repeated phrases out of her pamphlet, glowing with her red young hatred against society and people and the world. Dinner was over, and still eagerly talking, she went with the van der Stahls, Mevro and the girls and Duco, to the drawing-room, sat down in a corner, resumed her conversation, flew out at Mevro, who had contradicted her, and then suddenly saw a fat lady. The girls had already nicknamed her the Satin Frigate, come towards her with a smile and say, while still at some distance, I beg your pardon, but there's something I want to say. Look here, I have been to Bologna's regularly every winter for the last ten years, from November to Easter, and every evening after dinner, but only after dinner, I sit in this corner, at this table, on this sofa. I hope you won't mind, but I should be glad to have my own seat now. And the satin frigate smiled amiably. But when the van der Stahls and Cornelie rose in mute amazement, she dumped herself down with a rustle on the sofa, bobbed up and down for a moment on the springs, laid her crochet work on the table with a gesture as though she were planning the Union Jack in a new colony and said, with her most amiable smile, very much obliged, so many thanks. Duco roared, the girls giggled, but the satin frigate merely nodded to them good-humouredly, and, not even yet realising what had happened, astounded but gay, they sat down in another corner, the girls still seized with an irrepressible giggle. The two aesthetic ladies with the evening dress and the jagers, who sat reading at the table in the middle of the room, closed their two books with one slam, rose and indignantly went away because people were laughing and talking in the drawing room. It's a shame, they said aloud. And, angular, arrogant and grimy, they stalked out through the door. What strange people, thought Duco, smiling, shadows of people, their lines curl like aberesque through ours. Why do they cross our lines with their petty movements, and why are ours never crossed by those which perhaps would be dearest to our souls? He always took Cornelie back to the Via Dia Serpenti. They walked slowly through the silent, deserted streets, Sometimes it was late in the evening, but sometimes it was immediately after dinner, and then they would go through the Corso, and he would generally ask her to come and sit at Aragno's for a little. She agreed, and they drank their coffee amid the gaiety of the brightly lit café, watching the bustle on the pavement outside. They exchanged few words, distracted by the passers-by, and the visitors to the café. But they both enjoyed this moment and felt at one with each other. Duco evidently did not give a thought to the unconventionality of their behavior. But Cornelie thought of Mrs. van der Stahl and that she would not approve of it or consent to it in one of her daughters to sit alone with a gentleman in a café in the evening. And Cornelie also remembered the Hague, and smiled at the thought of her Hague friends. And she looked at Duco, who sat quietly, pleased to be sitting with her, and drank his coffee and spoke a word now and again, or pointed to a queer type or a pretty woman passing. One evening, after dinner, he suggested that they should all go to the ruins. It was a full moon. A wonderful sight, but Mevro was afraid of malaria. The girls of foot pads, and Duco and Cornelie went by themselves. The streets were quite empty. The Colosseum rose menacingly like a fortress in the night, but they went in, and the moonlight blue of the night shone through the open arches. The round pit of the arena was black on one side with shadow while the stream of moonlight poured in on the other side, like a white flood, like a cascade. It was as though the night were haunted, 
as though the Colosseum were haunted by all the dead past of Rome, emperors, gladiators, and martyrs. Shadows prowled like lurking wild animals. A patch of light suggested a naked woman, and the gallery seemed to rustle with the sound of the multitude and yet there was nothing, and Duco and Cornelie were alone. In the depths of the huge, colossal rune, half in shadow and half in light, and, though she was not afraid, she was obsessed by that awful haunting of the past, and pushed closer to him, and clutched his arm, and felt very, very small. He just pressed her hand, with his simple ease of manner, to reassure her and the night oppressed her. The ghostliness of it all suffocated her. The moon seemed to whirl giddily in the sky and to expand to a gigantic size and spin round like a silver wheel. He said nothing. He was in one of his dreams, seeing the past before him. And silently they went away, and he led her through the arch of Titus into the forum. On the left rose the ruins of the imperial palaces, and all around them stood the black fragments, with a few pillars soaring on high and the white moonlight pouring down like a ghostly sea out of the night. They met no one, but she was frightened and clung tighter to his arm. When they sat down for a moment on a fragment of the foundation of some ancient building, she shivered with cold. He started up, said that she must be careful not to catch a chill, and they walked on and left the forum. He took her home and she went upstairs alone, striking a match to see her way up the dark staircase. Once in her room, she perceived that it was dangerous to wander about the ruins at night. She reflected how little Duco had spoken, not thinking of danger, lost in his nocturnal dream, peering into the awful ghostliness. Why, why had he not gone alone? Why had he asked her to go with him? She fell asleep after a chaos of whirling thoughts. The prince and Urania, the fat satin lady, the Colosseum, and the martyrs, and Duco and Mrs. Van der Stahl. His mother was so ordinary, his sister's charming but commonplace, and he, so strange, so simple, so unaffected, so unreserved, and for that very reason so strange. He would be impossible at The Hague, among her friends. And she smiled as she thought of what he had said, and how he had said it, and how he could sit quietly silent for minutes on end, with a smile about his lips, as though thinking of something beautiful. But she must warn Urania, and she wearily fell asleep. End of chapter 14「Cornelie's premonition regarding Mrs. van der Stahl's opinion of her intercourse with Duco was confirmed. Mivro spoke to her seriously, saying that she would compromise herself if she went on like that and adding that she had spoken to Duco in the same sense. But Cornelie answered rather haughtily and nonchalantly, declared that, after always minding the conventions and becoming very unhappy in spite of it, she had resolved to mind them no longer, that she valued Duco's conversation, and that she was not going to be deprived of it because of what people thought or said. And then she asked Mrs. van der Stahl, who were people? Their three or four acquaintances at Belloni's? Who knew her besides? Where else did she go? 
Why should she care about the Hague? And she gave a scornful laugh, loftily parrying Mrs. van der Stahl's arguments. The conversation caused a coolness between them. Wounded in her touchy oversensitiveness, she did not come to dinner at Bologna's that evening. Next day, meeting Duco at their little table in the Osteria, she asked him what he thought of his mother's rebuke. He smiled vaguely, raising his eyebrows, obviously not realizing the commonplace truth of his mother's words, saying that those were just Mama's ideas which of course were all very well and current in the set in which Mama and his sisters lived, but which he didn't enter into or bother about unless Cornelie thought that Mama was right. And Cornelie blazed out contemptuously, shrugged her shoulders, asked who or what there was for whose sake she should allow herself to break off their friendly intercourse. They ordered a mezzo fiasco between them and had a long, chatty lunch like two comrades, like two students. He said that he had been thinking over her pamphlet. He talked to please her about the modern woman, modern marriage, the modern girl. She condemned the way in which Mrs. van der Stahl was bringing up her daughters, that light, frivolous education and that endless going about on the look for a husband. She said that she spoke from experience. They walked along the Via Appia that afternoon and went to the catacombs, where a trappist showed them around. When Cornelia returned home, she felt pleasantly light and cheerful. She did not go out again. She piled up the logs on her fire against the evening which was turning chilly, and she supped off a little bread and jelly, so as not to go out for her dinner. Sitting in her tea gown, with her hands folded over her head, she stared into the briskly burning logs and let the evening speed pass her. She was satisfied with her life, so free, independent of everything and everybody. She had a little money, she could go on living like this. She had no great needs. Her life in rooms, in little restaurants, was not expensive. She wanted no clothes. She felt satisfied. Duco was an agreeable friend. How lonely she would be without him. Only her life must acquire some aim. What aim? The feminist movement? But how? Abroad? It was such a different movement to work at. She would send her pamphlets now to a newly founded woman's paper. But then, she wasn't in Holland, and she didn't want to go to Holland. And yet there would certainly be more scope there for her activity, for exchanging views with others. Whereas here, in Rome, an indolence overcame her in the drowsiness of her cosy room, for Duco had helped her to arrange her sitting room. He certainly was a cultivated fellow, even though he was not modern. What a lot he knew about history, about Italy, and how cleverly he told it all. The way he explained Italy to her, she was interested in the country after all. Only he wasn't modern. He had no insight into Italian politics, into the struggle between the Quinerial and the Vatican, into anarchism, which was showing its head at Milan, into the riots in Sicily. A name in life, what a difficult thing it was. And, in her evening drowsiness after a pleasant day, she did not feel the absence of a name and enjoyed the soft luxury of letting her thoughts glide on in unison with the drowsy evening hours, in a voluptuous self-indulgence. She looked at the sheets of her pamphlet, scattered over her big writing table, a real table to work at. They lay yellow under the light of her reading lamp. They had not all been recopied, but she was not in the mood now. She threw a log into the little grate and the fire smoked and blazed. So pleasant, that foreign habit of burning wood instead of coal. And she thought of her husband. She missed him sometimes. 
Could she not have managed him with a little tact and patience? After all, he was very nice during the period of their engagement. He was rough, but not bad. He might have sworn at her sometimes, but perhaps he did not mean any great harm. He waltzed divinely. He swung you round so firmly. He was good-looking and, she had to confess, she was in love with him, if only for his handsome face, his handsome figure. There was something about his eyes and mouth that she was never able to resist. When he spoke, she had to look at his mouth. However, that was all over and done with. After all, perhaps the life at The Hague was too monotonous for her temperament. She liked traveling, seeing new people, developing new ideas, and she had never been able to settle down in her little set. And now she was free, independent of all ties, of all people. If Mrs. van der Stahl was angry, she didn't care. And, all the same, Duco was rather modern, in his indifference to convention. Or was it merely the artistic side in him? Or was he, as a man who was not modern, indifferent to it even as she, a modern woman, was? A man could allow himself more. A man was not so easily compromised. A modern woman, she repeated the words proudly. Her drowsiness acquired a certain arrogance. She drew herself up, stretching out her arms, looked at herself in the glass, her slender figure, her delicate little face, a trifle pale, with eyes big and gray, and bright under their remarkably long lashes, her light brown hair in a loose, tangled coil, the lines of her figure, like those of a drooping lily, very winsome in the creased folds of her old tea gown, pale pink and faded. What was her path in life? She felt herself to be something more than a worker and fighter, to be very complex, felt that she was a woman too, felt a great womanliness inside her, like a weakness which would hamper her energy. And she wandered through the room, unable to decide to go to bed, and, staring into the gloomy ashes of the expiring fire, she thought of her future, of what she would become and how of how she would go and whither, along which curve of life, wandering through what forests, winding through what alleys, crossing which other curves of which other, seeking souls. End of chapter 15「Chapter 16 of The Inevitable » This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading done by Jules Harlock. The Inevitable by Louis Capurus. Translated by Alexander Texiera de Matos. The Inevitable. Chapter 16. The idea had long fixed itself in Cornelie's mind that she must speak to Urania Hope, and one morning she sent her a note asking for an appointment that afternoon. Miss Hope wrote back assenting, and at five o'clock Cornelie found her at home in her handsome and expensive sitting-room at Belloni's, many lights, many flowers. Urania hammering on the piano in an indoor gown of Venetian lace, the table decked with a rich tea, with cut bread and butter, cakes and sweets. Cornelia had said that she wanted to see Miss Hope alone, on a matter of importance, and at once asked if she would be alone, feeling a doubt of it, now that Urania was receiving her so formally. But Urania reassured her. She had said that she was at home to no one but Mrs. de Reitz, and was very curious to know what Cornelia had come to talk about. Cornelia reminded Urania of her former warning, and, when Urania laughed, she took her hand and looked at her with such serious eyes 
that she made an impression of the American girl's frivolous nature, and Urania became puzzled. Urania now suddenly thought it very momentous, a secret, an intrigue, a danger, in Rome, and they whispered together, and Cornelie, no longer feeling anxious amid this increasing intimacy, confessed to Urania what she had heard through the half-open door. The Marchesa's machinations with her nephew, whom she was absolutely bent on marrying to a rich heiress at the behest of the prince's father, who seemed to have promised her so much for putting the match through. Then she spoke of Miss Taylor's conversion, affected by Rudyard. Rudyard, who did not seem able to achieve his purpose with Urania, failing to obtain a hold on her confiding but frivolous butterfly nature, and who, as Cornelie suspected, had for that reason incurred the disfavor of his ecclesiastical superiors and vanished without settling his debt to the Marchesa. His place appeared to have been taken by the two Monsignori, who looked more dignified and worldly and displayed great unctuousness, were more lavished in smiles. And Urania, staring at this danger, at these pitfalls under her feet, which Cornelia had suddenly revealed to her, now became really frightened, turned pale, and promised to be on her guard. Really, she would have liked to tell her maid to pack up at once, so that they might leave Rome as soon as possible, for another town, another pension, one with lots of titled people. She adored titles. And Cornelie, seeing that she had made an impression, continued, spoke of herself, spoke of marriage in general, said that she had written a pamphlet against marriage and the social position of divorced women. And she spoke of the suffering which she had been through and of the feminist movement in Holland. And, once in the vein, she abandoned all restraint and talked more and more emphatically until Urania thought her exceedingly clever, a very clever girl to be able to argue and write like that on a question brûlée lente, laying a fine stress on the first syllables of the French words. She admitted that she would like to have the vote, and as she said this, spread out the long train of her lace tea gown. Cornelie spoke of the injustice of the law which leaves the wife nothing, takes everything from her, and forces her entirely into the husband's power. And Urania agreed with her and passed the little dish of chocolate creams. And to the accompaniment of a second cup of tea they talked excitedly, both speaking at once, neither listening to what the other was saying, and Urania said that it was a shame. From the general discussion they relapsed to the consideration of their particular interests. Cornelie depicted the character of her husband, unable, in the coarseness of his nature, to understand a woman or to consent that a woman should stand beside him and not beneath him. And she once more returned to the Jesuits, to the danger of Rome for rich girls traveling alone, to that virago of a marchesa and to the prince, that titled bait which the Jesuits flung to win a soul and to improve the finances of an impoverished Italian house, which had remained faithful to the Pope and refused to serve the king. And both of them were so vehement and excited that they did not hear the knock and looked up only when the door slowly opened they started glanced round and both turned pale when they saw the prince of forte Braccio enter the room he apologized with a smile said that he had seen a light in miss urania's sitting-room that the porter had told her she was engaged but that he had ventured to disobey her orders and he sat down, and, in spite of all that they had been saying, Urania thought it delightful to have the prince sitting there and accepting a cup of tea at her hands and graciously 
consenting to eat a piece of cake. And Urania showed her album of coats of arms. The prince had already contributed an impression of his. And next the album with patterns of the queen's ball dresses. Then the prince laughed and felt in his pocket for an envelope. He opened it and carefully produced a cutting of blue brocade embroidered with silver and seed pearls. What is it? asked Urania in ecstasy. And he said that he had brought her a pattern of Her Majesty's last dress, his cousin, not a black like himself but a white, belonging not to the papal but to the court party and a lady in waiting to the queen had procured this cutting for him for Urania's album. Urania would see it herself. The queen would wear the dress at next week's court ball. He was not going. He did not even go to his cousins officially, not to her parties, but he saw her sometimes because of the family relationship, out of friendship. And he begged Urania not to give him away. It might injure him in his career." What career? Cornelie wondered to herself. If people knew that he saw much of his cousin, but he had called on her pretty often lately, for Urania's sake, to get her that pattern. And Urania was so grateful that she forgot all about this social position of girls and women, married or unmarried, and would gladly have sacrificed her right to the franchise for such a charming Italian prince. Cornelie became vexed, rose, bowed coldly to the prince, and drew Urania with her to the door. Don't forget what we have been saying, she warned her. Be on your guard. And she saw the prince look at her sarcastically as they whispered together, suspecting that she was talking about him, but proud of the power of his personality and his title and his attentions over the daughter of an American stockinet manufacturer. End of chapter 16「the inevitable chapter seventeen a coolness had arisen between mrs van der stahl and cornelie and cornelie no longer went to dine at belloni's she did not see mevro and the girls again for weeks but she saw duco daily notwithstanding the essential differences in their characters they had grown so accustomed to being together that they missed each other even if a day passed without their meeting and so they had gradually come to lunch and dined together every day almost as a matter of course in the morning at the osteria and in the evening at some small restaurant or other usually very simply to avoid dividing the bill duco would pay one time and cornelie the next generally they had much to talk about he taught her rome took her after lunch to all manner of churches and museums and under his guidance she began to understand appreciate and admire by unconscious suggestion he inspired her with some of his ideas she found painting very difficult but understood sculpture more readily and she began to look upon him as not merely morbid she looked up to him he spoke quite simply to her as from his exalted standpoint of feeling and knowledge and understanding of very exalted matters which she as a girl and later as a young married woman had never seen in the glorious apotheosis which he caused to rise before her like the first gleam of dawn of a new day in which she beheld new types of life 
created of all that was noblest in the artist's soul. He regretted that he could not show her Giotto in the Santa Croce at Florence, and the primitives in Uffizi, and that he had to teach her Rome straight away. But he introduced her to all the exuberant art life of the papal renaissance, until, under the influence of his speech, she shared that life for a single intense second, and until Michelangelo and Raphael stood out before her, also living. After a day like that, he would think that, after all, she was not so hopelessly inartistic, and she thought of him with respect, even after the suggestion was interrupted, and when she reflected on what she had seen and heard, and really, deep down in herself, no longer understood things so well as she had that morning, because she was lacking in love for them. But so much glamour of colour and the past remained whirling before her eyes in the evening that it made her pamphlet seem drab and dull, and the feminist movement ceased to interest her, and she did not care about Urania Hope. He admitted to himself that he had quite lost his peace of mind, that Cornelie stood before him in his thoughts, between him and his old triptychs, that his lonely, friendless, ingenuous, simple life, content with wandering through and outside Rome, with reading, dreaming, and now and then painting a little, had changed entirely in habit and in line, now that the line of his life had crossed that of hers, and they both seemed to be going one way. He did not really know why. Love was not exactly the word for the feeling that drew him towards her. And just very vaguely, inwardly and unconsciously, he suspected, though he never actually said or even thought as much, that it was the line of her figure which was marked by something almost Byzantine. The slenderness of the frame, the long arms, the drooping lily line of the woman who suffered, with the melancholy in her grey eyes, overshadowed by their almost too long lashes, that it was the noble shape of her hand, small and pretty for a tall woman, that it was a movement of her neck as of a swaying stalk, or a tired swan trying to glance backwards. He had never met many women, and those whom he had met had always seemed very ordinary. But she was unreal to him, in the contradictions of her character, in its vagueness and intangibility, in all the half-tints which escaped his eyes, accustomed to the half-tints though it was. What was she like? What he had always seen in her character was a woman in a novel, a heroine in a poem. What was she, a living woman of flesh and blood? She was not artistic, and she was not inartistic. She had no energy, and yet she did not lack energy. She was not precisely cultivated, and yet, obeying her impulse and her intuition, she wrote a pamphlet on one of the most modern questions and worked at it and revised it and copied it till it became a piece of writing no worse than another. She had a spacious way of thinking, loathing all the pettiness of the clichés, no longer feeling at home after her suffering in her little Hague set, and here, in Rome, at a dance she listened behind a door to a nonsensical conspiracy hardly worthy of the name, he thought, and had gone to Urania Hope to mingle with the confused curves of smaller lives, curves without importance, of people whom he despised for their lack of line, of color, of vision, of haze, of everything that was dear as life to him and made up life for him. What was she like? He did not understand her, but her curve was of importance to him. She was not without a line, a line of art and a line of life. She moved in the dream of her own indefiniteness before his gazing eyes, and she loomed up out of the haze as out of the twilight of his studio atmosphere, and stood before him like a phantom. He would not call that love, 
but she was dear to him like a revelation that constantly veiled itself in secrecy and his life as a lonely wanderer was it was true changed but she had introduced no inharmonious habit into his life he enjoyed taking his meals in the little cafe or osteria and she took them with him easily and simply not squalidly but pleasantly and harmoniously with an adaptability and with just as much natural grace as when she used to dine of an evening at the table d'hote at Belloni's. All this, that contradictory admixture of unreality, of inconsistency, that living vision of indefiniteness, that intangibility of her individual essence, that self-concealment of the soul that blending of her essential characteristics had become a charm to him a restlessness a need a nervous want in his life otherwise so restful so easily contented and calm but above all a charm an indispensable everyday charm and without troubling about what people might think about what mrs van der Stel thought they would one day go to tivoli together or another day walk from Castel Gandolfo to Albano and drive to Lago di Nimi, and picnic at the Villa Sforza Cesarini, with the broken capital of a classic pillar for a table. They rested side by side in the shadow of the trees, admired the camellias, silently contemplated the glassy clearness of the lake, diana's looking-glass and drove back over frascasi they were silent in the carriage and he smiled as he reflected how they had taken everything that day for man and wife she also thought of their charming intimacy and at the same time thought that she would never marry again and she thought of her husband and compared him with duco so young in the face but with eyes full of depth and soul a voice so calm and even, with everything that he had said much to the point, so accurately informed, and then his calmness, his simplicity, his lack of passion, as though his nerves had schooled themselves only to feel the calmness of art in the dreamy mists of his life. And she confessed to herself there, in the carriage beside him, amid the softly shelving hills, purpling away in the evening, while before her faded the rose mallow of a pale gold sunset that he was dear to her because of that cleverness that absence of passion that simplicity and that accuracy of information a clear voice sounding up out of the dreamy twilight and that she was happy to be sitting beside him to hear that voice and by chance to feel his hand happy in that her line of life had crossed his in that their two lines seemed to form a path towards the increasing brightness the gradual daily elucidation of their immediate future end of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of the inevitable this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading done by Jules Harlech. The Inevitable by Louis Capurus. Translated by Alexander Texiera de Matos. The Inevitable, Chapter 18. Cornelie now saw no one except Duco mrs van der stahl had broken with her and would not allow her daughters to have any further intercourse with her a coolness had arisen even between the mother and the son cornelie saw no one now except duco and at times urania hope the american girl came to her pretty often and told her about Bellonis, where the people talked about Cornelia and Duco and commented on their relations. Urania was glad to think herself above that hotel gossip. 
but still she wanted to warn Cornelie. Her words displayed a simple spontaneity of friendship that appealed to Cornelie. When Cornelie, however, asked after the prince, she became silent and confused, and evidently did not wish to say much. Then, after the court ball, at which the queen had really worn the dress embroidered with seed pearls, Urania came and looked Cornelia up again and admitted, over a cup of tea, that she had that morning promised to go and see the prince at his own place. She said this quite simply, as though it was the most natural thing in the world. Cornelia was horrified and asked her how she could have promised such a thing. Why not? Urania replied. What is there in it? I receive his visits. If he asks me to come and see his rooms, he lives in the Palazzo Rospoli and wants to show me his pictures and miniatures and old lace. Why should I refuse to go? Why should I make a fuss about it? I am above any such narrow-mindedness. We American girls go about freely with our men friends. And what about yourself? You go for walks with Mr. Van der Stahl. You lunch with him. You go for trips with him. You go to his studio. I have been married, said Cornelie. I am responsible to no one. You have your parents. What are you thinking of doing is imprudent and high-handed? Tell me, does the prince think of marrying you? If I become Catholic, and I think I shall. I have written to Chicago, she said hesitantly. She closed her beautiful eyes for a second and went pale because the title of princess and duchess flashed before her sight. Only, she began, only what? I shan't have a cheerful life. The prince belongs to the blacks. They are always in mourning because of the Pope. They have hardly anything in their set. No dances, no parties. If we got married, I should like him to come to America with me. Their home in the Abruzzi is a lonely, tumble-down castle. His father is a very proud, standoffish, silent person. I have been told so by ever so many people. What am I to do, Cornelie? I am very fond of Giglio. His name is Virgilio. And then, you know, the title is an old Italian title. Principe di Forte Brasio, Duca di San Stefano. But then, you see, that's all there is to it. San Stefano is a hole. That's where his papa lives. They sell wine and live on that. And olive oil, but they don't make any money. My father manufactures stockinette but he has grown rich on it. They haven't many family jewels. I have made inquiries. His cousin, the Countessa di Rosavilla, the lady-in-waiting to the Queen, is nice, but we shouldn't see her officially. I shouldn't be able to go anywhere. It does strike me as rather boring. Cornelie spoke vehemently, blazed out, and repeated her phrases against marriage in general and now against this marriage in particular, merely for the sake of a title. Urania assented. It was merely for the title. But then there was Giglio too, of course. He was so nice and she was fond of him. But Cornelie didn't believe a word of it and told her so straight out. Urania began to cry. She did not know what to do. And when were you to go to the prince? This evening. Don't go. No, no. You're right. I shan't go. Do you promise me? Yes, yes. Don't go, Urania. No, I shan't go. You're a dear girl. You're quite right. I won't go. I swear to you, I won't. End of chapter 18「
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading done by Jules Harlech. The Inevitable by Louis Capurus. Translated by Alexander Texiera de Matos. The Inevitable, Chapter 19. The undertaking which Urania had given was so vague, however, that Cornelie felt uneasy and spoke of it to Duco that evening when she met him at the restaurant. But he was not interested in Urania, in what she did or didn't do, and he shrugged his shoulders indifferently. Cornelie, on the other hand, was silent and absent-minded and did not listen to what he was talking about. A side panel of a triptych, undoubtedly by Lippo Mimi, which he had discovered in a little shop by the Tiber. The angel of the Annunciation, almost as beautiful as the one in the Euphesi, kneeling with the stir of his last flight yet about him, with the lily stem in his hands. But the dealer asked two hundred lire for it, and he did not want to give more than fifty, and yet the dealer had not mentioned Mimi's name, did not suspect that the angel was by Mimi. Cornelie was not listening, and suddenly she said, I am going to the Palazzo Rospoli. He looked up in surprise. What for? To ask for Miss Hope. He was dumb with amazement and continued to look at her open-mouthed. If she's not there, Cornelie went on, it's all right. If she is, if she has gone after all, I'll ask to speak to her on urgent business. He did not know what to say, thinking her sudden idea so strange, so eccentric, thinking it so unnecessary that her curve should cross the curves of insignificant, indifferent people that he did not know how to choose his words. Cornelie glanced at her watch. It's past half past nine. If she does go, she will go about this time. She called the waiter and paid the bill. And she buttoned her coat and stood up. He followed after her. Cornelie, he began, isn't what you are doing rather strange? It means all sorts of worries for you. If one always objected to being worried, one would never do a good action. They walked on in silence, he moving irritably by her side. They did not speak. He thought her intention simply crazy. She thought him wanting and chivalry, not to wish to protect Urania. She was thinking of her pamphlet, of her fellow women, and she wanted to protect Urania from marriage, from that prince. And they walked through the Corso to the Palazzo Raspoli, he became nervous, made another attempt to restrain her, but she had already asked the porter, Is il signore principe at home? The man looked at her suspiciously. No, he said curtly. I believe he is. If so, ask if Miss Hope is with his excellency. Miss Hope was not at home. I believe that she was coming to see the prince this evening, and I want to speak to her urgently, on a matter which will not brook delay. Here, la signora di Ritz. She handed him her card. She spoke with the greatest self-possession and referred to Urania's visit calmly and simply, as though it were an everyday occurrence for American girls to call on Italian princes in the evening, as though she were persuaded that the porter knew of this custom. The man was disconcerted by her attitude, bowed, took the card, and went away. Cornelia and Duco waited in the portico. He admired her calmness. He considered her behavior eccentric, but she carried out her eccentricity with a self-assurance which once more showed her in a new light. Would he never understand her? Would he never grasp anything or know anything for certain of that changeful and intangible vagueness of hers? He could never have spoken those few words to that porter in just that tone. Where had she got that tact from, that dignified, serious attitude towards that imposing janitor with his long cane and his cocked hat? 
She did it all as easily as she ordered their simple dinner, with a pleasant familiarity of the waiter at the little restaurant. The porter returned. Miss Hope and His Excellency begged that you will come upstairs. She looked at Duco with a triumphant smile, amused at his confusion. Will you come too? Why, no, he stammered. I can wait for you here. She followed the footman up the stairs. The wide corridor was hung with family portraits. The drawing-room door was open, and the prince came out to meet her. Please forgive me, prince, she said, calmly putting out her hand. His eyes were small and pinched and gleamed like carbuncles. He was white with rage, but he controlled himself and pressed his lips to the hand which she gave him. Forgive me, she went on. I want to speak to Miss Hope on an urgent matter. She entered the drawing room. Urania was there, blushing and embarrassed. You understand, Cornelie said, with a smile, that I would not have disturbed you if it had not been important. A question between women, and still important, she continued, jestingly, and the prince made an insipid, gallant reply. May I speak to Miss Hope alone for a moment? The prince looked at her. He suspected unfriendliness in her and more hostility, but he bowed with his insipid smile and said that he would leave the ladies to themselves. He went to another room. What is it? Cornelie asked Urania in agitation. She took Cornelie's two hands and looked at her anxiously. Nothing, said Cornelie severely. I have nothing to say to you. Only I had my suspicions and felt sure that you would not keep your promise. I want to make certain if you were here. Why did you come? Urania began to weep. Don't cry, whispered Cornelie mercilessly. For God's sakes, don't start crying. You've done the most thoughtless thing imaginable. I know I have, Urania confessed, nervously drying her tears. Then why did you do it? I couldn't help it. Alone with him in the evening? A man well known to be a bad lot? I know. What do you see in him? I'm fond of him. You only want to marry him for his title. For the sake of his title, you're compromising yourself. What if he doesn't respect you this evening as his future wife? What if he compels you to be his mistress? Cornelie, don't. You're a child, a thoughtless child, and your father lets you travel by yourself to see dear old Italy. You're an American and broad-minded. That's all right. To travel through the world pluckily on your own is all right. But you're not a woman. You're a baby. Cornelie, come away with me. Say that you're going with me for an urgent reason. Or no, better say nothing. Stay, but I'll stay too. Yes, you stay too. We'll send for him now. Yes, Cornelie rang the bell. A footman appeared. Tell His Excellency that we are ready. The man went away. In a little while, the prince entered. He had never been treated like that in his own house. He was seething with rage, but he remained very polite and outwardly calm. Is the important matter settled? He asked with his small eyes and his hypocritical smile. Yes, thank you very much for your discretion in leaving us to ourselves, said Cornelie. Now that I have spoken to Miss Hope, I am greatly relieved by what she has told me. Aha, uh -huh, you would like to know what we were talking about. The prince raised his eyebrows. Cornelie had spoken archly, holding up her finger as though in threat, smiling, and the prince looked at her and saw that she was handsome not with the striking beauty and freshness of Urania Hope, but with a more complex attractiveness, that of a married woman, divorced but very young, that of a fin de siècle woman, with a faintly perverse expression in her deep grey eyes, moving under very long lashes, that of a woman of particular grace 
in the drooping lines of her tired, laxed, morbid charm. A woman who knew life, a woman who saw through him, he was certain of it. A woman who, though disliking him, nevertheless spoke to him coquettishly in order to attract him, to win him, unconsciously, from sheer womanly perversity. And he saw her in her perverse beauty and admired her, sensitive as he was to various types of women. He suddenly thought her handsomer and less commonplace than Urania and much more distinguished and not so ingenuously susceptible to his title, a thing which he thought so silly in Urania. He was suddenly at his ease with her, his anger subsided. He thought it fun to have two good-looking women with him instead of one, and he jested in return, saying that he was consumed with curiosity that he had been listening at the door, but had been unable to catch a word. Alas! Cornelie laughed with a coquettish gaiety and looked at her watch. She said something about going, but sat down at the same time, unbuttoned her coat, and said to the prince, I have heard so much about your miniatures. Now that I have a chance, may I see them? The prince was willing. Charmed by the look in her eyes, by her voice, he was all fire and flame in a second. But, said Cornelie, my escort is waiting outside in the portico. He would not come up. He doesn't know you. It is Mr. Vanderstall. The prince laughed as he glanced at her. He knew of the gossip at Bologna's. He did not for a moment doubt the existence of a liaison between van der Stahl and Signora di Ritz. He knew that they did not care for the proprieties, and he began to like Cornelie very much. But I will send to Mr. van der Stahl at once to ask him to come up. He is waiting in the portico, said Cornelie. He won't like to... I'll go myself, said the prince, with obliging vivacity. He left the room. The lady stayed behind. Cornelie took off her coat, but kept on her hat, because her hair was sure to be untidy. She looked into the glass. Have you your powder on you? she asked Urania. Urania took her little ivory powder box from her bag and handed it to Cornelie, and, while Cornelie powdered her face, Urania looked at her friend and did not understand. She remembered the impression of seriousness which Cornelia had made on her at their first meeting, studying Rome, afterwards writing a pamphlet on the woman's question and the position of divorced women, then her warnings against marriage and the prince, and now she suddenly saw her as a most attractive, frivolous woman, irresistibly charming, even more bewitching than actually beautiful, full of coquetry in the depths of her gray eyes, which glanced up and down under the curling lashes, simply dressed in a dark silk blouse and a cloth skirt, but with so much distinction and so much coquetry, with so much dignity and yet with a touch of yielding winsomeness that she hardly knew her. But the prince had returned, bringing Duco with him, Duco was nervously reluctant, not knowing what had happened, not grasping how Cornelie had acted. He saw her sitting quietly, smiling, and she at once explained that the prince was going to show her his miniatures. Duco declared flatly that he did not care for miniatures. The prince suspected from his irritable tone that he was jealous and this suspicion incited the prince to pay attentions to Cornelie. And he behaved as though he was showing his miniatures only to her, as though he were showing her his old lace. She admired the lace in particular and rolled it between her delicate fingers. She asked him to tell her about his grandmothers, who used to wear the lace. Had they had any adventures? He told her one, which made her laugh very much. Then he told an anecdote or two, vivaciously, flaming up under her glance, and she laughed. Amid the atmosphere of the big drawing-room, his study, it contained his writing-table. 
with the candles lighted and flowers everywhere for urania a certain perverse gaiety began to reign an airy joie de vivre but only between cornelie and the prince urania had fallen silent and duco did not speak a word cornelie was a revelation to him also he had never seen her like that not at the dance on christmas day not at the table d'hote nor in his studio nor on their excursions nor in their restaurant was she a woman or was she ten women and he confessed to himself that he loved her that he loved her more at each revelation more with each woman that he saw in her like a new facet which she made to gleam and glitter but he could not speak could not join in their pleasantry feeling strange in that atmosphere strange in that atmosphere of buoyant animal spirits caused by nothing but aimless words as though the french and italian which they mixed up together were dropping so many pearls as though their jest shone like so much tinsel as though their equivocal playing upon words had the iridescence of a rainbow the prince regretted that his tea was no longer fit to drink but he rang for some champagne he thought that his plans had partly failed that evening for fearing to lose urania he had intended to compel her seeing her hesitation he had resolved to force the irreparable but his nature was so devoid of seriousness he was marrying to please his father and the marchesa belloni rather than himself he enjoyed his life quite as well with a load of debts and no wife as he could hope to do with a wife and millions of money that he began to consider the failure of his plans highly amusing and had to laugh within himself when he thought of his father of his aunt the marchesa and of their machinations which had no effect on urania because a pretty flirtatious woman had objected why did she object he wondered as he poured out the foaming monopoly spilling it over the glasses why does she put herself between me and the american stocking seller is she herself in italy hunting for a title but he did not care he thought the intruder charming pretty very pretty coquettish seductive bewitching he fussed around her neglecting urania almost forgetting to fill her glass and when it grew late and cornelia at last rose to go and drew urania's arm through hers and looked at the prince with a glance of triumph which they mutually understood he whispered in her ear i am ever so grateful to you for visiting me in my humble abode you have defeated me i acknowledge myself defeated the words appeared to be merely an allusion to their jesting discussion about nothing but uttered between him and her between the prince and cornelie they sounded full of meaning and he saw the smile of victory in her eyes he remained behind in his room and poured himself out what remained of the champagne and as he raised the glass to his lips he said aloud o oh, che ochi che belli ochi che belli ochi end of chapter 19chapter 20 of the inevitable this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org reading done by jules harlock the inevitable by louis capurus translated by alexander texiera de matos the Inevitable, Chapter 20 Next day, when Duco met Cornelia at the Osteria, she was very cheerful and excited. She told him that she had already received a reply from the woman's paper 
to which she had sent her pamphlet the week before, and that her work was not only accepted, but would be paid for. She was so proud at earning money for the first time that she was as merry as a little child. She did not speak of the previous evening, seemed to have forgotten Urania, but felt an exuberant need to talk. She formed all sorts of great plans, to travel about as a journalist, to fling herself into the movement of the great cities, to pursue every reality, to have herself sent by some paper as a delegate to congresses and festivals. The few guilders which she was earning already made her intoxicated with zeal, and she would like to make a lot of money and do a great deal and consider no fatigue. He thought her simply adorable in the half-light of the osteria as she sat at the little table eating her gnocchi with in front of her the mizzy fiasco of pale yellow wine of the country. Her usual languor acquired a new vivacity which astounded him. Her outline, half dark on the left, lighted on the right by the sunshine in the street, acquired a modern grace of drawing which reminded him of the French draftsman. The rather pale face with the delicate features, lit up by her smile, faintly indicated under the sailor hat, which slanted over her eyes, the hair touched with gold or a dark light brown, the white veil raised into a rumpled mist above, her figure slender and gracious in the simple, unbuttoned coat with a bunch of violets in her blouse, the manner in which she helped herself to wine, in which she addressed the camieri, the only one, who knew them well, from seeing them daily, with a pleasant familiarity, the vivacity replacing her languor, her great plans, her gay phrases, all this seemed to shine upon him, unconstrained and yet distinguished, free and yet womanly, and, above all, easy as she was at her ease everywhere, with an assimilative tact which for him constituted a particular harmony. He thought of the evening before, but she did not speak of it. He thought of the revelation of her coquetry, but she was not thinking of coquetry. She was never coquettish with him. She looked up to him, regarded him as clever and exceptional, though not belonging to his time. She respected him for the things which he said and thought and she was, as a matter of fact, towards him as one chum towards another, who happened to be older and cleverer. She felt for him a sincere friendship, an indescribable something that implied the need of being together, of living together, as though the lines of their two lives should form one line. It was not a sisterly feeling, and it was not passion, and to her mind it was not love, but it was a great sense of respectful tenderness, of longing admiration, and of affectionate delight at having met him. If she never saw him again, she would miss him as she would never miss anyone in her life, and that he took no interest in modern questions did not lower him in the eyes of this young modern Amazon, who was about to wave her first banner. It might vex her for an instant, but it did not carry weight in her estimation of him. And he saw that, with him, she was simply affectionate, without coquetry. Yet he would never forget what she had been like yesterday with the prince. He had felt jealousy and noticed it in Urania also, but she herself had acted so spontaneously in harmony with her nature that she no longer thought of that evening, of the prince, of Urania, of her own coquettishness, or of any possible jealousy on their side. He paid the bill, it was his turn, and she gaily took his arm and said, that she had a surprise in store for him, with which he would be very pleased. 
She wanted to give him something, a handsome, a very handsome keepsake. She wanted to spend on it the money she was going to receive for her article. But she hadn't got it yet. As though that mattered. It would come in due time, and she wanted to give him his present now. He laughed and asked what it could be. She hailed a carriage and whispered an address to the driver. Duco did not hear. What could it be? But she refused to tell him yet. The Venturino drove them through the Borgo to the Tiber and stopped outside a dark little old curiosity shop where the wares lay heaped up right out into the street. Cornelie, Duco exclaimed, guessing. Your lipo, Mimi Angel. I'm getting it for you. Not a word. The tears came to his eyes. They entered the shop. Ask him how much he wants for it. He was too much moved to speak, and Cornelie had to ask the price and bargain. She did not bargain long. She bought the panel for a hundred and twenty lire. She herself carried it to the Victoria, and they drove back to his studio. They carried the angel up the stairs together, as though they were bearing an unsullied happiness into his home. In the studio they placed the angel on a chair. Of a noble aspect, of a somewhat Mongolian type, with long almond-shaped eyes, the angel had just knelt down in the last stir of his flight, and the gold scarf of his gold and purple cloak fluttered in the air while his long wings quivered straight above him. Duco stared at his Mimi, filled with a twofold emotion, because of the angel and because of her. And with a natural gesture he spread out his arms. May I thank you, Cornelie? and he embraced her, and she returned his kiss. End of chapter 20「Chapter 21 of the Inevitable – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading done by Jules Harlech. The Inevitable by Louis Capurus. Translated by Alexander Texiera de Matos. The Inevitable, Chapter 21. When she came home, she found the prince's card. It was an ordinary civility after yesterday evening. Her unexpected visit to the Palazzo Rospoli, and she did not give it a second thought. She was in a pleasant frame of mind, pleased with herself, glad that her work would appear first as an article in Hetrich der Vrau. She would publish it as a pamphlet afterwards, and glad that she had made Duco happy with the Mimi. She changed into her tea gown and sat down by the fire in her musing attitude and thought of how she could carry out her great plans. To whom ought she to apply? There was an international women's congress sitting in London, and Hetchrich de Vrau had sent her a prospectus. She turned over the pages. Different feminist leaders were to speak. There would be numbers of social questions discussed, the psychology of the child, the responsibility of the parents, the influence on domestic life of women's admission to all the professions, women in art, women in medicine, the fashionable woman, the woman at home, on the stage, marriage, and divorce laws. In addition, the prospectus gave concise biographies of the speakers, with their portraits. There were American, Russian, English, Swedish, Danish women. Nearly every nationality was represented. There were old women and young women, some pretty, some ugly, some masculine, some womanly, some hard and energetic, with sexless boys' faces, 
one or two only were elegant with low-cut dresses and waved hair it was not easy to divide them into groups what impulse in their life had promoted them to join in the struggle for women's rights in some no doubt inclination nature in an occasional case vocation in another the desire to be in the fashion and in her own case what was the impulse she dropped the perspectives in her lap and stared into the fire and reflected her drawing-room education passed before her once more followed by her marriage by her divorce what was the impulse what was the inducement she had come to it gradually to go abroad to extend her sphere of vision to reflect to learn about art about the modern life of women she had glided gradually along the line of her life with no great effort of will or striving without even thinking much or feeling much she glanced into herself as though she were reading a modern novel the psychology of a woman sometimes she seemed to will things to wish to strive as just now to pursue her great plans sometimes she would sit thinking as she often did in these days beside her cosy fire sometimes she felt as she now did for duco but mostly her life had been a gradual gliding along the line which she had to follow urged by the gentle pressure of the finger of fate for a moment she saw it clearly there was a great sincerity in her she never posed either to herself or to others there were contradictions in her but she recognized them all in so far as she could see herself but the open landscape of her soul became clear to her at that moment she saw a complexity of her being gleam with its many facets she had taken to writing out of impulse and intuition but was her writing any good a doubt rose in her mind a copy of the code laid on her table a survival of the days of her divorce but had she understood the law correctly her articles were accepted but was the judgment of the editress to be trusted as her eyes wandered once again over those women's portraits and biographies she became afraid that her work would not be good would be too superficial and that her ideas were not directed by study and knowledge but she could also imagine her own photograph appearing in that prospectus with her name under it and a brief comment writer of the social position of divorced women with the name of the paper the date and so on and she smiled how highly convincing it sounded but how difficult was it to study to work and understand and act and move in the modern movement of life she was now in rome she would have liked to be in london but it did not suit her at the moment to make the journey she had felt rich when she bought duco's memmi thinking of the payment for her article and now she felt poor she would much have liked to go to london but then she would have missed duco and the congress lasted only a week she was pretty well at home here now was beginning to love rome her rooms the colosseum lying yonder like the dark oval like a somber wing at the end of the city with the hazy blue mountains behind it then the prince came into her mind and for the first time she thought of yesterday saw that evening again an evening of jesting and champagne duco silent and sulky urania depressed and the prince small lively slender roused from his slackness as an aristocratic man about town and with his narrow carbuncle eyes she thought him really pleasant once in a way she liked that atmosphere of coquetry and flirtation and the prince had understood her she had saved urania she was sure of that and she felt the content of her good action she was too lazy to dress and go to the restaurant she was not very hungry and would stay at home and sup on what was in her cupboard a couple of eggs bread some fruit 
but she remembered Duco and that he would certainly be waiting for her at their little table, and she wrote him a note and sent it by the hall porter's boy. Duco was just coming down on his way out to the restaurant when he met the little fellow on the stairs. He read the note and felt as if he were suffering a grievous disappointment. He felt small and unhappy, like a child, and he went back to his studio, lit a single lamp, threw himself on the broad couch, and lay staring in the dusk at the Mimi's angel, who, still standing on the chair, glimmered vaguely gold in the middle of the room, sweet as comfort, with his gesture of enunciation, as though he sought to announce all the mystery that was about to be fulfilled. End of chapter 21chapter twenty two of the inevitable this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading done by jules harlech the inevitable by louis caparus translated by alexander texiera de matos the inevitable Chapter 22 A few days later, Cornelia was expecting a visit from the prince, who had asked her for an appointment. She was sitting at her writing table, correcting proofs of her article. A lamp on the writing table cast a soft glow over her through a yellow silk shade, and she wore her tea gown of white crepe de chine, with a bunch of violets at her breast. Another lamp on a pedestal cast a second gleam from a corner, and the room flickered in cosy intimacy with the third light from the log fire, falling over watercolors by Duco, sketches and photographs, white anenomes in vases, violets everywhere, and one tall palm. The writing table was littered with books and printed sheets, bearing witness to her work. There was a knock at the door, and, at her come in, the prince entered. She remained seated for a moment, laid down her pen, and rose. She went up to him with a smile and held out her hand. He kissed it. He was very smartly dressed in a frock coat with a silk hat and pale gray gloves. He wore a pearl pin in his tie. They sat down by the fire, and he paid her compliments in quick succession on her sitting-room, her dress, and her eyes. She made a jesting reply, and he asked if he was disturbing her. Perhaps you were writing an interesting letter to someone near your heart. No, I was revising some proofs. Proofs? Yes. Do you write? I have just begun to. A story? No, an article. An article? What about? She gave him the long title. He looked at her open-mouthed. She laughed gaily. You would never have believed it, would you? Santa Maria, he murmured in surprise, unaccustomed in his own world to modern women taking part in a feminist movement. Dutch? Yes, Dutch. Write in French next time. Then I can read it. She laughed and gave him her promise, poured him out a cup of tea, handed the chocolates. He nibbled at them. Are you serious? Have you always been? You were not serious the other day. Sometimes I'm very serious. So am I. I gathered that. If I had not come that time, you might have become very serious. He gave a fatuous laugh and looked at her knowingly. You are a wonderful woman, he said. Very interesting and very clever. What you want to happen happens. Sometimes sometimes what i want also sometimes i also am very clever when i want a thing but i generally don't want it you did the other day he laughed yes you were cleverer than i then tomorrow perhaps i shall be cleverer than you who knows they both laughed he nibbled the chocolates in the dish one after the other and asked if he might have a glass 
of port instead of tea. She poured him out a glass. May I give you something? What? A souvenir of our first acquaintance. It is very charming of you. What is it to be? He took something wrapped in tissue paper from his pocket and handed it to her. She opened the little parcel and saw a strip of old Venetian lace worked in the shape of a flounce for a low bodice. Do accept it, he besought her. It's a lovely piece. It is such a pleasure to me to give it to you. She looked at him with all her coquetry in her eyes as though she were trying to see through him. You must wear it like this. He stood up, took the lace and draped it over her white tea gown from shoulder to shoulder. His fingers fumbled with the folds, his lips just touched her hair. She thanked him for his gift. He sat down again. I am glad that you will accept it. Have you given Miss Hope something too? He laughed with his little laugh of conquest. Patterns are all she wants, patterns of the queen's ball dresses. I wouldn't dare to give you patterns. To you I give old lace. But you nearly ruined your career for the sake of that pattern. Oh, well, he laughed. Which career? Oh, don't, he said evasively. Tell me, what do you advise me to do? What do you mean? Shall I marry her? I am against all marriage between cultivated people. She wanted to repeat some of her phrases, but thought to herself, why? He would not understand him. He looked at her profoundly with his carbuncle eyes. So you are in favor of free love? Sometimes, not always, between cultivated people. He was certain now had any doubt still lingered in his mind that a liaison existed between her and van der Stahl. And do you think me cultivated? She laughed provocatively with a touch of scorn in her voice. Listen, shall I speak to you seriously? I wish you would. I consider neither you nor Miss Hope suited for free love, so I am not cultivated. I don't mean it in the sense of being civilized. I mean modern culture. So I am not modern. No, she said, slightly irritated. Teach me to be modern. She gave a nervous laugh. Oh, don't let us talk like this. You want to know my advice? I advise you not to marry Urania. Why not? Because you would both of you have a wretched life. She is a dear little American parvenu. I am offering her what I possess. She is offering me what she possesses. He nimbled at the chocolates. She shrugged her shoulders. Then marry her, she said with indifference. Tell me that you don't want me to, and I won't. And your father? And the Marchesa? What do you know about them? Oh, everything and nothing. You are a demon, he exclaimed an angel and a demon. Tell me, what do you know about my father and the Marchesa? For how much are you selling yourself to Urania? For not less than ten millions. He looked at her in bewilderment. But the Marchesa thinks five enough, and a very handsome sum it is. Five millions. Which is it, dollar or lira? He clapped his hands together. You are a devil, he cried. You are an angel and a devil. How do you know? How do you know? Do you know everything? She flung herself back in her chair and laughed. Everything. But how? She looked at him and shook her head tantalizingly. Tell me. No, it's my secret. And you think that I ought not to sell myself. I dare not advise you as regards to your own interests. And as regards Urania? I advise her not to do it. Have you done so already? Once in a way. So you are my enemy, he exclaimed angrily. No, she said gently, wishing to conciliate him. I am a friend. A friend to what length? To the length to which I wish to go. Not the length to which I wish. Oh, no, never. But perhaps we both wish to go the same length. He stood up with his blood on fire. She remained seated calmly. 
almost languidly, with her head thrown back. She did not reply. He fell on his knees, seized her hand, and was kissing it before she could prevent him. Oh, angel, angel, oh, demon, he muttered between his kisses. She now withdrew her hand, pushed him away from her gently, and said, How quick an Italian is with his kisses! She laughed at him. He rose from his knees. Teach me what Dutch women are like, though they are slower than we. She pointed to his chair with an imperious gesture. Sit down, she said. I am not a typical Dutch woman. If I were, I should not have come to Rome. I pride myself on being a cosmopolitan. But we were not discussing that. We were speaking of Urania. Are you thinking seriously of marrying her? What can I do? If you thwart me, why not be on my side, like a dear friend? She hesitated. Neither of these two, Urania or he, was ripe for her ideas. She despised them both. Very well, let them get married, he in order to be rich, she to become a princess and duchess. Listen to me, she said, bending towards him. You want to marry her for the sake of her millions, but your marriage will be unhappy from the beginning. She is a frivolous little thing. She will want to cut a dash. And you belong to the blacks. We can live at Nice, then she can do as she pleases. We will come to Rome now and again, go to San Stefano now and again, and as for unhappiness, he continued, pulling a tragic face, what do I care? I am not happy as it is. I shall try to make Urania happy, but my heart will be elsewhere. Where? With the feminist movement. She laughed. Well, shall I be nice to you? Yes. And promise to help you? What did she care when all was said? Oh, angel, demon, he cried. He nibbled at the chocolate. And what does Mr. Vanderstall think of it? He asked mischievously. She raised her eyebrows. He doesn't think about it. He thinks only of his art. And of you. She looked at him and bowed her head in queenly assent. And of me. You often dine with him, yes. Come and dine with me one day. I shall be delighted. Tomorrow evening? And where? Wherever you like. In the Grand Hotel? Ask Urania to come too. Why not you and I alone? I think it better that you should invite your future wife. I will chaperone her. You are right. You are quite right. And we will ask Mr. Vandersall also to give me the pleasure of his company. I will. Until tomorrow, then, at half past eight. Until half past eight tomorrow. He rose to take his leave. Propriety demands that I should go, he said. Really, I should prefer to stay. Well, then, stay. Or stay another time, if you have to go now. You are so cold. And you don't think enough of Urania? I think of the feminist movement. He sat down. I'm afraid you must go, she said, laughing with her eyes. I have to dress to go and dine with Mr. Vanderstall. He kissed her hand. You are an angel and a demon. You know everything. You can do anything. You are the most interesting woman I ever met. Because I correct proofs? Because you are what you are. And, very seriously, still holding her hand, he said, almost threateningly, I shall never be able to forget you. And he went away. As soon as she was alone, she opened all her windows. She realized, it was true, that she was something of a coquette, but that lay in her nature. She was like that of herself, to some men, certainly not all, never to Duco, never to men whom she respected, whereas she despised that little prince with his blazing eyes and his habit of kissing people. But he served to amuse her. 
and she dressed and went out and reached the restaurant long after the appointed hour found duco waiting for her at their little table with his head in his hands and at once told him that the prince had detained her end of chapter twenty two Chapter Twenty Three of the Inevitable. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading done by Jules Harlech. The Inevitable by Louis Capurus. Translated by Alexander Texiera de Matos the inevitable chapter twenty three duco had at first wished to decline the invitation but cornelie said that she would think it pleasanter if he came and it was an exquisite dinner in the restaurant of the grand hotel and cornelie had enjoyed herself exceedingly and looked most charming in an old yellow ball dress dating back to the first days of her marriage which she had altered quickly here and there and draped with the prince's old lace urania had looked very handsome with her clear fresh complexion her shining eyes and gleaming teeth clad in a close-fitting frock in the latest fashion blue-black spangles on blue tulle as though she were moulded in a cuirass the prince said a siren with a mermaid's tail and the people at the other tables had stared across at theirs for everybody knew virgilio di forte Baracio. everybody knew that he was going to marry a rich american heiress and everybody had noticed that he was paying great attention to the slender fair-haired woman who nobody knew she had been married they thought she was chaperoning the future princess and she was very intimate with that young man a dutch painter who was studying art in italy they had soon found out all there was to know cornelia had thought it pleasant that they all looked at her and she had flirted so obviously with the prince that urania had become angry and early next morning when cornelis was still in bed no longer thinking of last night but pondering over a sentence in her pamphlet the maid knocked brought in her breakfast and letters and said that miss hope was asking to speak to her cornelie had urania shown in while she remained in bed and drank her chocolate and she looked up in surprise when urania at once overwhelmed her with reproaches burst into sobs scolded and raved made a violent scene said that she now saw through her and admitted that the marchesa had urged her to be careful of cornelie whom she described as a dangerous woman cornelie waited until she had had her say and replied coolly that she had nothing on her conscience that on the contrary she had saved urania and been of service to her as a chaperone though she did not tell her that the prince had wanted her cornelie to dine with him alone but urania refused to listen and went on ranting cornelie looked at her and thought her vulgar in that rage of hers talking her american english as though she were chewing filberts and at last she answered calmly my dear girl you're upsetting yourself about nothing but if you like i will write to the prince that he must pay me no more attentions no no don't do that it'll make gilio think i'm jealous and aren't you why do you monopolize gilio why do you flirt with him why do you make yourself conspicuous with him as you did yesterday in a restaurant full of people well if you dislike it i won't flirt with gilio again or make myself conspicuous with him again i don't care two pence about your prince that's an extra reason very well dear that's settled 
Her coolness calmed Urania, who asked, And do we remain good friends? Why, of course, my dear girl. Is there any occasion for us to quarrel? I don't see it. Both of them, the prince and Urania, were quite indifferent to her. True, she had preached to Urania in the beginning, but about a general idea. When afterwards she perceived Urania's insignificance, she withdrew the interest which she took in her, and, if the girl was offended by a little gaiety and innocent flirtation, very well, there should be no more of it. Her thoughts were more with the proofs which the post had brought her. She got out of bed and stretched herself. Go into the sitting room, Urania dear, and just let me have my bath. Presently, all fresh and smiling, she joined Urania in the sitting room. Urania was crying. My dear child, why are you upsetting yourself like this? You've achieved your ideal. Your marriage is as good as certain. You're waiting for an answer from Chicago. You're impatient. Then cable out. I should have cabled at once in your place. You don't imagine, do you, that your father has any objection to your becoming Duchess di San Stefano? I don't know yet what I myself want, said Urania, weeping. I don't know. I don't know. Cornelie shrugged her shoulders. You're more sensible than I thought, she said. Are you really my friend? Can I trust you? Can I trust your advice? I won't advise you again. I have advised you. You must know your own mind. Urania took her hand. Which would you prefer, that I accept Gilio or not? Cornelie looked her straight in the eyes. You're making yourself unhappy about nothing. You think, and the Marchesa probably thinks with you, that I want to take Gilio from you. No, darling, I wouldn't marry Gilio if he were king and emperor. I have a bit of the socialist in me. I don't marry for the sake of a title. No more would I. Of course, darling, no more would you. I never dreamt of suggesting that you would, but you asked me which I should prefer. Well, I'll tell you in all sincerity. I don't prefer either. The whole business leaves me cold. And you call yourself my friend? So I am, dear, and I will remain your friend. Only don't come overwhelming me with reproaches on an empty stomach. You're a flirt. Sometimes it comes natural to me. But... Honestly, I won't be so again with Gilio. Do you mean it? Yes, of course. What do I care? He amuses me. But if it offends you, I'll gladly sacrifice my amusement for your sake. I don't value it so much. Are you fond of Mr. Vanderstall? Very. Are you going to marry him, Cornelie? No, dear, I shan't marry again. I know what marriage means. Are you coming for a little walk with me? It's a fine day, and you have upset me so with your little troubles that I can't do any work this morning. It's lovely weather. Come along and buy some flowers in the Piazza di Spagna. They went and bought the flowers. Cornelie took Urania back to Belloni's. As she walked away on the road to the Osteria for lunch, she heard somebody following her. It was the prince. I caught sight of you from the corner of the Via Aurora, he said. Urania was just going home. Prince, she said at once, there must be no more of it. Of what? No more visits, no more joking, no more presents, no more dinners at the Grand Hotel, no more champagne. Why not? The future princess won't have it. Is she jealous? Cornelie described the scene to him. And you mayn't even walk with me? Yes, I may. No, no. I shall, for all that. By the right of man, of the strongest. Exactly. My vocation is to fight against it, but today I am untrue to my vocation. You are charming, as always. You mustn't say that any more. Urania is a bore. Tell me, 
What do you advise me to do? Shall I marry her? Cornelie gave a peal of laughter. You both of you keep asking my advice. Yes, yes, what do you think? Marry her by all means. He did not observe her contempt. Exchange your escutcheon for her purse, she continued, and laughed and laughed. He now perceived it. You despise me, perhaps both of us. Oh, no, tell me that you don't despise me. You ask my opinion? Urania is a very sweet, dear child, but she ought not to travel by herself. And you? And I? You are a delightful boy. Buy me those violets, will you? Sobito, Sobito. He bought her a bunch of violets. You're crazy over violets, aren't you? Yes, they must be your second and your last present. And here we say good-bye. No, I shall take you home. I'm not going home. Where are you going? To the Osteria. Mr. Vanderstall is waiting for me. He's a lucky man. Why? He needs must be. I don't see why. Good-bye, Prince. Ask me to come, too, he entreated. Let me lunch with you. No, she said seriously. Really not. It's better not. I believe. What? That Duco is just like Urania? Jealous? When shall I see you again? Really, believe me, it's better not. Good-bye, Prince, and thank you for the violets. He bent over her hand. She went into the Osteria and saw that Duco had witnessed their leave-taking through the window. End of chapter 23「Chapter Twenty Four of the Inevitable This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading done by Jules Harlock. The Inevitable by Louis Capurus. Translated by Alexander Texiera de Matos. The Inevitable, Chapter 24 Duco was silent and nervous at table. He played with his bread, and his fingers trembled. She felt that he had something on his mind. What is it? she asked kindly. Cornelie, he said excitedly. I want to speak to you. What about? You're not behaving properly. In what respect? With the prince. You've seen through him, and yet, yet you go on putting up with him. Yet you're always meeting him. Let me finish, he said, looking around him. There was no one in the restaurant save two Italians, sitting at the far table, and they could speak without being overheard. Let me finish, he repeated, when she tried to interrupt him. Let me say what I have to say. You, of course, are free to act as you please, but I am your friend, and I want to advise you. What you are doing is not right. The prince is a cad, a low, common cad. How can you accept presents from him and invitations? Why did you compel me to come yesterday? The dinner was one long torture to me. You know how fond I am of you. Why shouldn't I confess it? You know how high I hold you. I can't bear to see you lowering yourself with him. Let me speak. Lowering, I say. He is not worthy to tie your shoestrings. And you play with him. You jest with him. You flirt. Let me speak. You flirt with him. What can he be to you? A coxcomb like that. What part can he play in your life? Let him marry Miss Hope. What do you care about either of them? What do inferior people matter to you, Cornelie? I despise them and so do you. I know you do. Then why do you cross their lives? Let them live in the vanity of their titles and money. What is it all to you? I don't understand you. 
Oh, I know you're not to be understood. All the woman part of you. And I love everything that I see of you. I love you in everything. It doesn't matter whether I understand you, but I do feel that this isn't right. I ask you not to see the prince any more. Have nothing more to do with him. Cut him. That dinner last night was a torture to me. My poor boy, she said gently, filling his glass from their fiasco. But why? 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 Because you're lowering yourself. I do not stand so high. No, let me speak now. I do not stand high because I have a few modern ideas and a few others which are broader minded than those of most women. Apart from that, I'm an ordinary woman. When a man is cheerful and witty, it amuses me. No, Duco, I'm speaking now. I don't consider the prince a cad. I may think him a coxcomb, but I think him cheerful and witty. You know that I, too, am very fond of you, but you are neither cheerful nor witty. Now, don't get angry. You are much more than that. I'm not even comparing Il Nostro Giglio with you. I won't say anything more about you, or you will become conceited, but cheerful and witty you are not, and my poor nature sometimes feels a need for these qualities. What have I in my life? Nothing but you, you alone. I am very glad to possess your friendship, very happy in having met you. But why may I not sometimes be cheerful? Really, there is a little light-heartedness in me, a little frivolity even. Am I bound to fight against it? Duco, am I wicked? He smiled sadly. There was a moist light in his eyes, and he did not answer. I can fight, if necessary, she resumed. But is this a thing to fight against? Is it a passing bubble, nothing more? I forget it the next minute. I forget the prince the next minute. And you, I do not forget. He was looking at her radiantly. Do you understand that? Do you understand that I don't flirt and fence with you? Shake hands and stop being angry. She gave him her hand across the table, and he pressed her fingers. Cornelie, he said, softly. Yes, I feel that you are loyal. Cornelie, will you be my wife? She looked straight in front of her and drooped her head a little and stared before her earnestly. They were no longer eating. The two Italians stood up, bowed, and went away. They were alone. The waiter set some fruit before them and withdrew. They both sat silent for a moment. Then she spoke in a gentle voice, and her whole being displayed so tender a melancholy that he could have burst into sobs and worshipped her where she sat. I knew, of course, that you would ask me that some day. It was in the nature of things. A great friendship like ours was bound to lead to that question. But it can't be, dearest Duco. It can't be, my dear, dear boy. I have my own ideas. But it's not that. I am against marriage. But it's not that. In some cases a woman is unfaithful to all her ideas in a single second. Then what is it? She stared wide-eyed and passed her hand over her forehead, as though she did not see clearly. Then she continued, It is this, that I am afraid of marriage. I have been through it. I know what it means. I see my husband before me now. I see that habit, that groove before me, in which the subtler individual characteristics are effaced. That is what marriage is, a habit, a groove, and I tell you candidly, I think marriage loathsome. I think passion beautiful, but marriage is not passion. Passion can be noble and superhuman, but marriage is a human institution based upon petty human morality and calculation. And I have become frightened of those prudent moral ties. I promised myself and I believe that I shall keep my promise never to marry again. 
my whole nature has become unfitted for it i am no longer the hague girl going to parties and dinners and looking out for a husband together with her parents my love for him was passion and in my marriage he wanted to restrict that passion to a groove and a custom then i rebelled i'd rather not talk about it passion lasts too short a time to fill a married life mutual esteem to follow etc one needn't marry for that i can feel esteem just as well without being married of course there is the question of the children there are many difficulties i can't think it all out now i merely feel now very seriously and calmly that i am not fit to marry and that i never will marry again i should not make you happy don't be sad duco i am fond of you i love you and perhaps had i met you at the right moment had i met you before in my hague life you would certainly have stood too high for me i could not have grown fond of you now i can understand you respect you and look up to you i tell you this quite simply that i love you and look up to you look up to you in spite of all your gentleness as i have never looked up to my husband however much he has made his manly privilege prevail and you are to believe that very firmly and with great certainty and you must believe that i am true i am coquettish only with giulio he looked at her through his silent tears he stood up called the waiter paid the bill absent-mindedly while everything swam and flashed before his eyes they went out of the door and she hailed a carriage and told the man to drive to the villa doria pamphilii she remembered that the gardens were open they drove there in silence steeped in their thoughts of the future that was opening tremulously before them sometimes he heaved a deep breath and quivered over his body once she fervently squeezed his hand at the gate of the villa they alighted and walked up to the majestic avenues rome lay in the depths below and they suddenly saw st peter's but they did not speak and she suddenly sat down on an ancient bench and began to weep softly and feebly he put his arm round her and comforted her she dried her tears smiled and embraced him and returned his kiss twilight fell and they went back he gave the address of his studio she accompanied him and she gave herself to him in all her truthful sincerity and with a love so violent and so great that she thought she would swoon in his arms end of chapter 24「chapter twenty five they did not alter their mode of life duco however after a scene with his mother no longer slept at bologna's but in a little room adjoining his studio and at first filled with trunks and lumber cornelie was sorry about the scene she had always had a liking for mrs van der stahl and the girls but a certain pride arose in her and cornelie despised mrs van der stahl because she was unable to understand either her or duco still she would have been pleased to prevent this coolness at her advice duco went to see his mother again but she remained cool and sent him away thereupon cornelie and duco went to naples they did not do this by way of an elopement they did it quite simply 
Cornélie told Urania and the prince that she was going to Naples for a little while and that Mr. van der Stahl would probably follow her. She did not know Naples and would appreciate it greatly if van der Stahl showed her over the town and the surrounding country. Cornélie kept on her rooms in Rome, and they spent a fortnight of sheer careless and immense happiness. Their love grew spacious and blossoming in the golden sunlight of Naples, on the blue gulfs of Amalfi, Sorrento, Capri, and Castellamare, simply, irresistibly, and restfully. They glided gradually along the purple thread of their lives. They walked hand in hand down their lines now fused into one path, heedless of the laws and ideas of men. And their attitude was so lofty, their actions so serene, and so certain of their happiness, that their relations did not degenerate into insolence, although within themselves they despised the world. But this happiness softened all that pride in their soaring souls, as if their happiness were strewing blossoms all around it. They lived in a dream, first among the marbles in the museum, then on the flower-strewn cliffs of Amalfi, on the beach of Capri, or on the terrace of the hotel at Sorrento, with the sea roaring at their feet and, in a pearly haze, yonder, vaguely white, as though drawn in white chalk, Castellamare and Naples and the ghost of Vesuvius, with its hazy plume of smoke. They held aloof from everybody, from all the people and excursionists. They had their meals at a small table, and it was generally thought that they were newly married. If others looked up their names in the visitor's book, they read two names and made whispered comments. But the lovers did not hear, did not see. They lived their dream, looking into each other's eyes or at the opal sky the pearly sea and the hazy white mountain vistas studded with towns like little specks of chalk when their money was almost exhausted they smiled and went back to rome and resumed their former lives she in her rooms and he now in his studio and they took their meals together but they pursued their dream among the ruins of the via appia around and near frascati beyond the ponte mole on the slopes of monte mario and in the gardens of the villas among the statues and paintings mingling their happiness with the roman atmosphere he interweaving his new-found love with his love for rome she growing to love rome because of him and because of that charm they were surrounded by a sort of aura through which they did not see ordinary life or meet ordinary people. At last, one afternoon, Urania found them both at home, in Cornelie's room. The fire lighted, she smiling and gazing into the fire, he sitting at her feet and she with her arm around his neck, and they were evidently thinking of so little besides their own love that neither of them heard her knock and both suddenly saw her standing before them, like an unexpected reality. Their dream was over for that day. Urania laughed, Cornelia laughed, and Duco pushed an easy chair closer. And Urania, blithe, beautiful, and brilliant, told him that she was engaged. Where on earth had they been hiding, she asked, inquisitively. She was engaged. She had been to San Stefano, she had seen the old prince, and everything was lovely and good and dear. The old castle, a dear old house, the old man, a dear old man. She saw everything through the glitter of her future prince's title, princess and duchess. The wedding day was fixed, immediately after Easter, in a little more than three months therefore. It was to be celebrated at San Carlo with all the splendor of a great wedding. Her father was coming over for it with her youngest brother. 
She was obviously not looking forward to their arrival. And she never finished talking. She gave a thousand details about her bridal outfit, with which the Marchesa was helping her. They were going to live at Nice, in a large flat. She raved about Nice. That was the first-rate idea of Gilio's. And incidentally, she remembered and told them that she had become a Catholic. That was a great nuisance. But the Monsignori saw to everything, and she allowed herself to be guided by them. And the Pope was to receive her in private audience, together with Gilio. The difficulty was what to wear at the audience. Black, of course, but velvet satin. What did Cornelia advise her? She had such excellent taste. And a black laced veil on her head with brilliants. She was going to Nice next day with the Marchesa Angelio to see their flat. When she was gone, after begging Cornelie to come and admire her trousseau, Cornelie said with a smile, She is happy. After all, happiness is something different for everybody. A trousseau and a title would not make me happy. These are small people, he said, who cross our lives now and again. I prefer to get out of their way. And they did not say so, but they both thought with their fingers interlaced, her eyes gazing into his, that they were also happy, but with a loftier, better and nobler happiness, and pride arose within them, and they beheld as in a vision the line of their life winding up a steep hill. But happiness snowed blossoms down upon it, and amid the snowing blossoms, holding high their proud heads, with smiles and eyes of love, they walked on in their dream remote from mankind and reality. End of chapter 25、「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain.」For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading done by Jules Harlock. The Inevitable by Louis Capurus. Translated by Alexander Texiera de Matos. The Inevitable. Chapter 26. The months dreamed past. and their happiness caused such a summer to bloom in them that she ripened in beauty and he in talent the pride in them broke into expression in her it was the blossoming of her being in him it was energy her languid charm became transformed into a proud slenderness her contour increased in fullness a light illumined her eyes a gladness shone about her mouth Her hands quivered with nervous emotion when he took up his brushes, and the skies of Italy arched firmaments between his eyes like a canopy of love and fervid color. He drew and completed a series of water colors, hazes of dreamy atmosphere which suggested Turner's noblest creations, natural monuments of sheer haze. All the milky blue and pearly mistiness of the Bay of Naples, like a goblet filled with light in which turquoise is melted into water. And he sent them to Holland, to London, found that he had suddenly discovered his vocation, his work and his fame, courage, strength, aim, and conquest. She too achieved a certain success with her article. It was discussed. Contested. Her name was mentioned, but she felt a certain indifference when she read her name in connection with the feminist movement. She preferred to live with him his life of observation and emotion, and she often imparted to all the haze of his vision, to the excessive haziness of his colored dream, a lustre of light, a definite horizon. 
a streak of actuality which gave realism to the mist of his ideal she learnt with him to distinguish and to feel nature art all rome and when a symbolic impulse overmastered him she surrendered herself to it entirely he planned a large sketch of a procession of women mounting along a line of life that wound up a hill they seemed to be moving out of a crumbling city of antiquity whose pillars joined by a single architrave quivered on high in a violent haze of evening dusk they seemed to be releasing themselves from the shadow of the ruins fading away on the horizon into the void of night and they thronged upwards calling to one another aloud beckoning to one another with great waving gestures of their hands under a mighty fluttering of streamers and pennants they grasped hammer and pickaxe with sinewy arms and the throng of them moved up and up along the line where the light grew whiter and whiter until in the hazy air there dimly showed the distant vista of a new city whose iron buildings like central stations and eiffel towers in the white glimmer of the distance gleamed up very faintly with a reflection of glass arches and glass roofs and high in the air the musical staves of the threads of sound and, and accompaniment and to so great an extent did their influences work upon each other's souls that she learned to see and he learned to think she saw beauty art nature haze and emotion and no longer imagined them but felt them he as in his sketch a very vague modern city of glass and iron saw a modern city rising out of his dream haze and thought of a modern question in accordance with his own nature and aptitudes she learned above all to see and feel like a woman in love with the eyes and heart of a man she loves he thought out the question plastically but whatever the imperfection in the absoluteness of their new spheres of feeling and thought the reciprocal influence through their love gave them a happiness so great so united that at that moment they could not contemplate it or apprehend it it was almost ecstasy a faint unreality in which they dreamed whereas it was all pure truth and tangible actuality their manner of thinking feeling and living was an ideal of reality an ideal entered and attained along the gradual lines of their life along the golden thread of their love and they scarcely apprehended or contemplated it because the everyday life still clung to them but only to the smallest inevitable extent they lived apart but in the morning she went to him and found him working at his sketch and she sat down beside him and leant her head on his shoulder and they thought it out together he sketched each figure in his procession of women separately and sought for the features and the modeling of the figures some had the mongolian aspect of mimi's angel of the annunciations others cornelie's slenderness and her later fuller wholesomeness he sought for the folds of the costumes the women escaped from the violent dusk of the ruined city in pleated peplum and farther on their garments altered as in a masquerade of the ages the long trains of the medieval ladies the veils of the sultanas the homespun of the workwomen the caps of nursing sisters the attire becoming more modern as the wearer personified a more modern age and in this grouping the draftsmanship was so unsubstantial and sober the transition from drooping folds to practical stiffness so careful and so gradual that cornelie hardly perceived the transition that she appeared to be contemplating one style 
one fashion in dress, whereas each figure nevertheless was clad in a different stuff, of different cut, falling into different lines. The drawing displayed an old mastery purity, a simplicity of outline, which was nevertheless modern, nervous, and morbid, but without the conventional ideal of symbolical human forms. The grouping showed a Raphaelite harmony, the watercolor tints of the first studies, the haze of Italy. The ruined city loomed in the dusk as he saw the forum looming. The city of iron and glass gleamed up with its architecture of light, such as he had seen from Sorrento shining around Naples. She felt that he was creating a great work and had never taken so lively an interest in anything as she now did in his ideas and his sketches. She sat behind him silent and still and followed his drawing of the waving banners and fluttering pennants. And she did not breathe when she saw him, with a few dabs of white and touches of light, as though light were one of the colors on his palette make the glass city emerge as from a dream on the horizon. Then he would ask her something about one of the figures and put his arm around her and draw her to him, and they would long sit scrutinizing and thinking out lines and ideas until evening fell and the evening chill shuddered through the studio and they rose slowly from their seats. Then they went out, and in the Corso they returned to real life, silently sitting at Aragno's. They watched the bustle outside, and in their little restaurant, with their eyes absorbing each other's glance, they ate their simple dinner and looked so obviously and harmoniously happy that the Italians, the two who always sat at the far table, at that same hour, smiled as they bowed to them on entering. End of chapter 26「Chapter 27 of The Inevitable – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading done by Jules Harlock. The Inevitable by Louis Capurus. Translated by Alexander Texiera de Matos. The Inevitable, Chapter 27. At the same time, Duco developed great powers of work. So much thought dimly took shape before him that he was constantly discovering another motive and symbolizing it in another figure. He sketched a life-size woman walking with that admixture of a child, woman and goddess which characterized his figures, and she walked slowly down a descending line towards a somber depth without seeing or understanding her eyes towards the abyss in magnetic attraction. Vague hands hovered around her like a cloud and softly pushed and guided her. On the hilltop, on high rocks, in the bright light, other figures holding harps called to her, but she went towards the depth, pushed by hands. In the abyss blossomed strange purple orchids like mouths of love. When Cornelie came to his studio one morning, he had suddenly sketched this idea. It came upon her as a surprise, for he had not mentioned it to her. The idea had sprung up suddenly. The quick, spontaneous execution had not taken him an hour. He was almost apologizing to her when he saw her surprise. She certainly admired it, but shuddered at it and preferred the banners, the great watercolor, the procession of the women marching to the battle of life. And to please her, he put the straying woman aside and worked on solely at the striving women. But constantly a fresh thought came and disturbed him in his work, and in her absence he would sketch some new symbol 
until the sketches accumulated and lay spread on every side. She put them away in portfolios. She removed them from easel and board. She saved them from wandering too far from the banners. And this was the one thing that he completed. Thus smoothly did their life seem willing to run, along a gracious line, in one golden direction, while his symbols blossomed like flowers on either side, while the azure of their love seemed to form the sky overhead. But she plucked away the superfluous flowers, and only the banners waved above their path, in the firmament of their ecstasy, even as they waved above the militant women. They had but one distraction, the wedding of the prince and Urania, a dinner, a ball, and the ceremony at St. Carlo, attended by all the Roman aristocracy, who, however, welcomed the wealthy American bride with a certain reserve. But when the prince and princess di Forte Braccio left for Nice, all distraction was at an end and the days once more glided along the same gracious golden line, and Cornelie retained only one unpleasant recollection, her meeting during those festive days with Mrs. van der Stahl, who cut her persistently, turned her back on her, and succeeded in conveying to her that the friendship was over. She had accepted the position, she had realized how difficult it was, even if Mrs. van der Stahl had been willing to speak to her, to explain to a woman like this, rooted in her social and worldly conventions, her own proud ideas of freedom, independence, and happiness. And she had avoided the girls also, understanding that Mrs. van der Stahl wished it. She was not angry at all this, nor hurt. She could understand it in Duco's mother, she was only a little sad about it, because she liked Mrs. van der Stahl and liked the two girls. But she quite understood. It had to be so. Mrs. van der Stahl knew or suspected everything. Duco's mother could not act differently, though the prince and Urania, for friendship's sake, overlooked any liaison between Duco and Cornelie though the Roman world during the wedding festivities accepted them simply as friends, as acquaintances, as fellow countrymen, whatever they might whisper, smiling behind their fans. But now those festivities were over. Now they had passed that point of contact with the world and people. Now their golden line once more sloped gently and evenly before them. Then Cornelie, not thinking of the Hague at all, received a letter from the Hague. The letter was from her father, and consisted of several sheets, which surprised her, for he never wrote. What she read startled her greatly, but did not at first dishearten her altogether. Perhaps because she did not realize the full import of her father's news. He implored her forgiveness, he had long been in financial difficulties. He had lost a great deal of money. They would have to move into a smaller house. The atmosphere at home was unpleasant. Mamma cried all day. The sisters quarreled. The family proffered advice. The acquaintances were disagreeable. And he implored her forgiveness. He had speculated and lost. And he had also lost her own little capital which he managed for her, her grandmother's legacy. He asked her not to think too hardly of him. Things might have turned out differently, and then she would have been three times as well off. He admitted it, he had done wrong, but still he was her father, and he asked her, his child, to forgive him and requested her to come home. She was at first greatly startled, but soon recovered her calmness. She was in too happy a mood of vital harmony to be depressed by the news. She received the letter in bed, did not get up at once, reflected a little, then dressed, breakfasted as usual, and went to Duco. He received her with enthusiasm and showed her three new sketches. 
she reproached him gently for allowing himself to be distracted from his main idea said that these distractions would exhaust his activity his perseverance she urged him to keep on working at the banners and she inspected the great water colour intently with the ancient crumbling forum like city and the procession of the women towards the metropolis of the future standing high in the dawn and suddenly it was borne in upon her that her future also had fallen into ruins and that its crumbling arches hung menacingly over her head then she gave him her father's letter to read he read it twice looked at her aghast and asked what she proposed to do she said that she had already thought it over but so far decided only upon the most immediate thing to be done to give up her rooms and to come to him in his studio she had just enough left to pay the rent of her rooms but after that she had no money no money at all she had never consented to accept alimony from her husband all that was still due to her was the payment for her article he at once put out his hands to her kissed her and said that this had been also his idea at once that she should come to him and live with him he had enough a tiny patrimony he made a little money in addition there would be enough for the two of them and they laughed and kissed and glanced around the studio duco slept in a small adjoining den a sort of long walled cupboard and they glanced round to see what they could do cornelie knew here a curtain draped over a cord with her wash-hand stand behind it that was all she needed only that little corner otherwise duco would not have a good light they were very merry and thought it a jolly capital idea they went out at once bought a little iron bedstead and a dressing table and themselves hung up the curtain then they both went to pack the trunks in the via di serpenti and dined at the asteria cornelie suggested that they should dine at home now and then it was cheaper when they returned home she was enchanted that her installation took up so little room hardly six feet by six with that little bed behind the curtain they were very cheerful that evening the bohemianism of it all amused them they were in italy the land of sunshine of beauty of lazzaroni of beggars who slept on the steps of a cathedral and they felt akin to that sunny poverty they were happy they wanted for nothing they would live on nothing or at any rate on very little and they saw the future bright smiling they were together now they would live more closely linked together they loved each other and were happy in a land of beauty in an ideal of noble symbolism and life-embracing art next morning he worked zealously without a word absorbed in his dream in his work and she likewise silent contented happy examined her blouses and skirts attentively and reflected that she would need nothing more for quite another year and that her old clothes were amply sufficient for their life of happiness and simplicity and she answered her father's letter very briefly saying that she forgave him that she was sorry for all of them but that she was not coming back to the hague she would provide for her own maintenance by writing italy was cheap that was all she wrote she did not mention duco she cut herself off from her family in thought and in fact she had met with no sympathy from any of them during her unhappy marriage during the painful days of her divorce and now in her turn she felt no affection for them and her happiness made her partial and selfish she wanted nothing but duco nothing but their harmonious life in common he sat working laughing to her now and then as she lay on the couch and reflected she looked at the women marching to battle she too could not remain lying on the couch she too would have to sally forth and fight 
she foresaw that she would have to fight for him he was at present in the first fine frenzy of his art but if this slackened momentarily after a result of some kind after a success for himself and the world that would be commonplace and logical and then she would have to fight he was the noble element in their two lives his art could never become her breadwinner his little fortune amounted to hardly anything she would have liked to work and make money for both of them so that he need not depart from the pure principle of his art but how was she to strive how to work how to work for their lives and their bread what could she do right it brought in so little what else she was overcome by a slight melancholy because she could do so little she possessed minor talents and accomplishments she wrote a good style she sang she played the piano she could make a blouse and she knew something about cooking she would herself do the cooking now and then and would make her own clothes but that was all so small so little strive work in what way however she would do what she could and suddenly she took up a baedeker turned over the pages and sat down to write at duco's writing table she thought for a moment and began a casual article a travel picture for a newspaper about the environs of naples that was easier than at once beginning about rome and in the studio filled with a faint warmth of the fire because the room faced north and was chilly everything became still and silent save for the occasional scratching of her pen or the noise made by him when fumbling among his chalks and paint brushes she wrote a few pages but could not hit upon an ending then she got up he turned round and smiled at her with his smile of friendly happiness and she read to him what she had written it was not in the style of her pamphlet it contained no invective it was a pleasant traveller's sketch he thought it very nice but nothing out of the way but that wasn't necessary she said defending herself and he kissed her for her industry and her pluck it was raining that day and they did not go out for their lunch there were eggs and tomatoes and she made an omelette on an oil stove they drank water ate quantities of bread and while the rain outside lashed the great curtainless windows of the studio they enjoyed their repast sitting like two birds that huddled side by side against each other so as not to get wet End of chapter 27chapter 28 of the inevitable this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org reading done by jules harlock the inevitable by louis capurus translated by alexander texiera de matos the inevitable chapter twenty eight it was a couple of months after easter in the spring days of may the flood of tourists had ebbed away immediately after the great church festivities and rome was already very hot and growing very quiet one morning when cornelia was crossing the piazza di spagna where the sunshine streamed along the cream-coloured front of the Trinita di Monti and down the monumental staircase, where only a few beggars and the very last flower boy sat dreaming with blinking eyelids in a shady corner. She saw the prince coming towards her. He bowed to her with a smile of gladness and hastened up to speak to her. How glad I am to meet you. I am in Rome for a day or two on my way to San Stefano, to see my father on business. Business is always a bore, and this is more so than usual. Urania is at Nice, 
but it is too hot there and we are going away. We have just returned from a trip on the Mediterranean, four weeks on board a friend's yacht. It was delightful. Why did you never come to see us at Nice, as Urania asked you to? I really wasn't able to come. I went to call on you yesterday in the Via di Serpente. They told me you had moved. He looked at her with a touch of mocking laughter in his small, glittering eyes. She did not speak. After that I did not like to commit a further indiscretion, he said, meaningly. Where are you going? To the post office. May I come with you? Isn't it too hot for walking? Oh, no, I love the heat. Come by all means, if you like. How is Urania? Very well, capital. She's capital. She's splendid, simply splendid. I should never have thought it. I should never have dared to think it. She plays her part to perfection. So far as she is concerned, I don't regret my marriage, but for the rest, Jesus mio, what a disappointment, what a disillusion. Why? You knew, did you not? I even now don't know how. You knew how many millions I sold myself? Not five millions, but ten millions. Ah, Signora mia, what a take-in. You saw my father-in-law at the time of our wedding. What a Yankee, what a stocking merchant, and what a tradesman. We're no match for him. I, Papa, or the Marchesa. First promises, contracts, oh, rather, but then haggling here, haggling there. We're no good at that, neither Papa nor I. Aunt alone was able to haggle, but she was no match for the stocking merchant. She had not learnt that in all the years during which she kept a boarding house. Ten millions? Five millions? Not three millions. Oh, yes, perhaps we did get something like that, plus a heap of promises for our children's children when everybody's dead. Ah, senora, senora, I was better off before I was married. True, I had debts then and not now. But Urania is so economical, so practical. I should never have thought it of her. It has been a disappointment to everybody. Papa, my aunt, the Monsignori. You should have seen them together. They could have scratched one another's eyes out. Papa almost had a stroke. My aunt nearly came to blows with the Monsignori. Ah, Signora, Signora, I don't like it. I am a victim. Winter after winter they angle with me. But I didn't want to be the bait. I struggled. I wouldn't let the fish bite. And then this came of it. Not three millions, lire nor dollars. I was so stupid. I thought at first it would be dollars and Urania's economy. She allows me my pocket money. She controls everything, does everything. She knows exactly how much I lose at the club. Yes, you may laugh, but it's sad. Don't you see that I sometimes feel as if I could cry? And she has such queer notions. For instance, we have our flat at Nice, and we keep on my rooms in the Palazzo Raspoli as a pied de terre in Rome. That's enough. We don't come often to Rome because we are black and Urania thinks it's dull. In the summer, we were to go here or there to some watering place. That was all right. That was settled. But now Urania suddenly conceives the notion of selecting San Stefano as a summer residence. San Stefano, I ask you, I shall never be able to stand it. True, it's high up, it's cool, it's a pleasant climate, good fresh mountain air. But I need more in my life than mountain air. I can't live on mountain air. Oh, you wouldn't know Urania. She can be so awfully obstinate. It's settled now beyond recall. In the summer, San Stefano. And the worst of it is that she has won Papa's heart by it. I have to suffer. They're two to one against me. 
and the worst of it is that urania says we shall have to be very economical in order to do san stefano up a bit it's a famous historical place but fallen into grisly disrepair it's not our fault we never had any luck there was once a forte brasio pope after that our star declined and we never had another stroke of luck again san stefano is the type of ruined greatness you ought to see the place to economize to renovate san stefano that's urania's ideal she has taken it into her head to do that honor to our ancestral abode however she has won papa's heart by it and he has recovered from his stroke but can you understand now that il povero giglio is poorer than he was before he acquired shares in a chicago stocking factory there was no checking his flow of words he felt profoundly unhappy small beaten tame conquered destroyed and he had a need to ease his heart they had passed the post office and now retraced their steps he looked for sympathy from cornelie and found it in the smiling attention with which she listened to his grievances she replied that after all it showed that urania had a real feeling for san stefano oh yes he admitted humbly she is very good i should never have thought it she is every inch a princess and a duchess it's splendid but the ten millions gone an illusion but tell me how well you're looking each time i see you you've grown lovelier and lovelier do you know that you're a very lovely woman you must be very happy i'm certain you're an exceptional woman i always said so i don't understand you may i speak frankly are we good friends you and i i don't understand i think what you have done such a terrible thing i have never heard of anything like it in our world i don't live in your world prince very well but all the same your world must have much the same ideas about it and the calmness the pride the happiness with which you do just quietly as you please i think it perfectly awful i stand aghast at it and yet it's a pity people in my world are very easy going but that sort of thing is not allowed prince once more i have no world my world is my own sphere i don't understand that tell me how am i to tell urania for i should think it delightful if you would come and stay at san stefano oh do come do come to keep us company i entreat you be charitable do a good work but first tell me how shall i tell urania she laughed what what they told me in the via di serpenti that your address was now signor van der stahl's studio via del babbino laughing she looked at him almost pityingly it is too difficult for you to tell her she replied a little condescendingly i will myself write to urania and explain my conduct he was evidently relieved that's delightful capital and will you come to san stefano no i can't really why not i can no longer move in the circle in which you live after my change of address she said half laughing half seriously he shrugged his shoulders listen he said you know our roman society so long as certain conventions are observed everything's permitted exactly but it's just those conventions which i don't observe and that's where you are wrong believe me i am saying it as your friend i live according to my own laws and i don't want to move in your world he folded his hands in entreaty yes yes i know you are a new woman you have your own laws but i beseech you take pity on me be an angel of mercy and come to san stefano 
She seemed to hear a note of seduction in his voice and therefore said, Prince, even if it agreed with the conventions of your world, even then I shouldn't wish to, for I will not leave van der Stahl. You come first and let him come a little later. Urania will be glad to have his advice on some artistic questions concerning the doing up of San Stefano. We have a lot of pictures there, and old things generally. Do let's arrange that. I am going to San Stefano tomorrow. Urania will follow me in a week. I will suggest to her to ask you down soon. Really, Prince, it can't happen just yet. Why not? She looked at him for some time before answering. Shall I be candid with you? But of course. They had already passed the post office twice. The street was quite silent and deserted. He looked at her inquiringly. Well, then, she said, we are in great financial difficulties. We have no money at present. I have lost my little capital, and the small sum which I earn by writing an article is spent. Duco is working hard, but he is engaged on a big work and making nothing in the meantime. He expects to receive a bit of money in a month or so. But at the moment we have nothing, nothing at all. That is why I went to a shop by the Tiber this morning to ask how much a dealer would give for a couple of old pictures which Duco wants to sell. He doesn't like parting with them, but there's no help for it. So you see that I can't come. I should not care to leave him. Besides, I should not have the money for the journey or a decent wardrobe. He looked at her. The first thing he had noticed was her new and blooming loveliness. Now he noticed that her skirt was a little worn and her blouse none too fresh, though she wore a couple of roses in the waistband. Jesus mio, he exclaimed, and you tell me that so calmly, so quietly. She smiled and shrugged her shoulders. What would you have me do? Moan and groan about it? But you are a woman, a woman to revere and respect, he cried. How does van der Stahl take it? He's a bit depressed, of course. He has never known money trouble, and it hinders him from employing his full talent. But I hope to help him bear up during this difficult time. So you see, Prince, that I can't come to San Stefano. But why didn't you write us? Why not ask us for the money? It is very nice of you to say that, but the idea never even occurred to us. Too proud? Yes, too proud. But what a position to be in. What can I do for you? May I give you two hundred lire? I have two hundred lire on me, and I will tell Urania that I gave it to you. No, thank you, Prince. I am very grateful to you, but I can't accept it. Not from me? No. Not from Urania? Not from her either. Why not? I want to earn my money, and I can't accept alms. A fine principle, but for the moment. I remain true to it. Will you allow me to tell you something? What? I admire you. More than that, I love you. She made a gesture with her hand and wrinkled her brows. Why mayn't I tell you so? An Italian does not keep his love concealed. I love you. You are more beautiful and nobler and superior to anything that I could ever imagine any woman to be. Don't be angry with me. I'm not asking anything of you. I am a bad lot, but at this moment I really feel the sort of thing that you see in our old family portraits. An atom of chivalry which has survived by accident. I ask for nothing from you. I merely tell you, and I say it in Urania's name as well as my own, that you can always rely on us. Urania will be angry that you haven't written to us. They now entered the post office and she bought a few stamps. There go my last soldi, she said, laughing and showing her empty purse. We want the stamps to write to the secretary 
of an exhibition in London. Are you seeing me home? She saw suddenly that he had tears in his eyes. Do accept two hundred lire from me, he entreated. She smilingly shook her head. Are you dining at home? he asked. She gave him a quizzing look. Yes, she said. He was unwilling to ask any further questions, was afraid lest he should wound her. Be kind, he said, and dine with me this evening. I'm bored. I have no friends in Rome at the moment. Everybody is away. Not at the Grand Hotel, but in a snug little restaurant where they know me. I'll come and fetch you at seven o'clock. Do be nice and come, for my sake. He could not restrain his tears. I shall be delighted, she said softly with her smile. They were standing in the porch of the house in the Via del Babuino, where the studio was. He raised her hand to his lips and pressed a fervent kiss upon it. Then he took off his hat and hurried away. She went slowly up the stairs mastering her emotion before she entered the studio end of chapter 28、chapter、twenty nine of the inevitable this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer Please visit librivox dot org. Reading done by Jules Harlech. The Inevitable by Louis Capurus, translated by Alexander Teixeira de Matos. The Inevitable, Chapter Twenty Nine. She found Duco lying listlessly on the sofa. He had had a bad headache, and she sat down beside him. Well, he asked. The man offered me eighty lire for the mimo, she said, but he declared that the panel was not by Gentile da Fabriano. He remembered having seen it here. The man's crazy, he replied, or else he's trying to get my Gentile for nothing. Cornelia, I really can't sell it. Well, Duco, then we'll think of something else, said she. Laying her hand on his aching forehead, perhaps one or two smaller things, a knick-knack or two, he moaned. Perhaps, shall I go back to him this afternoon? No, no, I'll go. But really, it is easier to buy that sort of thing than to sell it. That is so, Duco. She agreed, laughing. But I asked yesterday what I should get for a pair of bracelets, and I'll dispose of those today. And that will keep us going for quite a month. But I have some news for you. Do you know whom I met? No, the prince. He gave a scowl. I don't like that cad. He said, "I've told you before, Duco. I don't consider him a cad, and I don't believe he is one either." He asked us to dine with him this evening, quite quietly. No, I don't care about it. She said nothing. She stood up, boiled some water on a spirit stand, and made tea. Duco, dear, I've been careless about lunch. A cup of tea and some bread and butter is all I can give you. Are you very hungry? No, he said evasively. She hummed a tune while she poured out the tea into an antique cup. She cut the bread and butter and brought it to him on the sofa. Then she sat down beside him. With her own cup in her hand, Corneli, hadn't we better lunch at the Osteria? She laughed and showed him her empty purse. Here are the stamps, she said. Disheartened, he flung himself back on the cushions. My dear boy, she continued, don't be so down. I shall have some money this afternoon for the bracelets. I ought to have sold them sooner. Really, Duco, it's not of any importance. Why haven't you been working? It would have cheered you up. I didn't feel inclined, and I had a headache. She waited a moment and then said, "The prince was angry that we didn't write and ask him to help us. He wanted to give us two hundred lire." 
You refuse, surely? He asked fiercely. Well, of course, she answered calmly. He invited us to stay at San Stefano, where they will be spending the summer. I refuse that, too. Why? I haven't the clothes. But you wouldn't care to go, would you? No, he said dully. She drew his head to her and stroked his forehead. A wide patch of reflected afternoon light fell through the studio window from the blue sky outside and the studio was like a confused swirl of dusty color, in which the outlines stood forth with their arrested action and changeless emotion. The raised embroideries of the chasubles and stoles, the purples and sky blues of Gentile's panel, the mystic luxury of Memmi's angel in his cloak of heavily pleated brocade, with the golden lily stem between his fingers, were like a horde of color and flashed in that reflected light like so many handfuls of jewels. On the easel stood the watercolor of the banners with its noble refinement. And as they sat on the sofa, he leaning his head against her, both drinking their tea, they harmonized in their happiness with that background of art and it seemed incredible that they should be worried about a couple of hundred lire, for they were surrounded by color as of precious stones, and her smile was still radiant. But his eyes were dejected, and his hand hung limply by his side. She went out again that afternoon for a little while, but soon returned again, saying that she had sold the bracelets, and that he need not worry any longer and she sang and moved gaily about the studio. She had made a few purchases, an almond tart, biscuits, and a small bottle of port. She had carried the things home herself in a little basket, and she sang as she unpacked them. Her liveliness cheered him. He stood up and suddenly sat down to the banners. He looked at the light and thought that he would be able to work for an hour longer. He was filled with transport as he contemplated the drawing. He saw a great deal that was good in it, a great deal that was beautiful. It was both spacious and delicate. It was modern and yet free of any modern trucks. There was thought in it, and yet purity of line and grouping. And the colors were restful and dignified. Purple and gray and white, violet and pale gray and bright white dusk twilight light night dawn day the day especially the day dawning high up yonder was a day of white self-conscious sunlight a bright certitude in which the future became clear but as a cloud were the streamers pennants flags banners waving in heraldic beauty above the heads of the militant women uplifted in ecstasy he selected his colors, chose his brushes, worked zealously until there was no light left. Then he sat down beside her, happy and contented. In the following dusk they drank some of the port, ate some of the tart. He felt like it, he said. He was hungry. At seven o'clock there was a knock. He started up and opened the door. The prince entered. Duco's forehead clouded over but the prince did not perceive it. In the twillet studio, Cornelie lit a lamp. Scusi, prince, she said. I am positively distressed. Duco does not care to go out. He has been working and is tired, and I had no one to send and tell you that we could not accept your invitation. But you don't mean that, surely. I had reckoned so absolutely on having you both to dinner. What shall I do with my evening if you don't come? And, bursting into a flow of language, the complaints of a spoiled child, the entreaties of an indulged boy, he began to persuade Duco, who remained unwilling and sullen. At last Duco rose, shrugged his shoulders, but with a compassionate, almost insulting smile, yielded. But he was unable to suppress his sense of unwillingness his jealousy because of the quick repartees of Cornelia and the prince remained unassaged, like an inward pain. 
At the restaurant he was silent at first. Then he made an effort to join in the conversation, remembering what Cornelie had said to him on that momentous day at the Osteria, that she loved him, Duco, that she did not even compare the prince with him, but that he was not cheerful or witty, and conscious of his superiority because of that recollection, he displayed a smiling superciliousness towards the prince, for all his jealousy, condescending slightly and suffering his pleasantry and his flirtation, because it amused Cornelie, that clashing interplay of swift words and short, parrying phrases, like the dialogue in a French comedy. End of chapter 29"'Chapter 30 of The Inevitable. "'This is a LibriVox recording. "'All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. "'For more information or to volunteer, "'please visit LibriVox.org. "'Reading done by Jules Harlock. "'The Inevitable by Louis Capuras, "'Translated by Alexander Texiera de Matos. "'The Inevitable.' Chapter 30 The prince was to leave for San Stefano next day, and early in the morning Cornelie sent him the following letter. My dear prince, I have a favor to ask of you. Yesterday you were so good as to offer me help. I thought then that I was in a position to decline your kind offer, but I hope that you will not think me very changeable if I come to you today with this request. Lend me what you offered yesterday to give me. Lend me two hundred lire. I hope to be able to repay you as soon as possible. Of course it need not be a secret from Urania, but don't let Duco know. I tried to sell my bracelets yesterday, but sold only one and received very little for it. The goldsmith offered me far too little, but I had to let him have one at forty lire, for I had not a soldo left. And so I am writing to appeal to your friendship and to ask you to put the two hundred lire in an envelope and let me come and fetch it myself from the porter. Pray receive my sincere thanks in advance. What a pleasant evening you gave us yesterday. A couple of hours, cheerful talk like that, at a well-chosen dinner, does me good. However happy I may be, our present position of financial anxiety sometimes depresses me, though I keep up my spirits for Duco's sake. Money worries interfere with his work and impair his energy, so I discuss them with him as little as I can and I particularly beg you not to let him into our little secret. Once more, my best and most sincere thanks. Cornelie D. Reitz. When she left the house that morning, she went straight to the Palazzo Rospoli. Has His Excellency gone? The porter bowed respectfully and confidentially. An hour ago, signora. His Excellency left a letter and a parcel for me to give you, if you should call. Permit me to fetch them. He went away and soon returned. He handed Cornelie the parcel and the letter. She walked down a side street, turning out of the Corso, opened the envelope, and found a few banknotes and this letter. Most Honored Lady, I am so glad that you have applied to me at last and urania also will approve i feel i am acting in accordance with her wishes when i send you not two hundred but a thousand lire with the most humble request that you will accept it and keep it as long as you please for of course i dare not ask you to take it as a present nevertheless i am making so bold as to send you a keepsake when I read that you were compelled to sell a bracelet, I hated the idea so that, without stopping to think, I ran round to Marchesini's and, as best as I could, picked you out a bracelet which, 
at your feet i entreat you to accept you must not refuse your friend this let my bracelet be a secret from urania as well as from van der Stahl. once more receive my sincere thanks for deigning to apply to me for aid and be assured that i attach the highest value to this mark of favor your most humble servant virgilio di forte Brasio. cornelie opened the parcel and found a velvet case containing a bracelet in the etruscan style a narrow gold band set with pearls and sapphires end of chapter thirty Chapter Thirty One of the Inevitable. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading done by Jules Harlech. The Inevitable by Louis Capuras. Translated by Alexander Texiera de Matos. The Inevitable. Chapter 31 In those hot May days, the big studio facing north was cool while the town outside was scorching. Duco and Cornelie did not go out before nightfall, when it was time to think of dining somewhere. Rome was quiet. Roman society had fled. The tourists had migrated. They saw nobody and their days glided past. He worked diligently. The banners was finished. The two of them, with their arms around each other's waists and her head on his shoulder, would sit in front of it, proudly smiling, during the last days before the drawing was to be sent to the International Exhibition in Kingsbridge. Their feeling for each other had never contained such pure harmony, such unity of concord, as now, when his work was done. He felt that he had never worked so nobly, so firmly, so unhesitatingly, never with the same strength, yet never so tenderly, and he was grateful to her for it. He confessed to her that he could never have worked like that if she had not thought with him and felt with him in their long hours of sitting and gazing at the procession, the pageant of women, as it wound out of the night of crumbling pillars to the city of sheer increasing radiance and gleaming palaces of glass there was rest in his soul now that he had worked so greatly and nobly there was pride in them both pride because of their life their independence because of that work of noble and stately art in their happiness there was much that was arbitrary they looked down upon people the multitude, the world, and this was especially true of him. In her there was more of a quietude and humility, though outwardly she showed herself as proud as he. Her article on the social position of divorced women had been published in pamphlet form and made a success. But her own performance did not make her proud as Duco's art made her proud, proud of him and of their life and their happiness while she read in the dutch papers and magazines the reviews of her pamphlet often displaying opposition but never any slight and always acknowledging her authority to speak on the question while she read her pamphlet through again a doubt arose within her of her own conviction she felt how difficult it was to fight with a single mind for a cause as those symbolic women in the drawing marched to the fight she felt that what she had written was inspired by her own experience by her own suffering and by these only she saw that she had generalized her own sense of life and suffering but without deeper insight into the essence of those things not from pure conviction, but from anger and resentment, not from reflection, but after melancholy musing upon her own fate, not from her love of her fellow women, but from a petty hatred of society, 
and she remembered duco's silence at that time his mute disapproval his intuitive feeling that the source of her excitement was not pure but the bitter and turbid spring of her own experience she now respected his intuition she now perceived the essential purity of his character she now felt that he because of his art was high noble without ulterior motives in his actions creating beauty for its own sake but she also felt that she had roused him to it that was her pride and her happiness and she loved him more dearly for it but about herself she was humble she was conscious of her femininity of all the complexity of her soul which prevented her from continuing to fight for the objects of the feminist movement and she thought again of her education of her husband her short but sad married life and she thought of the prince she felt herself so complex and she would gladly have been homogeneous she swayed between contradiction and contradiction and she confessed to herself that she did not know herself it gave a tinge of melancholy to her days of happiness the prince was not her pride only apparent that she had asked him not to tell urania that she was living with duco because she would tell her so herself in reality she feared urania's opinion she was troubled by the dishonesty of the life she called the intersections of the lines with the lines of other small people the petty life why so soon as she crossed one of these intersections did she feel as though by instinct that honesty was not always wise what became of her pride and her dignity not apparently but actually from the moment that she feared urania's criticism from the moment that she feared lest this criticism might be unfavorable to her in one respect or another and why did she not speak of virgilio's bracelet to duco she did not speak of the thousand lire because she knew that money matters depressed him and that he did not want to borrow from the prince because if he knew about it he would not be able to work free from care and her concealment had been for a noble object but why did she not speak of gilio's bracelet she did not know once or twice she had tried to say just naturally and casually look i had this from the prince because i sold that one bracelet but she was not able to say it she did not know why was it because of duco's jealousy she didn't know she didn't know she felt that it would make for peace and tranquillity if she said nothing about the bracelet and did not wear it really she would have been glad to send it back to the prince but she thought that unkind after all his readiness to assist her and duco he thought that she had sold the bracelets for a good sum he knew that she had received money from the publisher for her pamphlet he asked no further questions and ceased to think about money they lived very simply but still she disliked his not knowing even though it had been good for his work that he had not known these were little things these were little clouds in the golden skies of their great and noble life their life of which they were proud and she alone saw them and when she saw his eyes radiant with the pride of life when she heard his voice vibrating with his new assured energy and pride and when she felt his embrace in which she felt the thrill of his delight in the happiness which he brought him then she no longer saw the little clouds then she felt her own thrill of delight in the happiness which he had brought her and she loved him so passionately that she could have died in his arms end of chapter 31chapter 32 of the inevitable this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org reading done by jules harlock the inevitable by louis caparis translated by alexander texiera de matos the inevitable chapter thirty two urania wrote most charmingly she said that they were having a very quiet time with the old prince at san stefano as they were not inviting visitors because the castle was too gloomy too shabby too lonely but that she would think it most delightful if cornelia would come and spend a few weeks with them she added that she would send mr van der Stahl an invitation as well the letter was addressed to the via di serpente and forwarded to cornelia from there she understood from this that gilio had not mentioned that she was living in duco's studio and she understood also that urania accepted their liaison without criticizing it the banners had been dispatched to london and now that duco was no longer working a slight indolence and a vague boredom hung about the studio which was still cool while the town was scorching and cornelia wrote to urania that she was very glad to accept and promise to come in a week's time she was pleased that she would meet no other guests at the castle for she had no dresses for a country house visit but with her usual tact she freshened up her wardrobe without spending much money this took up all the intervening days and she sat sewing while duco lay on the sofa and smoked cigarettes he also had accepted because of cornelia and because the district around the lake of san stefano which was overlooked by the castle attracted him he promised cornelia with a smile not to be so stiff he would do his best to make himself agreeable he looked down rather haughtily on the prince he considered him a scallywag but no longer a bounder or a cad he thought him childish but not base or ignoble cornelia went off he took her to the station in the cab she kissed him fondly and told him how much she would miss him during those few days would he come soon in a week she would be longing for him she could not do without him she looked deep into his eyes which she loved he also said that he would be terribly bored without her couldn't he come earlier she asked no urania had fixed the date when he helped her into a second-class compartment she felt sad to be going without him the carriage was full she occupied the last vacant seat she sat between a fat peasant and an old peasant woman the man civilly helped her to put her little portmanteau in the rack and asked whether she minded if he smoked his pipe she civilly answered no opposite them sat two priests in frayed cassocks an unimportant looking little brown wooden box was lying between their feet it was the supreme unction which they were taking to a dying person the peasant entered into conversation with cornelie asked if she was a foreigner english no doubt the old peasant woman offered her a tangerine orange the remainder of the compartment was occupied by a middle-class family father mother a small boy and two little sisters the slow train shook rattled and wound its way along stopping constantly the little girls kept on humming tunes at one station a lady stepped out of a first-class carriage with a little girl of five in a white frock and a hat with white ostrich feathers oh chi belliza cried the small boy mamma mamma look isn't she beautiful isn't she lovely divina monte oh mamma he closed his black eyes lovelorn dazzled by the little white girl of five the parents laughed the priests laughed everybody laughed but the boy was not at all confused era una belliza 
he repeated once more, casting a glance of conviction all around him. It was very hot in the train. Outside, the mountains gleamed white on the horizon and glittered like a fire with opal reflections. Close to the railway stood a row of eucalyptus trees, sickled-leaved, brewing a heavy perfume. On the dry, sun-scorched plain, the wild cattle grazed, lifting their black curly heads with indifference to the train. In the stifling, stewing heat, the passengers' drowsy heads nodded up and down, while a smell of sweat, tobacco smoke, and orange peel mingled with the scent of the eucalyptus outside. The train swung round a curve, rattling like a toy train of tin coaches, almost tumbling over one another, and a level stretch of unruffled lazulite, metallic, crystalline, sky-blue, came into view, spreading into an oval goblet between slopes of mountain land, like a very deep-set vase in which a sacred fluid was kept very blue and pure and motionless by a wall of rocky hills, which rose higher and higher until, as the train swung and rattled round the clear goblet, at one lofty point a castle stood, colored like the rocks, broad, massive, and monastic, with the cloisters running down the slope. It rose in noble and somber melancholy, and from the train one could hardly distinguish what was rock and what was building stone, as though it were all one barbaric growth, as though the castle had grown naturally out of the rock, and, in growing, had assumed something of the shape of a human dwelling of the earliest times and as though the oval with its divine blue water had been a, a sacred reservoir the mountains hedged in the lake of san stefano and the castle rose as its gloomy guardian the train wound along a curve by the waterside swung round a bend then round another and stopped san stefano it was a small quiet town lying sleepily in the sun without life or traffic and visited only in the winter by day trippers who came from rome to see the cathedral and the castle and taste the wine of the country at the osteria when cornelia alighted she at once saw the prince how sweet of you to come and look us up in our eyrie he cried in rapture eagerly pressing her two hands he led her through the station to his little basket carriage with two little horses and a tiny groom a porter would bring her luggage to the castle it's delightful of you to come he repeated you have never been to san stefano before you know the cathedral is famous we shall go right through the town the road to the castle runs behind it he was smiling with pleasure he started the horses with a click of his tongue with a repeated shake of the reins like a child they flew along the road between the low sleepy little houses across the square where in the glowing sunlight the glorious cathedral rose lombardo romanesque in style begun in the eleventh and added in every succeeding century with the campanile on the left and the basterio on the right marvels of architecture in red black and white marble one vast sculpture of angels saints and prophets and all as it were covered with a thick dust of ages which had long since tempered the colors of the marble to rose gray and yellow and which hovered between the groups as the one and only thing that had been left over of all those centuries as though they had sunk into dust in every crevice the prince drove across a long bridge whose arches were the remains of an ancient aqueduct and now stood in the river the bed of which was quite dried up with children playing in it then he let the little horses climb at a foot's pace the road led steeply winding barren and rocky up to the castle 
while valleys of olives sank beneath them affording an ever wider view over the ever wider panorama of blue-white mountains and opal horizons gleaming in the sun with suddenly a glimpse of the lake the oval goblet now sunk deeper and deeper as in a fluted brim of sun-scorched hills its blue growing deeper and more precipitous a mystic blue that caught all the blue of the sky until the air shimmered between the lake and the sky as in long spirals of light that whirled before the eyes until suddenly there drifted an intoxication of orange blossom a heavy sensual breath as of panting love as though thousands of mouths were exhaling a perfumed breath that hung stiffingly in the windless atmosphere of light between the lake and the sky the prince happy and vivacious talked a great deal pointing this way and that with his whip clicked at the horses asked cornelie questions asked if she did not admire the landscape slowly straining the muscles of their hind legs the horses drew the carriage up the ascent the castle lay massive huddling close to the ground the lake sank lower and lower the horizon became wider like a world a fitful breeze blew away some of the orange blossom breath the road became broad easy and level the castle lay extended like a fortress like a town behind its pinnacled walls with gate within gate they drove in across a courtyard under an archway into a second courtyard under a second archway with a third courtyard and cornelie received a sensation of awe a vision of pillars arches statues arcades and fountains they alighted urania ran up to meet her embraced her welcomed her affectionately and took her up the stairs and through the passages to her room the windows were open she looked out at the lake and the town and the cathedral and urania kissed her again and made her sit down and cornelia was struck by the fact that urania had grown thin and had lost her former brilliant beauty of an american girl with the unconscious look of a cocote in her eyes her smile and her clothes she was changed she had gone off a little and was no longer so pretty as though her good looks had been a short-lived pretense consisting of freshness rather than line but if she had lost her bloom she had gained a certain distinction a certain style something that surprised cornelie her gestures were quieter her voice was softer her mouth seemed smaller and was not always splitting open to display her white teeth her dress was exceedingly simple a blue skirt and a white blouse cornelie found it difficult to realize that the young princess di forte brasio duchess di san stefano was miss urania hope of chicago a slight melancholy had come over her which became her even though she was less pretty and cornelie reflected that she must have some sorrow which had smoothed her angles but that she was also tactfully accommodating herself to her entirely novel environment. She asked Urania if she was happy. Urania said yes with her sad smile, which was so new and so surprising, and she told her her story. They had had a pleasant winter at Nice, but among a cosmopolitan circle of friends, for though her new relations were very kind they were exceedingly condescending and virgilio's friends especially the ladies kept her at arm's length in an almost insolent fashion already during the honeymoon she had perceived that the aristocracy were prepared to tolerate her but that they could never forget that she was the daughter of hope the chicago stockinet manufacturer she had seen that she was not the only one who, though she was now a princess and a duchess, was accepted on sufferance and only for her millions. There were others like herself. She had formed no friendships. People came to her parties and dances. 
They were frere et compagnon, and hand in glove with Gilio. The women called him by his Christian name, laughed and flirted with him, and seemed quite to approve of him for marrying a few millions. To Urania they were just barely civil, especially the women. The men were not so difficult. But the whole thing saddened her, especially with all these women of the higher nobility, bearers of the most famous names in Italy, who treated her with condescension and always managed to exclude her from every intimacy, from all private gatherings, from all cooperation in the matter of parties or charities. When everything had been discussed, then they asked the princess di Forte Brasio to take part and offer her the place to which she was entitled, and even did so with scrupulous punctiliousness. They manifestly treated her as a princess and an equal in the eyes of the world, of the public, but in their own set she remained Urania Hope and the few other middle-class millionaire elements of course ran after her but she kept these at a distance and gilio approved and what had gilio said when she once complained of her grievances to him that she by displaying tactfulness would certainly conquer her position but with great patience and after many many years she was now crying with her head on cornelie's shoulder oh she reflected she would never conquer them those haughty women what after all was she a hope compared with all those celebrated families which together made up the ancient glory of italy and which like the massimos traced back their descent to the romans of old was gilio kind yes but from the beginning he had treated her as his wife all his pleasantness, all his cheerfulness was kept for others. He never talked to her much, and the young princess wept. She felt lonely. She sometimes longed for America. She had now invited her brother to stay with her, a nice boy of seventeen, who had come over for her wedding and travelled about Europe a little before returning to his farm in the far west. He was her darling, he consoled her, but he would be gone in a few weeks. And then what would she have left? Oh, how glad she was that Cornelie had come, and how well she was looking, prettier than she had ever seen her look. Van der Stahl had accepted. He would be here in a week. She asked in a whisper, were they not going to get married? Cornelie answered positively no she was not marrying she would never marry again and in a sudden burst of candor unable to conceal things from urania she told her that she was no longer living in the via di serpente that she was living in duco's studio urania was startled by this breach of every convention but she regarded her friend as a woman who could do things which another could not so it was only their happiness and friendship, she whispered, as though frightened, and without the sanction of society. Urania remembered Cornelie's imprecations against marriage and, formerly, against the prince. But she did like Gilio a little now, didn't she? Oh, she, Urania, would not be jealous again. She thought it delightful that Cornelia had come and Gilio, who was bored, had also looked forward so to her arrival. Oh, no! Urania was no longer jealous. And with her head on Cornelie's shoulder and her eyes still full of tears, she seemed merely to ask for a little friendship, a little affection, a few kind words and caresses. This wealthy American child who now bore the title of an ancient Italian house. And Cornelie felt for her because she was suffering, because she was no longer a small, insignificant person whose line of life happened to cross her own. She took her in her arms, comforted her, the weeping little princess, as with a new friendship. She accepted her in her life as a friend, 
no longer as a small insignificant person and when urania staring wide-eyed remembered cornelie's warning cornelie treated that warning lightly and said that urania ought to show more courage tact she possessed innate tact but she must be courageous and face life as it came they stood up and clasped each other's arms looked out of the open window the bells of the cathedral were pealing through the air the cathedral rose in noble pride from out of a very low huddle of roofs a gigantic cathedral for so small a town an immense symbol of ecclesiastical dominion over the rooftops of the little town kneeling in reverence and the awe which had filled cornelie in the courtyard among the arcades statues and fountains inspired her anew because glory and grandeur dying but not dead mouldering but not spent seemed to loom dimly from the mystic blue of the lake from the age-old architecture of the cathedral up the orange-clad hills to the castle where at an open window stood a young foreign woman discouraged although that phantom of glory and grandeur needed her millions in order to endure for a few more generations it is beautiful and stately all this past thought cornelie it is great but still it is no longer anything it is a phantom for it is gone it is all gone it is but a memory of proud and arrogant nobles of narrow souls that do not look towards the future and the future with a confusion of social problems with the waving of new banners and streamers now whirled before her in the long spirals of light which like blue notes of interrogation shimmered before her eyes between the lake and the sky end of chapter thirty two Chapter Thirty Three of the Inevitable. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading done by Jules Harlech. The Inevitable by Louis Capurus. Translated by Alexander Texiera de Matos. THE INEVITABLE CHAPTER Thirty Three. Cornelia had changed her dress and now left her room. She went down the corridor and saw nobody. She did not know the way, but walked on. Suddenly a wide staircase fell away before her, between two rows of gigantic marble candelabra, and Cornelia came to an atrio which opened over the lake. The walls, with frescoes by Mantegna, representing feats of bygone San Stefanos, supported a copula which, painted with sky and clouds, appeared as though it were open to the outer air, and which was surrounded by groups of cupids and nymphs looking down from a balustrade. She stepped outside and saw Gilio. He was sitting on the balustrade of the terrace, smoking a cigarette and gazing at the lake he came up to her i was almost sure that you would come this way he said aren't you tired may i show you around have you seen our mantegnas they have suffered badly they were restored at the beginning of the century they look rather dilapidated don't they do you see that little methodical scene up there by giulio romano come here through this door but it's locked wait he called out an order to someone below presently an old serving man arrived with a heavy bunch of keys which he handed to the prince you can go egesto i know the keys the man went away the prince opened the heavy bronze door he showed her the brass reliefs giovanni da bologna he said they went on through a room hung with tapestries the prince pointed to a ceiling by girlandaggio 
the apotheosis of the only pope of the house of san stefano next through a hall of mirrors painted by mario di flori the dusky musky smell of an ill-kempt museum with its atmosphere of neglect and indifference stifled the breath the white silk window curtains were yellow with age soiled by flies the red curtains of venetian damask hung in moth-eaten rags and tatters the painted mirrors were dull and tarnished the arms of the venetian glass chandeliers were broken pushed aside anyhow like so much rubbish in a lumber-room stood the most precious cabinets inlaid with bronze mother-of-pearl and ebony panels and mosaic tables of lapis lazuli matchlight and green yellow black and pink marble in the tapestries saul and david esther holofernes salome the vitality of the figures had evaporated as though they were suffocated under the gray coat of dust that lay thick upon their worn textures and neutralized every color in the immense halls half dark in their curtained dusk a sort of sorrow lingered like a melancholy of hopeless conquered exasperation a slow decline of greatness and magnificence between the masterpieces of the most famous painters mournful empty spaces yawned the witnesses of pinching penury spaces once occupied by pictures that had once and even lately been sold for fortunes cornelia remembered something about a lawsuit some years ago an attempt to send some raphaels across the frontier in defiance of the law and to sell them in berlin angelio led her hurriedly through the spectral halls gay as a boy light-hearted as a child glad to have his diversion mentioning without affection or interest names which he had heard in his childhood but making mistakes and correcting himself and at last confessing that he had forgotten and here is the camera degli sposi he fumbled at the bunch of keys read the brass labels till he found the right one and opened the door which grated on its hinges and they went in and suddenly there was something like an intense and exquisite stateliness of intimacy a huge bedroom all gold with the dim gold of tenderly faded golden tissues on the walls were gold-colored tapestries venus rising from the gilt foam of a golden ocean venus and mars venus and cupid venus and adonis the pale pink nudity of these mythological beings stood forth very faintly against the sheer gold of sky and atmosphere in golden woodlands amid golden flowers with golden cupids and swans and doves and wild boars golden peacocks drank from golden fountains water and clouds were of elemental gold and all this had tenderly faded into a languorous sunset of expiring radiance the state bed was gold under a canopy of gold brocade on which the armorial bearings of the family were embroidered in heavy relief the bedspread was gold but all this gold was lifeless had lapsed into a melancholy of all but gray luster it was effaced erased obliterated as though the dusty ages had to cast a shadow over it had woven a web across it how beautiful said cornelie our famous bridal chamber said the prince laughing it was a strange idea of those old people to spend the first night in such a peculiar apartment when they married in our family they slept here on the bridal night it was a sort of superstition the young wife remained faithful only provided it was here that she spent the first night with her husband poor urania we did not sleep here signora mia among all these indecent goddesses of love we no longer respect the family tradition 
Urania is therefore doomed by faith to be unfaithful to me, unless I take that doom on my own shoulders. I suppose the fidelity of the husbands is not mentioned in this family tradition. No, we attach very little importance to that. Nor do we nowadays. It's glorious, Cornelie repeated, looking around her. Duco will think it perfectly glorious. Oh, Prince, I never saw such a room. Look at Venus over there, with the wounded Adonis, his head in her laps, the nymphs lamenting. It's a fairy tale. There's too much gold for my taste. It may have been so before. Too much gold. Masses of gold denoted wealth and abundant love. The wealth is gone. But the gold is softened now, so beautifully toned down. The abundant love has remained. The San Sefanos have always loved much. He went on jesting, calling attention to the wantonness of the design and risked an illusion. She pretended not to hear. She looked at the tapestries. In the interval between the panels, golden peacocks drank from golden fountains and cupids played with doves. I'm so fond of you, he whispered in her ear, putting his arm around her waist. Angel, angel. She pushed him away. Prince, call me Gilio. Why can't we be just good friends? Because I want something more than friendship. She now released herself entirely. And I don't, she answered coldly. Do you only love one then? Yes. That's not possible. Why not? Because if so, you would marry him. If you loved nobody but van der Stahl, you would marry him. I am opposed to marriage. Nonsense. You are not marrying him so that you may be free. And if you want to be free, I also am entitled to ask for my moment of love. She gave him a strange look. He felt her scorn. You? You don't understand me at all, she said slowly and compassionately. You understand me. Oh, yes. You are so very simple. Why won't you? Because I won't. Why not? Because I haven't that feeling for you. Why not, he insisted, and his hands clenched as he spoke. Why not, she repeated, because I think you are a cheerful and pleasant companion with whom to take things lightly, but in other respects your temperament is not in tune with mine. What do you know about my temperament? I can see you. You are not a doctor. No, but I am a woman, and I am a man. But not for me. Furiously, with a curse, he caught her in his quivering arms. Before she could prevent him, he had kissed her fiercely. She struggled out of his grasp and slapped his face. He gave another curse and flung out his arms to seize her again. But she drew herself up. Prince, she cried, screaming with laughter. You surely don't think that you can compel me. Of course I do. She gave a disdainful laugh. You cannot, she said aloud, for I refuse and I will not be compelled. He saw red. He was furious. He had never before been defied and thwarted. He had always conquered. She saw him rushing at her, but she quietly flung back the door of the room. The long galleries and apartments stretch out before them as though endlessly. There was something in that vista of ancestral spaciousness that restrained him. He was an impetuous rather than a deliberate ravisher. She walked on very slowly, looking attentively to the right and left. He came up with her. You struck me, he panted, furiously. I'll never forget it, never. I beg your pardon, she said with her sweet voice and smile. I had to defend myself, you know. Why? Prince, she said persuasively. Why all this anger and passion and exasperation? 
You can be so nice. When I saw you last in Rome, you were so charming. We were always such good friends. I enjoyed your conversation and your wit and your good nature. Now it's all spoilt. No, he entreated. Yes, it is. You won't understand me. Your temperament is not in harmony with mine. Don't you understand? You force me to speak coarsely because you are coarse yourself. I? Yes, you don't believe in the sincerity of my independence. No, I don't. Is that courteous towards a woman? I am courteous only up to a certain point. We have left that point behind. So be courteous again as before. You are playing with me. I shall never forget it. I will be revenged. So it's a struggle for life and death. No, a struggle for victory, for me. They had reached the atrio. Thanks for showing me round, she said a little mockingly. The Cameria del Gisposi, above all, was splendid. Don't let us be angry any more. And she offered him her hand. No, he said, you struck me here in the face. My cheek is still burning. I won't accept your hand. Poor cheek, she said teasingly. Poor prince, did I hit hard? Yes. How can I extinguish that burning? He looked at her, still breathing hard, and flushed, with glittering carbuncle eyes. You're a bigger coquette than any Italian woman. With a kiss, she asked. Demon, he muttered between his teeth. With a kiss, she repeated. Yes, he said. There, in our camera, degli sposi. No, here. Demon, he muttered, still more softly. She kissed him quickly. Then she gave him her hand. And now that's over. The incident is closed. Angel, she-devil, he hissed after her. She looked over the balustrade at the lake. Evening had fallen, and the lake lay shimmering in mist. She regarded him as a young boy, who sometimes amused her and had now been naughty. She was no longer thinking of him. She was thinking of Duco. How lovely he will think it here, she thought. Oh, how I long for him. There was a rustle of women's skirts behind her. It was Urania and the Marchesa Belloni. End of chapter 33Chapter 34 of The Inevitable. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading done by Jules Harlech. The Inevitable by Louis Capurus. Translated by Alexander Texiera de Matos. THE INEVITABLE CHAPTER 34 Urania asked Cornelie to come in, because it was not healthy outdoors now. At sunset, with the misty exhalations from the lake, the Marchesa bowed coldly and stiffly, pinched her eyes together and pretended not to remember Cornelie very well. "'I can understand that,' said Cornelie, smiling acidly. You see different boarders at your pension every day, and I stayed for much shorter time than you reckoned on. I hope that you soon disposed of my rooms again, Marchesa, and that you suffered no loss through my departure. The Marchesa Baloni looked at her in mute amazement. She was here, at San Stefano, in her element as a marchioness. She, the sister-in-law of the old prince, never spoke here of her foreigner's boarding house she never met her roman guests here they sometimes visited the castle but only at fixed hours whereas she spent the weeks of her summer villagetura here and here she laid aside her plausible manner of singing the praises of a chilly room 
her commercial habit of asking the most that she dared. She here carried her curled, leonine head with a lofty dignity, and, though she still wore her crystal brilliance in her ears, she also wore a brand-new spinster around her ample bosom. She could not help it that she, a countess by birth, she, the Marchesa Belloni, the late Marquis was a brother of the defunct princess, possessed no personal distinction, despite all her quarterings, but she felt herself to be, as indeed she was, an aristocrat. The friends, the Monsignori, whom she did sometimes meet at San Stefano, promoted the Pension Belloni in their conversation and called it the Palazzo Belloni. Oh, yes, she said at last, very coolly, blinking her eyes with an aristocratic air. I remember you now, although I've forgotten your name. A friend of the Princess Urania, I believe. I am glad to see you again, very glad. And what do you think of your friend's marriage, she asked, as she went up the stairs beside Cornelie, between Mino de Frizzoli's marble candelabra. Gilio, still angry and flushed and not at all calmed by the kiss, had moved away. Urania had run on ahead. The Marchesa knew of Cornelie's original opposition, of her former advice to Urania, and she was certain that Cornelie had acted in this way because she herself had had views on Gilio. There was a note of triumphant irony in her question. I think it was made in heaven, Cornelie replied in a bantering tone. I believe there is a blessing on their marriage. The blessing of his holiness, said the Marchesa, naively, not understanding. Of course, the blessing of his holiness, and of heaven. I thought you were not religious. Sometimes, when I think of their marriage, I become very religious. What peace for the Princess Urania's soul when she became a Catholic. What happiness in life to marry El Caro Giglio. There is still peace and happiness left in life. The Marchesa had a vague suspicion that she was mocking and thought her a dangerous woman. And you? Has our religion no charm for you? A great deal. I have great feelings for beautiful churches and pictures. But that is the artistic conception. You will not understand it, perhaps. For I don't think you are artistic, Marchesa. And marriage also has charms for me. A marriage like Urania's. Couldn't you help me too sometime, Marchesa? Then I will spend a whole winter in your pension and, who knows, perhaps I too shall become a Catholic. You might give Rudyard another chance with me and, if that didn't succeed, the two Monsignori then I should certainly become converted, and it would be, of course, be lucrative. The Marchesa looked at her haughtily, white with rage. Lucrative? If you get me an Italian title, but accompanied by money. Of course it would be lucrative. How do you mean? Well, ask the old prince, Marchesa, or the two Monsignori. What do you know about it? What are you thinking of? I? Nothing. Cornelie answered coolly, but I have a second sight. I sometimes suddenly see a thing. So keep on friendly terms with me and don't pretend again to forget an old boarder. Is this the Princess Urania's room? You go in first, Marchesa, after you. The Marchesa entered all a quiver. She had thoughts of witchcraft. How did that woman know anything of her transactions with the old prince and the Monsignori? How did she come to suspect that Urania's marriage and her conversion had enriched the Marchesa to the tune of a few ten thousand lire? She had not only had a lesson, she was shuddering, she was frightened. Was that woman a witch? Was she the devil? Had she the mal occhio? And the Marchesa made the sign of the jettatura 
with her little finger and forefinger in the folds of her dress and muttered, Vada retro Santanas. In her own drawing room, Urania poured out tea. The three pointed windows of the room overlooked the town and the ancient cathedral, which in the orange reflection of the last gleams of sunset shot up for yet a moment out of its grey dust of ages, with a dim huddle of its saints, prophets, and angels. The room, hung with handsome tapestries, an allergy of abundance, nymphs outpouring the contents of their cornucopias, was half old, half modern, not always perfect in taste or pure in tone, with here and there a few hideously commonplace modern ornaments, here and there some modern comfort that clashed with the rest, but still cosy, inhabited, and Urania's home. A young man rose from a chair, and Urania introduced him to Cornelia as her brother. Young Hope was a strongly built, fresh-looking boy of eighteen. He was still in his bicycling suit. It didn't matter, said his sister, just to drink a cup of tea. Laughing, she stroked his close, clipped, round head, and, with the lady's permission, gave him his tea first. Then he would go and change. He looked so strange, so new and so healthy, as he sat there with his fresh pink complexion, his broad chest, his strong hands and muscular calves, with the youthfulness of a young Yankee farmer who, notwithstanding the millions of old man hope, worked on his farm way out in the far west to make his own fortune. He looked so strange in this ancient San Stefano, within view of that severely symbolic cathedral against this background of old tapestries. And suddenly Cornelia was impressed still more strangely by the new young princess. Her name, her American name of Urania, had a first-rate sound. The Princess Urania sounded unexpectedly well. But the little young wife, a trifle pale, a trifle sad, with her clipping American accent, suddenly struck Cornelia as somewhat out of place amid the faded glories of San Stefano. Cornelia was continually forgetting that Urania was Princess di Forte Brasio. She always thought of her as Miss Hope, and yet Urania possessed great tact, great ease of manner, a great power of assimilation. Giulio had entered, and the few words which he addressed to her husband were, quite naturally, almost dignified, and yet carried to Cornelia's ears a sound of resigned disillusionment which made her pity Urania. She had from the beginning felt a vague liking for Urania. Now she felt a fonder affection. She was sorry for this child, the Princess Urania. Giulio behaved to her with careless coolness, the Marchesa with patronizing condescension. And then there was that awful loneliness around her, of all that ruined magnificence. She stroked her young brother's head. She spoiled him. She asked him if his tea was all right and stuffed him with sandwiches because he was hungry after his bicycle ride. She had him with her now as a reminder of home, a reminder of Chicago. She almost clung to him. But for the rest she was surrounded by the depressing gloom of the immense castle, the neglected glory of its ancient stateliness, the conceit of that aristocratic pride, which could do without her, but not without her millions. And for Cornelie she had lost all her absurdity as an American parvenu, and, on the contrary, had acquired an air of tragedy, as of a young sacrificial victim. How alien they were as they sat there, the young princess and her brother, with his muscular calves. Urania displayed her portfolio of drawings and designs, the ideas of a young Roman architect for restoring the castle, and she became excited with a flush in her cheeks 
when Cornelie asked her if so much restoration would really be beautiful. Urania defended her architect. Gilio smoked cigarettes with an air of indifference. He was in a bad temper. The Marchesa sat like an idol, with her leonine head and the crystal sparkling in her ears. She was afraid of Cornelie and promised herself to be on her guard. A major domo came and announced to the princess that dinner was served, and Cornelie recognized old Giuseppe from the Pension Belloni, the old archducal major domo who had once dropped a spoon, according to Rudyard's story. She looked at Urania with a laugh, and Urania blushed. Poor man, she said, when Giuseppe was gone. Yes, I took him over from my aunt. He was so hard worked at the Palazzo Belloni. Here he has very little to do and has a young butler under him. The number of servants had to be increased in any case. He is enjoying a pleasant old age here. Poor dear old Giuseppe. There, Bob, now you haven't dressed. She's a dear child, thought Cornelie, while they all rose and Urania gently reproached her brother as she would have spoiled boy for coming down to dinner in his knickerbockers. End of chapter 34「Please visit LibriVox.org. Reading done by Jules Harlech. The Inevitable by Louis Caparus. Translated by Alexander Texiera de Matos. Chapter 35 They were in the great somber dining room, with the almost black tapestries, with the almost black panels of the ceiling, with the almost black oak carvings, with the black monumental chimney-piece and, above it, the arms of the family in black marble. The light of two tall silver candlesticks on the table merely cast a gleam over the damask and crystal, but left the remainder of the too large room in the, a gloomy obscurity of shadow, piled in the corners into masses of densest shadow with a fainter shadow descending from the ceiling like a haze of dark velvet that floated in atoms above the candlelight. The ancestral antiquity of San Stefano hovered above them in this room like a palpable sense of awe, blended with a melancholy of black silence and black pride. Here their words sounded muffled. This still remained as it always had been retaining, as it were, the sacrosanctity of their aristocratic traditions, in which Urania would never dare to alter anything, even as she hardly ventured to open her mouth to speak or to eat. They waited for a moment, then a double door was opened, and there entered, like a spectral shade, an old grey man with his arm in the arm of the priest walking beside him. Old Prince Ercole approached with very slow and stately steps, while the chaplain regulated his pace by that stately slowness. He wore a long black coat of an old-fashioned, roomy cut, which hung about him in folds, something like a cassock, and on his silvery-gray hair, which waved over his neck, a black velvet skull-cap and the others approached him with the greatest respect, first the Marchesa, then Urania, whom he kissed on the forehead, very slowly, as though he were consecrating her, then Giulio, who submissively kissed his father's hand. The old man nodded to young Hope, who bowed and glanced towards Cornelie. Urania presented her and the prince said a few amiable words to her as though he were granting an audience and asked her if she liked italy when cornelia had replied prince ercole sat down and handed his skull-cap to giuseppe 
who took it with a deep bow. Then they all sat down. The Marchesa and the chaplain opposite Prince Ercoli, who sat between Cornelia and Urania, Gilio next to Corneli, Bob Hope next to his sister. My legs don't show, he whispered. Shh, said Urania. Giuseppe, revivified in his former dignity, standing at the sideboard, solemnly filled the plates with soup. He was back in his element. He was obviously grateful to Urania. He wore a distinguished air, as of one whose mind is at peace, and looked like an elderly diplomatist in his dress coat. He amused Corneli, who thought of Bologna's, where he used to become impatient when the visitors were late at meals, and to rail at the young greenhorns of waiters whom the Marchesa engaged for economy's sake. When the two footmen had handed round the soup, the chaplain stood up and said grace. Not a word had been spoken yet. They ate the soup in silence, while the three servants stood motionless. The spoons clinked against the plates, and the Marchesa smacked her lips. The candles flickered now and again, and the shadow fell more oppressively, like a haze of black velvet. Then Prince Ercoli addressed the Marchesa, and turn by turn he addressed them all, with a kindly, condescending dignity, in French and Italian. The conversation became a little more general, but the old prince continued to lead it, and Cornelie noticed that he was very civil to Urania, but she remembered Gilio's words. Papa nearly had a stroke, because old Hope haggled over Urania's dowry. Ten millions? Five millions? Not three millions? Dollars? No, lire. And the prince suddenly struck her as the gray-haired egotism of San Stefano's glory and aristocratic pride, struck her as a living shade of the past that loomed behind him, as she had felt it that afternoon when she stood gazing with Urania into the deep blue lake. An exacting shade, a shade demanding millions, a shade demanding a new increment of vitality, a spectral parasite who had sold his depreciated symbols to gratify the vanity of a new commercial house, but who, in his distinction, had been no match for the merchant's cunning, their title of princess and duchess for less than three million lire. Papa had almost had a stroke, Gilio had said, and Cornelie, during the measured affable stiffness of the conversation led by Prince Ercoli, looked from the old prince and duke, seventy years of age, to the breezy young far westerner, age eighteen, and from him to Prince Gilio. The hope of the old house, its only hope, here in the gloom of this dining room where he was bored and moreover still out of temper he seemed small insignificant shrunken a paltry distinguished little viveur and his carbuncle eyes which could sparkle merrily with wit and depravity now looked dully from under their drooping lids upon his plate at which he picked without appetite she felt sorry for him and her mind went back to the golden bridal chamber. She despised him a little. She looked upon him not so much as a man who could not obtain what he wanted, but rather as a naughty boy. And he must feel jealous of Bob, she reflected. Jealous of his young blood, which tingled in his cheeks, of his broad shoulders and his broad chest. But still he amused her. He could be very agreeable, gay and witty, and vivacious when in the mood, vivacious in his words and in his wits. She liked him when all was said, and then he was good-hearted. She thought of the bracelet and especially the thousand lire, always remembered, with a certain emotion, how touched she had been during that walk up and down past the post office how touched by his letter and his generous assistance. He had no backbone, he was not a man to her, 
but he was witty and he had a very good heart she liked him as a friend and a pleasant companion how dejected and moody he was but then why would he venture on these silly enterprises she spoke to him now and again but could not succeed in rousing him from his depression for the rest the conversation dragged on stiffly and affably always led by prince ercole the dinner came to an end and prince ercole rose from his chair giuseppe handed him his skull-cap every one said good-night to him the doors were opened and prince ercole withdrew leaning on his chaplain's arm gilio still angry disappeared the marchesa still terrified of cornelie also disappeared making the jettatura at her in the folds of her dress and urania took cornelie and bob back with her to her own drawing-room they all three breathed again they all talked freely in english the boy said in despair that he wasn't getting enough to eat that he dare not eat enough to stay his hunger and cornelie laughed thinking him jolly because of his wholesomeness while urania hunted out some biscuits for him and a piece of cake left over from tea and promised that he should have some cold meat and bread before they went to bed and they relaxed their minds after the pompous stately meal urania said that the old prince never appeared except at dinner but that she always looked him up in the morning and sat talking to him for an hour or playing chess with him at other times he played chess with the chaplain she was very busy urania the reorganizing of the housekeeping which used to be left to a poor relation who now lived at a pension in rome took up a lot of her time in the mornings she discussed a host of details with prince ercole who notwithstanding his secluded life knew about everything then she had consultations with her architect from rome about the restoration to be effected in the castle these consultations were sometimes held in the old prince's study then she was having a big hostel built in the town an albergo di poveri a hostel for old men and women for which old hope had given her a separate endowment when she first came to san stefano she had been struck by the ruinous tumble-down houses and cottages of the poorer quarters leprous and scabby with filth eaten up by their own poverty in which a whole population vegetated like toadstools she was now building the hostel for the old people finding work on the estate for the young and healthy and looking after the neglected children she had built a new schoolhouse she talked about all this very simply while cutting cake for her brother bob who was tucking in after his formal dinner she asked cornelie to come with her one morning to see how the albergo was progressing to see the new school run by two priests who had been recommended to her by the monsignori through the pointed windows the town loomed faintly in the depths below and the lines of the cathedral rose high into the sultry star-spangled night and cornelie thought to herself it was not only for a shadow and an unsubstantial shade that she came here the rich american who thought titles so nice the child who used to collect patterns of the queen's ball dresses she hides the album now that she is a black princess the girl who used to trip through the form in her white serge tailor-made without understanding either ancient rome or the dawn of a new future and as cornelie went to her own room through the silent heavy darkness of the castle of san stefano she thought i write but she acts i dream and think but she teaches the children though it be with the aid of a priest she feeds and houses old men and women then in her room looking out at the lake under the summer night all dusted with stars she reflected that she too would like to be rich and to have a wide field 
of labor. For now she had no field. Now she had no money, and now... Now she longed only for Duco, and he must not leave her too long alone in this castle, amid all this somber greatness, which oppressed her as with the weight of the centuries. End of chapter 35「Thirty Six of the Inevitable This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading done by Jules Harlock. The Inevitable by Louis Capurus. Translated by Alexander Texiera de Matos. The Inevitable chapter thirty six next morning urania's maid was showing cornelie through a maze of galleries to the garden where breakfast was to be served when she met gilio on the stairs the maid turned back i still need a guide to find my way cornelie laughed he grunted some reply how did you sleep prince he gave another grunt look here prince there must be an end of this ill temper of yours do you hear it's got to finish i insist i won't have any more sulking to-day and i hope that you'll go back to your cheerful witty style of conversation as soon as possible for that's what i like in you he mumbled something good-bye prince said cornelie curtly and she turned to go away where are you going he asked to my room i shall breakfast in my room but why because i don't care for you as a host me yes you yesterday you insult me i defend myself you go on being rude i at once become as amiable as ever i give you my hand i even give you a kiss at dinner you sulk with me in the most uncivil fashion you go to bed without bidding me good night this morning you met me without a word of greeting you grunt sulk and mumble like a naughty child your eyes are blazing with anger you are yellow with spleen really you're looking very bad it doesn't suit you at all you are most unpleasant rough rude and petty i have no inclination to breakfast with you in that mood and i'm going to my room no he implored yes i am no no then be different make an effort don't think any more about your defeat and be nice to me you're behaving as an offended party whereas it is i who ought to take offence but i don't know how to sulk and i am not petty i can't behave pettily i forgive you do you forgive me too say something nice say something pleasant i'm mad about you you don't show it if you're mad about me be pleasant civil gay and witty i demand it of you as my host i won't sulk any longer but i do love you so and you struck me will you never forget that act of self-defence no never then good-bye she turned to go no no don't go back come to breakfast in the pergola i apologize i beg your pardon i won't be rude again i won't be petty you are not petty you are the most wonderful woman i ever met i worship you then worship in silence and amuse me his eyes his black carbuncle eyes began to light up again to laugh his face lost its wrinkles and cheered up i'm too sad to be amusing i don't believe a word of it honestly i'm full of sorrow and suffering poor prince you just won't believe me you never take me seriously i have to be your clown your buffoon and i love you and i have nothing to hope for tell me mayn't i hope not much you are inexorable and so severe i have to be severe with you you are just like a naughty boy 
Oh, I see the pergola. Do you promise to improve? I shall be good. And amusing? He heaved a sigh. Poor Gilio, he sighed. Poor buffoon. She laughed. In the pergola were Urania and Bob Hope. The pergola, overgrown with creeping vine and rambler roses, hanging in crimson clusters, displayed a row of marble caritides and hermes, nymphs, satyrs, and fauns, whose torsos ended in slender sculptured pedestals, while their raised hands supported the flat roofs of leaves and flowers. In the middle was an open rotunda like an open temple. The circular balustrade was also supported by caratides, and an ancient sarcophagus had been adapted to serve as a cistern. A table was laid for breakfast in the pergola, and they breakfasted without old Prince Ercoli or the Marchesa, who broke her fast in her room. It was eight o'clock. A morning coolness was still wafted from the lake. A haze of blue gossamer floated over the hills, in the heart of which, as though surrounded by a gently fluted basin, the lake was sunk like an oval goblet. Oh, how beautiful it is here, cried Cornelie delightedly. Breakfast was a sunny and cheerful meal, after yesterday's dark and gloomy dinner. Urania talked vivaciously about her albergo, which she was going to visit presently with Cornelie. Gilio recovered his amiability, and Bob ate heartily, and, when Bob went off bicycling, Gilio even accompanied the ladies to the town. They drove at a foot pace in a landau down the castle road. The sun grew hotter, and the little old town lit up, with whitish-gray and creamy white houses like stone mirrors, in which the sun reflected itself and little open spaces like walls into which the sun poured its light the coachman pulled up outside the partly finished albergo they all alighted the contractor approached ceremoniously the perspiring mason looked round at the prince and princess the heat was stifling Gilio kept on wiping his forehead and sheltered under Cornelie's parasol. But Urania was all vivacity and interest, quick and full of energy in her white peak costume, with her white sailor hat under her white sunshade. She tripped along planks, past heaps of bricks and cement and tubfuls of mortar, accompanied by her contractor. She made him explain things, proffered advice, disagreed with him at times, and pulled a wise face, saying that she did not like certain measurements, and refused to accept the contractor's assurance that she would like the measurements as the building progressed. She shook her head and impressed this and that upon him, all in a quick, none to correct, broken Italian, which she chewed between her teeth. But Cornelie thought her charming, attractive, every inch the Princess di Forte Brasio. There was no doubt about it. While Gilio, fearful of dirtying his light flannel suit and brown shoes with the mortar, remained in the shadow of her parasol, puffing and blowing with the heat and taking no interest whatever. His wife was untiring, did not trouble to think that her white skirt was becoming soiled at the hem and spoke to the contractor with a lively and dignified certainty which compelled respect. Where had the child learned that? Where had she acquired her powers of assimilation? Where did she get this love for San Stefano, this love for its poor? How had the American girl picked up this talent for filling her new and exalted position so worthily? Cilio thought her admirable and whispered as much to Cornelie. He was not blind to her good qualities. He thought Urania splendid, excellent. She always astounded him. No Italian woman of his own set would have been like that. And they liked her. 
The servants at the castle loved her. Giuseppe would have gone through fire and water for her. That contractor admired her. The masons followed her respectfully with their eyes, because she was so clever and knew so much and was so good to them in their poverty. Admirable, said Giulio. But he puffed and blowed. He knew nothing about bricks, beams, and measurement, and did not understand where Urania had got that technical sense from. She was indefatigable. She went all over the works, while he cast up his eyes to Cornelie in entreaty. And at last, speaking in English, he begged his wife in heaven's name to come away. They went back to the carriage. The contractor took off his hat. The workmen raised their caps with an air of mingled gratitude and independence. And they drove to the cathedral, which Cornelie wanted to see. Urania showed her round. Giulio asked to be excused, and went and sat on the steps of the altar, with his hands hanging over his knees, to cool himself. End of chapter 36「thirty seven of the inevitable this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org reading done by jules harlock the inevitable by louis capurus translated by alexander texiera de matos the Inevitable, Chapter 37 A week had passed. Duco had arrived, after the solemn dinner in the gloomy dining room where Duco had been presented to Prince Ercole, the summer evening, when Cornelia and Duco went outside, was like a dream. The castle was already wrapped in heavy repose, but Cornelia had made Giuseppe give her a key, and they went out to the pergola. The stars dusted the night sky with a pale radiance, and the moon crowned the hilltops and shimmered faintly in the mystic depths of the lake. A breath of sleeping roses was wafted from the flower garden beyond the pergola, and below, in the flat-roofed town, the cathedral, standing in its moonlit square, lifted its gigantic fabric to the stars. A sleep hung everywhere over the lake, over the town and behind the windows of the castle. The caratides and hermes, the satyrs and nymphs, slept as they bore the leafy roof of the pergola in the enchanted attitudes of the servants of the sleeping beauty. A cricket chirped, but fell silent the moment that Duco and Cornelia approached, and they sat down on an antique bench, and she flung her arms about his body and nestled against him. A week, she whispered, a whole week since I saw you, Duco, my darling. I cannot do so long without you. At everything that I thought and saw and admired, I thought of you, of how lovely you would think it here. You have been here once before, on an excursion. Oh, but that is so different. It is so beautiful just to stay here, not just to go on, but to remain. That lake, that cathedral, those hills. The rooms indoors, neglected but so wonderful. The three courtyards are dilapidated. The fountains are crumbling to pieces. But the style of the atrio the sombre gloom of the dining-room, the poetry of this pergola. Duco, doesn't the pergola remind you of a classic ode? You know how we used to read Horace together. You translated the verses so well. You improvised so delightfully. How clever you are. You know so much. You feel things so beautifully. I love your eyes, your voice. I love you altogether. I love everything that is you. I can't tell you how much, Duco. I have gradually surrendered myself to every word of you, to every sensation of you, to your love for Rome, 
to your love for museums, to your manner of seeing the skies which you put into your drawings. You are so deliriously calm, almost like this lake. Oh, don't laugh, don't make a jest of it. It's a week since I saw you. I feel such a need to talk to you. Is it exaggerated? I don't feel quite normal here either. There is something in that sky, in that light, that makes me talk like this. It is so beautiful that I can hardly believe that all this is ordinary life, ordinary reality. Do you remember, at Sorrento, on the terrace of the hotel, when we looked out over the sea, over that pearl-gray sea, with Naples lying white in the distance? I felt like this then, but then I dare not speak like this. It was in the morning. There were people about whom we didn't see but who saw us and whom I suspected all around me. But now we are alone, and now I want to tell you, in your arms, against your breast, how happy I am. I love you so. All my soul, all that is finest in me is for you. You laugh, but you don't believe me. Or do you? Do you believe me? Yes, I believe you. I'm not laughing at you. I'm only just laughing. Yes, it's beautiful here. I also feel happy. I am so happy in you and in my art. You taught me to work. You roused me from my dreams. I'm so happy about the banners. I have heard from London. I will show you the letters tomorrow. I have you to thank for everything. It is almost incredible that this is ordinary life. I have been so quiet, too, in Rome. I saw nobody. I just worked a bit, not very much, and had my meals alone in the Osteria. The two Italians, you know the men I mean, felt sorry for me, I think. Oh, it was a terrible week. I can no longer do without you. Do you remember our first walks and talks in the Borghese and on the Palatine? How strange we were to each other then, not a bit in unison, but I believe I felt at once that all would be well and beautiful between us. She was silent and lay against his breast. The cricket chirped again with a long quaver, but everything else slept. Between us, she repeated, as though in a fever, and she embraced him passionately. The whole night slept, and, while they breathed their life into each other's arms, the enchanted caratides, fawns and nymphs, lifted the leafy roof of the pergola above their heads, between them and the star-spangled sky. End of chapter 37